Yes, good morning. My name is Nathaniel Frizzell. I'm an assistant professor here at the University of Scranton. Uh, my call sign is W2NAF. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the 2023 HamSci workshop. Um, we have a few people with us uh, that I'd like to introduce. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce, introduce Dr. Michelle Maldonado, a provost of the University of Scranton. Please give Dr. Maldonado a warm welcome. Yay. Forging amateur professional bonds. Well, we are to finally be hosting you in person on campus. <laughs> I was able to join my first year at the university when I was dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. While a fascinating experience over Zoom, nothing beats the ability to gather in person. I think all years to reflect on what it means to gather the value of physical presence. Michelle, stand closer to the microphone, please. Can I hear you? We can come together without physically being together. Something that Nathaniel does not know about me, I don't think, is that radio played a huge part in my childhood. I'm Cuban-American, the daughter of two political refugees who came here in 1960 after Castro's revolution. My parents left their homeland in their 20s, never to return, passing away here in the land that welcomed them in their exile. And while 90 miles separates our southernmost point from the island of Cuba, it might as well be on the opposite side of the world. One way Cubans and Cuban Americans tried to close that divide was through radio. Whether it was stations in Miami, like Radio Mambi, broadcasting on the island, the Cuban government sending out its own signal to the United States, or radio operators connecting over the Straits of Florida, Radio became a way to create community, negotiate identity, and remain connected to one's homeland and family. I remember my grandparents and father in particular listening to the radio as if it was a lifeline to their homeland. In many ways it was. I want to thank Nathaniel Fursell, the program committee and the local organizing committee for all their work in preparing this conference. I also want to thank all of you for spending these two days with us. I wish you a very productive and fruitful time together and welcome to the University of Scranton. Thank you so much, Michelle. I did not know that about you. <laughs> It's really nice that one of the things we're able to do here in person is share all of our own personal stories about radio. And I think, um, you know, I go to a lot of professional conferences and I go to, you know, I, I'm somewhat familiar with, you know, what goes on in the commercial world and things like that. And I think one of the things that really sets amateur radio apart is, you know, we're really here because we love what we're doing. So it's like I bring people in, you know, and everyone lights up because they tell some sort of personal story about why this is important to them. And, and so um, I think that's super important. And I also think this is, that light is what brings us all together in joy. And that is really the mission of this. The science is important, but the real mission here is to bring people together and make the world a better place. So I'd also like to introduce um, Rosie Schechter, uh, the executive director of ARDC, one of the funders of this conference. Feeling you excited to be here? Yeah, yeah me too. Um, so yeah, thank you so much to Nathaniel and the rest of the ham side team for putting this all together. Um, putting together events like this is no small task. So well done, everybody. Um, I am 
Uh, really excited to be here. Um, it's really amazing to, like you say, be in person and to see so many of our grantees, uh, to be in a place of learning. One of the things that y'all might not know about me, some people know, is that part of my background before being brought into the amateur radio world has to do with putting together curriculum. And once upon a time, I used to do um, workshops around teaching people how to make maps. And it was one of the most delightful things that we would do together, bring people together all in a space of learning. And here at Hamside, that's exactly what we're doing today and doing it around amateur radio. I am so excited to spend the next few days learning with all of you and particularly for attending some of the workshops and tutorials tomorrow morning. So anyway, thank you for putting this together. We're so delighted to be able to support this wonderful event. And I look forward to getting um, the learning started. Thank you. I'd also like to introduce Dr. Tyin Wang, uh, NSF Program Director, uh, also one of the funders of this conference. Um, so uh, my name is Tyin Wang, I'm, uh, as Nathan mentioned, I'm from NSF. So I'm a Program Director in the Division of Atmospheric and Geospace Sciences. And I'm currently managing the Aronomy Program and also leading an effort to establish the program uh, on data infrastructure. So I'm very happy to be here in person to witness the collaboration uh, between the other uh, space physics and also amateur uh, radio communities. We love this, uh, you know, this kind of collaboration because it opens doors to new opportunities and also discoveries. So uh, we like to see more, more of this. Uh, and also, um, um, let me see. And uh, let's see, uh, because uh, you know uh, the collaboration between those two communities can actually enable new science in this field, and this is what we uh, you know love to see more of, of this. So I look forward to hearing all the exciting work that you've been doing. And on another note, um, as you might be aware, federal agency are actually celebrating 2023 as a year of open science. Through open science and data sharing, we can achieve a lot more together. So if, you're, if you have any ideas about uh, how the data infrastructure should be like, and also uh, if you're interested in organizing a community workshop on data system, uh, come chat with me and we can talk or either you know, Zoom on, uh, you know, meet on a Zoom call. I'd like to hear your thoughts. And uh, lastly, I'd like to thank uh, you know, Dr. Nathan uh, watch out together. As you know, uh, you know, it takes a lot of time and effort to actually uh, you know, make this happen. Uh, so thank you for your service. And I look forward and I wish you uh, a productive and successful workshop. Thank you. Really appreciate it. A couple other people I'd like to recognize very quickly. Um, Dr. Isaiah Shum, wave your hand. Um, Isaiah is from NASA and we'll be hearing more from him tomorrow. And so HAMSI is an official NASA citizen science project. So we're very grateful for NASA's support. We have both um, Bob Indervitson and Ed Hare from the ARRL visiting us. So I'm glad to have them here. And um, also uh, Tapper representatives are here as well. So we've got all sorts of people represented. Okay, um, we need to move things right along a little bit. So I'm gonna share my screen and go through uh, my opening remarks here. So yes, this is the 2023 HAMSI workshop. You know, it may seem kind of funny to uh, put this slide up here, but I think it's very important because not everyone who comes to this workshop is an amateur radio operator. So we need to remind people, you know, ham radio, it's a, it's a hobby for radio enthusiasts, communicators, builders, experimenters. Uh, we have a wide reaching demographic of uh, people from all ages and walks of life. People as young as five or six years old have become ham radio operators. People are ham radio operators well into when they pass over a century old. So, you know, there are many, many uh, people from all over. Uh, there's over 760,000 hams in the U.S., about 3 million worldwide. Uh, and we have a lot of, um, just by becoming an amateur radio operator, you're showing some sort of interest in science and in electrical engineering, and you have to demonstrate some of that knowledge through a licensing process. Uh, we participate in emergency preparedness, in contesting, going to far away and cold and hot places. Um, we <laughs> we uh, work with scouts and in education. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful hobby. Uh, it's also very much affected by space weather and space science. 
because when we talk around the world, our signals go through the upper atmosphere and are affected by the ionosphere, uh, which is a layer of the upper atmosphere, which is ultimately affected by what the sun is doing, what the magnetosphere is doing, what the lower atmosphere is doing. And that's what HAMSI is all about, using amateur radio to try and understand this system and enable new science, as Dr. Wang said. Uh, so HAMSI, the Ham Radio Sciences Investigation, we're a group that enables the collaboration between the professionals, say university researchers and the amateurs. You know, if you're an amateur, the amateurs are doing great science and great work, but you can't necessarily get recognized properly if you don't know how to publish, if you don't know how to present, or if you don't have access to that. So HAMSI, and conversely, the professionals don't always know all the great work that the amateurs are doing and vice versa. So HAMSI looks to advance scientific research and understanding through amateur activities, we encourage development of technologies, new technologies to support this research, and we look to provide educational opportunities for the amateur community and the general public through events like this. So this year we're hybrid, all talks are streamed over a Zoom large meeting. If you're on Zoom, you can actually put in the chat or you can actually, as um, uh, Dr. Maldonado found out, you can say something uh, and we'll, we will hear you here. Um, I do have to say, this is a very fluid kind of technology. You know, we don't have all the AV worked out, but we're trying, we're kind of on the cutting edge of this small, medium-sized meeting to try and make the people on Zoom feel as much as part of the meeting as possible. We have a meeting owl over here. If you talk loudly, the meeting owl should follow your face and your voice, um, but please bear with the technology and be as forgiving as you can as we try to make this meeting as available to as many people as possible. Uh, so what is on Zoom? All the oral presentations today, the banquet uh, keynote presentation tonight at 23.30 UTC, that's 7.30 p.m. Uh, universal time. It will all be on this Zoom link, same Zoom link, uh, and also all the oral talks tomorrow up until about uh, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, after that, we're going to turn the Zoom off because we do really want to have a good in-person meeting, and we we need to be able to facilitate that here. Um, but if you want to see the posters, those are also posted online. Uh, so you can find the agenda by going to hamsideorg slash hamside2023. You can click this agenda for click here for workshop agenda. The times are all posted in both universal time, universal coordinated time, and also in Eastern daylight time. Uh, you can view the posters by clicking on any of the poster title names and a picture should show up there. Uh, we have three wonderful invited speakers. You'll meet all of them. Uh, you'll meet Joe and Jesse tomorrow morning. You'll hear Dr. Pat Reif tonight at the keynote. Um, the meeting is being recorded uh, by Jason Johnston of Ham Radio 2.0. Uh, he's in the back. He's, and we also have many uh, different amateur activities here at the workshop. Special thanks to the Murgas Amateur Radio Club, Spoke, Scranton Pocono Amateur Radio Club, RW3USR Amateur Radio Club, ARDC for organizing and sponsoring the amateur radio events at this workshop. This includes a special event station in LSC-126. I do encourage you to go get on the air during this conference. You may have to skip out of some of the oral sessions. That's fine. Go over to room 126 for an hour or two. Go get on the air. Don't feel guilty. If you don't know what ham radio is, that's a, even more of a reason to skip some of the talks and go over and see that station and get on the air. All the talks are being recorded. You can watch them later. The VE session, if you want to earn, um, okay, uh, the VE session, if you want to earn your ham radio license is tomorrow at 1.30 p.m. Um, we have a special exhibit on the second floor. It's not immediately obvious how to get to, but you can see picture, you can see actual radios on display put together by our local clubs, especially Murgas. Uh, it's a beautiful exhibit. Uh, we also have well tours of that tomorrow, also tours of where we're going to build the new W3USR station, uh, comments of ARDC. Uh, they are our primary sponsor with additional donations from um, uh, additional uh, donors. Um, the ARRL is here as well. We've talked about that. Um, I also want to say a big thank you to DX Engineering. They are providing the door prizes for tonight's uh, banquet. So there's an ICOM 7300 that will be raffled off to everyone who goes to the banquet tonight and also 10 $100 um, gift certificates to DX Engineering. Plus DX Engineering donated an HF amplifier to our club station here. So big thank you to DX Engineering. And to Tim Dr.
a personal space weather station. Um, this is, you've probably heard about this for the last few years. We're working on developing a new um, ground-based uh, system to observe space weather. The first session is all about that. So you hear much more about it. The most important couple big announcements about this, we now have this thing. Uh, Tom is going to tell you a lot more about it now. There's still a lot more work to be done, right, Tom? Yeah, <laughs> a lot of work. But but now we can actually do it now that we actually have hardware. So before we didn't have hardware, so we couldn't do the extra a lot of work. But this is huge progress. Um, we'll hear more about the grapes and the tangerines. So there's a low-cost version. There's this tangerine performance-based version. And then we also have now uh, magnetometers are for sale. They will be over at the Tapper booth. So you can get uh, Magnum Congress through the Tapper booth for details. So thank you very much. I'd like to uh, welcome Tom McDermott to be our first uh, official speaker here. So Tom McDermott, N5EG. Nathaniel, question. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Question. Um, what on what frequency will W three USR be listening? If we know that. Um, we'll get that information put in the chat. It'll probably be on um, uh, on either fifteen or twenty meters. Um, I'll see if we can get them to spot themselves, and I'll also see if they can put some announcement on hamsci.org. Okay, thank you. Also, um, would you be sure to um, tell the speakers to stand real close to the microphone because you break up a lot. Okay, so the microphone is right over here, this one. So <laughs> I'll try to speak to that. I'll try and move it closer too. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. All right, we are going to go into full screen mode. Take it away. I have this just mouse wheel to advance slides or you can just use these arrow keys right there. And there's your microphone right there. All right. Thank you, Nathaniel. And it's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate everything Hamsai and others are doing to put on this uh, put on this wonderful conference. So uh, I'm going to talk briefly an introduction of Tangerine SDR and its purpose, uh, not very much because I think most people are familiar with it. The uh, philosophy for software and firmware development, the development tools, some hardware variants, and currently we're working on the integration test plan. We'll go over that and status and progress. The uh, Tangerine SDR system is intended for HF dual and quad channel measurements using high precision uh, time stamping uh, uh, on and UDP sockets to communicate from the data engine to what's called the local host. It's a very modular uh, hardware implementation. Scotty Cowling did the system design. The data engine consists of an FPGA and a gigabit ethernet interface and electrical and mechanical interfaces for various plug-on modules which can change in the future. The current modules uh, are the clock module, which was uh, designed by John Ackerman, who's here. It contains a GPS receiver. There are three variants of it, and it provides precision one pulse per second and 122.88 megahertz to the receiver, and it has a 10 megahertz output. The, all the frequencies are output by a programmable synthesizer chip. There's a plug-on receiver module, and one or two of these modules can be plugged on. Each module is a dual channel receiver. So if you plug on two of them, you get a quad channel receiver. The receiver uses a 14-bit analog to digital converter, has modular front end filters, resistive attenuators, a wideband noise source, which puts out 10 dB excess noise and provides what's called Dickey switching, which you can turn the noise source on and off and look at the change in the background noise, which is useful for certain astronomical measurements. 
Uh, the first thing that we ran into is the FPGA that was chosen was an Altera, now Intel Max 10. It's about 50,000 gate equivalent, and it was chosen three or four years ago. It is in a 55 nanometer process fabricated by TSMC. Uh, at the time, Altera, before Intel bought Altera, Altera used TSMC as their fab. TSMC has asked their customers to transition to a 28 nanometer process uh, or, or newer. And uh, to do that, Altera Intel would have to port the Max 10 FPGA over to that process. Uh, a temporary workaround for non-available parts is we went and bought a few off-the-shelf Max 10 development kit boards as they became available. I found one on uh, DigiKey, one and only one. And uh, it had the FPGA uh, already soldered onto it, so that was good. A few data engine adapter modules, we'll talk about that a little bit. Clock module and receiver modules became available at the very end of September 22 after DCC. <clears throat> and the first data engine initial delivery was the week of March 10th. And this is, this is the actual data engine, this, this orange square board on the front. And, uh, so that allowed us with the development kit to get started. We start. We used a an example design called the a Simple Socket Server that came with the dev kit, and it worked on an older version of all the libraries. So the first thing we did was port it to the newer libraries, and then started making modifications. This is a photograph of the test system. The green board on the left is the dev kit. And the orange thing is what's called the data engine adapter. It's like a data engine minus uh, the FPGA and things that are on the development kit. On that data engine adapter, you can see the white tag on the right side. That's the clock module. And it's got some SMA connectors, and a B and C adapters plugged on there to a GPS antenna. And underneath is the receiver module. So you really can't see it because it's underneath that data engine adapter. <coughs> The philosophy is to implement as much functionality as possible in C. And the reason for that is most developers, most researchers and students are more familiar with C than they are with Verilog and other timing tools. And so the more C friendly we can make the design, the more extensible that design is likely to be. So in C, we implemented a TCP IP stack, RTOS drivers, UDP sockets, and the Tangerine protocol for speaking between the local host and the data engine, and that's all up and running. <clears throat> then we implement FPGA firmware using the Altera platform designer, used to be called QSIS, and it allows dropping in pre-compiled modular blocks for the processor, RAM, FIFOs, DMA controller, interrupts peripheral IO. It's a, I'm fairly impressed with that package. It's GUI-based selection. And wiring, you just drop the blocks you want and you click the connections and it wires them all up. And you hit the synthesize button and it auto-generates the Verilog for all of the functions in there. And it works, it works quite well. Then uh, lastly, we implement specific functionality in Verilog, essentially when there's no other choice. So the SPI interface on the ADC chip used a, a really weird implementation of SPI. And so we had to implement the bi-directional interface in Verilog and tie that in. The data interface on the receiver is implemented in Verilog. The receiver module, this module here, produces four gigabits per second to the FPGA. So that all has to be done in custom Verilog. The idea is that we want to emphasize modularity, reconfigurability, flexibility, and development velocity. And that's in order to uh, maximize extensibility of the project for students and researchers. Research projects are, are things that tend to have little different requirements each phase. So the easier it is for researchers to change things, the better. Test phase uh, one, 1A one is, uh, this is all documented on tangerinesdr.com. Phase 1A was to bring up the FPGA, the C code, the stack, the DHCP, all the peripheral interfaces, uh, the clock module programming, uh, and all that was achieved on December 19th. So all of the computer interfaces on the processor talk to everything. Phase 1B is to implement a burst 
wideband mode, and this is very similar to open HPSDR, 16384, time contiguous words from one receiver channel, and then play that burst out slowly over the UDP socket. And it provides maybe tens of bursts per second. And uh, we use that to verify the uh, accurate data transfer from the receiver module to the data engine adapter to the FPGA and to characterize gross sampling spurs in the receiver. So this is a measurement flow graph that was presented at a GNU radio uh, meeting a couple of years ago. Uh, oh, the Hermes wideband on the left is an open HPSDR, puts out these 380-16K burst word modes that goes into an FFT. And it's a real input uh, FFT. So the output are mirror image samples. So we can throw half of the samples away. Goes into a bank of single pole IIR filters, 8,192 filters, one per bin. Then we extract the magnitude and display it on a vector sink. And this is what that looks like for the uh, Hermes receiver. You can see this huge spike off to the left. That's the DC offset voltage of the A to D converter. Then you can see a little bit of leakage, which is local AM broadcast that gets into the power wiring of that receiver. And then some uh, spurious uh, components, which are the tall spikes. And those are um, spurious that are not intended to be there and are due to some defect or in the either the ADC chip uh, in the sampling or noise introduced elsewhere. So that test will let us look at the spurious on the receiver. Um, phase 1C is where we will implement synchronous down conversion to 192 kilosamples per second with DSP. So essentially we multiply the signal by a complex sinusoid to down convert it and then uh, filter and decimate that down to 192 K samples. The purpose measure the noise figure of the receiver characterize the dynamic range of the receiver, the filter performance, and to see how well the noise source works. So the test plan is to verify and characterize the modules, the interconnection and the basic functionality, but verification does not result in an easily usable product. So separate actual product development is going to be needed after everything's characterized and working. Hopefully the test plan will put in place enough usable modules that it should be a little bit more cookie cutter in approach to get to something that's a, a usable product. So to measure, for example, the noise figure of the receiver, the approach is to use the onboard calibrated noise source. It's not calibrated yet, but hopefully we will come up with a calibration procedure during hardware and switch the receiver between a 50 ohm resistor and the noise source. And then you measure the increase in noise between the source being on and off and on open HP SDR, that's what that looks like. That's a 48 kilohertz wide sample. And you can see uh, just under 2 dB increase in noise. This is with a 5 dB noise source. The tool chain, we're running Cordis 20.1 uh, and we're using the light or the free version. The Windows version will not correctly synthesize uh, some of the modules. So we, it's being run on Linux right now. Uh, later, uh, later versions than 20.1 drop support for the TCP IP stack. So we're kind of wired into that version. The plan is to acquire a license for Cordis, which we need to build a binary image and we need to do a lot of, of timing verification. Cordis provides Verilog, compiler, platform designer, QSIS, the software development environment, JTAG download, breakpoints, all of those things. This is what platform designer looks like. It's a completely GUI based thing, you drop in the modules that you want, and the black lines show you uh, which things are wired up. So you just point and click, and it only lets you wire up buses of the right type. Uh, it assigns all of the addresses to the peripherals and exports them as symbols, so that if you change your hardware configuration and all the addressing changes, if your C code is symbolic, it doesn't have to be recompiled to uh, identify it. Or it may have to be recompiled but it uh, doesn't have to be rewritten. So in summary, the test phase 1A was completed successfully on the development kit. We're working through now hardware phase 1B. And after about three or four missteps, uh, the approach seems to be we'll use an on-chip RAM-based FIFO, which is 16 wide by 16K deep, 
uh, and then the processor will read out those samples, put them in a socket, and send them over the interface. Um, some resources, the integration and test plan is on tangerinesdr.com. <clears throat> Uh, the phase 1A software is on my GitHub, tsdr-dev uh, at uh, GitHub, tom McDermott. There are some utilities at tsdr-util. This is a Python CLI that uh, brings up and runs the Tangerine localhost data engine protocol so that you can discover the module, find it, get its address, open the sockets, and send uh, commands to and from the receiver uh, just from an ASCII command line. There is a video of the phase 1A system bring up, and it's uh, at this YouTube URL. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the work of uh, Tapper folks. Scotty Cowling is the project lead. He designed the system, the architecture, all of the modules, did the manufacturing, found the contract manufacturer, tried to get all the parts. And uh, I think he swept floors in the meantime. It's just incredible, busy amount of work. John Ackerman designed the clock module. Dave Witten's designed the magnetometer module, and uh, Dave Larson has, has done all the web interface. Uh, Nathaniel is the PI for the project, and it's been a, a great help in getting everyone. And of course, this couldn't be done without support from the National Science Foundation. So with that, uh, I think we're finished. Are there any questions? This is the presentation from a fire hose. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much. All right, next up we have John Gibbons. My name is John Gibbons. I am the current lab director of the undergraduate circus design lab at Case Western Reserve University. But previous to that, I spent 20 years of my career at Keithley Instruments, specializing in uh, low current measurement, like electrometers. So that's really where my specialty is. Today, I want to go over where grape, the grape one is or isn't, and where I am on grape two. Let's see. Prototype version 1.1 has been retired after four long years of arduous use. Uh, I've made many improvements to it, which were incorporated in the grade two was a good learning platform. But as I stated a long time ago, this was a prototype that was never intended to get out in the field. Unfortunately, it worked too well and it did. So I finally buried it and everybody's going, oh no. Well, grape version 1.12 now exists. It is made with surface mount components that are easier to work with. I got rid of the little fine pitch uh, input protection. The bandpass holders were updated to match the grape two, so they work better, but they're not identical to it. Um, and I added a fourth filter so you can do 15 megahertz. So now the grape version 1.12 would do 2.5, 5, 10, and 15 megahertz. Um, also improved the input protection. Uh, up to this date, I've lost two grapes so far. Both of them were in Fort Collins, Colorado, and doing some highly unreliable research on the internet, I discovered why. <laughs> <laughs> A typical day of Fort Collins, but Dave's not here, unfortunately, to see this, so you can't verify that. Anyway, the new version, yes, it does. This is the input protection I'm using instead of backpack back-to-back -back low current diodes. Um, the this is the resonant filter with the added 15 megahertz band. This is the power supply, this is the mixer, and this is the audio chain. And then I'm injecting the mixer signal from a Leo Bodnar GPS DO, attenuating it to 400 millivolts peak to peak, which is driving the mixer chip. 
The new board looks like that. Top side, back side. Even for Nathaniel, got the handside.org logo on there. And that's one looks like it was built. I built four of these on Monday night and tested them. They do work. I have one here. Um, that's the top side and that's the back side. Very simple to build. Like I say, I got rid of the input protection used to be really itsy bitsy small things. Now it's two back to back SOC 23s and fine pitch stuff here is all SOC 23. So it's easier to build. Although you still have to have some good soldering skills to do this stuff. Oh, great two. This is where it gets interesting. Um, back in 2019, when we first started this, great two was, was in grape one, the grape in general slated to be the low cost easy version of the data acquisition system. And at that time, I took it to heart when they said that the high bandwidth data sampling for so like doing digital RF was gonna be slated to the tangerine only. Well, over the course of time with feature creep, it changed that I am now doing digital RF. This blew me out of the water completely from an architecture standpoint because the bandwidth requirements for the data increased 8,000 times. So it's almost four orders of magnitude more data I now have to collect. And it's synchronous to the time clock. And it's very rigid in terms of its structure. I'm sampling at an eight kilohertz rate, which means my A to D has to has to be, all three of them have to be uh, processed in red on a 125 microsecond time base with no missing. And that's the problem I ran into when I first started playing with this on a uh, Raspberry Pi, it could not keep up with it. I was missing between 8,000 samples per second. I was missing between three and 300 samples every second. It could not handle it. And I thought at first it was bandwidth issues, but then I figured I figured it out, and I'll show later that it really was the rigidity of the timing. The operating system is not compatible with doing that kind of high bandwidth sampling. So the architecture had to change a bit. So I moved it into two boards. Grape 2 RF deck is on top. That is built and I'm ready to pull the trigger on making it uh, in production. It has over 250 parts on it. So it's not something that a casual uh, ham radio enthusiast would want to build. Although I've built two of them and they take a bit of time, but they're doable, but they do have some fine pitch parts. Uh, specifically the one for the magnetometer interface and the A to Ds are 25,000 pitch parts, which are extremely hard to solder by hand. Even me having done it for 20 years, I usually end up with solder bridges and have to take care of it. The second part of it down here is the control and sequencer board. That had to change its architecture because of the rigid sampling. So I have moved a Pico onto there, which is a non-OS based microprocessor that runs at 130 megahertz dual core. And we are in the process of proving that works. And then it ties into a Raspberry Pi to actually do the data collection. The Grape RF front end, the improvements I made to it, the protection is better. I've also changed the first gain stage to have uh, programmable gains, so you can change from 1, 2.5, 4, or 10, depending on your geographic location and receive signals. So you have a 10 to 1 ratio of gain changes, which is about 5 dBs per step, which I'll show a little bit later. Also, there's it has to be an isolation buffer between each resonant filter, because if you tie all rest of three resonant filters together, two of them are killing what the other one is trying to receive, so you have to separate. So there's buffers there. I then go into standard SA612 mixer, and then I band pass it from 85 hertz to 3.3 kilohertz with 27 dB gain and feed that into a 16-bit A to D. There is the great two RF board built. That's the top side. This right in here is input protection. This is the RF selectable gain stage. These are the buffers. Right here, here, and here are the resonant filters. These here are the mixers, and then these stages here are the AF or of signal processing, and then the A to Ds are sitting here, here, and here. And then this is the reference. I use the, that's a TI-8866 chip. 
The unique feature about it is it can handle a five volt analog input signal, yet run off of 3.3 volts DC for the control and it's spy chainable. And that was the three criteria I used. So my input range for the A to Ds is zero to 4.096 volts. So I have a nice wide dynamic range. So I should be able to handle overloads fairly well. And with the spy running at 16 megabit, I can suck the uh, data out of there pretty quickly. That's the bottom side. This is the computer interface. These are the injection points for the mixer. And this is the antenna input here. This is a DNA plot of the, from the antenna input to the output of the buffer that's feeding the resonant filters. That's at the lowest setting. And as you can see, the yellow line, which is the gain, just keeps moving up every time you change the jumper setting. And it goes in about 5 dB jumps, from 0 dB to about 16 dB. Band pass of the AF filter coming out of the mixer that's moving the A to D. Um, as you can see here, it has a, it actually did what I designed it to do, which was rather encouraging. Um, and I've shown it in a linear plot and a log plot since some people like seeing it either way. And you'll notice that five megahertz, 10 megahertz, and 15 megahertz G. They all look the same. Well, they were designed that way, so that just proves I was able to populate the board correctly. This is the resonant filter for five megahertz, 10 megahertz, and 15 megahertz. This radio was designed specifically for WWB, but uh, CHU-1485 comes through perfectly on the 15, the 10, the 7.85 I'm sitting down in here. So it's not quite at the peak, but it is usable. And 3.33 for CHU is actually a 10 to one ratio down. It's still receivable, but you're really down in the skirt of, of that. But I'm not sure how much Nathaniel wants 3.33 CHU, but we have the capability of doing that. This is the board. Um, this is a Raspberry Pi 4B. I've put the magnetometer interface onto it and the U-Blocks GPS will be running the, the into the Raspberry Pi 4 so I can turn it into a stratum one time reference. It also feeds my data collection engine, which is down here and I have a Pico that actually is doing the data collection control. And then this is the frequency synthesis. Now I used the 5351 because it had three channels out because originally I had four channels. If you remember previous slides from previous presentations, I went down to three because I knew there was going to be a bandwidth limit. And then when I got hit with doing the digital RF format, that is really a blessing in disguise. But the main reason I chose it is it's a cheaper part. And even if you go to the more expensive part of these, they only still have two PLLs in them. Okay, five minute warning. Okay. What the current sequencer board looks like now. This is the Pico here. That's going to get turned 90 degrees and face out the front. This is the U-Blocks GPS. That's going to get stuck out the front to match the front antenna. This here is a data collection engine. That's going to rotate 90 degrees and go up, up in here. And then I'm going to have a cable coming out. I'm, going to go, I'm sorry, this is the magnetometer face, 12 volt in. That's what the bottom looks like. That's the board set as a stack. That's the boards that plug together. The RF deck is intended to plug onto the digital or collection board. And then on those three points, I'm digitally injecting the RF frequency so I'm not corrupting the input chain with the mixer signals. I've chosen a box. It slides into an extruded aluminum box. I have a sample here. I also have a sample of the new grade two. And right now the RF board is 95% tested. The only thing I haven't done is run the A to Ds, but once I do that, I'm gonna pull the trigger on the boards, although I'm still waiting on one part before I can do that. And then once that's done, I have to create the test fixtures and the design procedure and then build them. Great version two, the architecture finally stabilized. As of Monday morning, my right-hand man, Bob Benedict, was able to actually transfer a continuous stream at 1.05 megabit over USB between the Pico and the Raspberry Pi 4. So that was the hurdle I was trying to jump. We're now working on optimizing that. Uh, I've got all the parts on order. I've actually been ordering parts for the last two and a half years and keeping them. 
and I'm missing one part on each board for the build, but uh, supposedly they're gonna come in soon so we can get these things built. And I'm planning on building 50 sets. This is a snapshot of a data transfer program I wrote in Python showing me writing 48K bytes for each second to the operating system on the Raspberry Pi. And as you can see here, it only takes about 65 milliseconds to write the 48K bytes per second into a file. So that is not the bottleneck. The bottleneck is the restrictive timing of my A to D sampling system that it has to be sampled or serviced every 125 microseconds. And an operating system that has a one kilohertz system tick cannot do that. So we finally got this working fine. Then, as they say, be careful what you ask for. The size of the file that it creates with this data collection is 10.37 gigabytes per day. <laughs> That's uncompressed. We are going to compress that. But in the file, there is a timestamp and the three or 8,000 three word samples for each A to D, very nicely set up. So we can post process it to digital RF. It also makes it very nice to post process to doing the, uh, the frequency analysis we were doing. But the format is an ASCII. You can suck it into Excel. You know, although 10 gig is not going to fit into Excel, but you can process it. And that way, anybody has access to this data and it's not in some weird format. It's something that anybody and any researcher can use, which is what my objective was. So I have to purchase the SSEs, USBs, the antennas, and all that stuff, machine the panels, and then come up with usage instructions so that mere mortals can use this. And I'd like to thank the NSF for the grants to support this. and. DRC also, and any questions? You have put everybody to sleep, which is good. So thank you very much. John, 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 KB1HFT here. Um, I know you're focused on, on grape two, but speaking of grape 1.12, do you have a parts list for that? Surprise, it's gonna to happen today with Christina running the website is that the grape two on OSH Park is going to be, I'm sorry, grape 1.12 is released on OSH Park so you can order the boards. I have a complete part list, which I just ordered from DigiKey. So that all the parts are in stock, you can get them and they have the DigiKey links. And I also put a link in there for the SA612, which is turned into an Obtanium that's manufactured, announced in January, the part's now obsolete. So I've actually bought up a bunch of them and have enough to build all of our grapes and then some. Uh, I was hoping to build a total of 100 essentially and I've got enough to do that. So I've got the that, but yes, we have the parts list and it'll be on the Hamside website as soon as it's really, uh, Christina pulls the trigger, so. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Anderson Little. I'm Nicholas Moscolino. We're the CS team down in the University of Alabama working on PSWS Central Control and Central Database, aka the website. Quick overview of our talk today. Uh, we'll look at the open where we fit into that, and then we'll That better? Excellent. Okay. And then we'll go into a component deep dive. So then we'll look at what the PSWS network looks like and basically talk about the design decision decisions we made along the way. And then finally we'll Oh. 
we'll control you like we've heard about. And then we. Excuse me, Andrew. Excuse me, Anderson, but you're breaking up. Okay, thank you. Speak, speak more into the microphone, please. Okay. Um, so we got the central control system, itty bitty box that gets put away uh, on the diagrams. Um, and so basically, what the central control system breaks down to is basically three uh, sections. We get the local units and their directories. So how the local units hook into our network and how they communicate and upload data. And then we have the watchdog and central database. So how do we look for that data and how do we compile that data? And then we'll talk about Django and the web page. So this is the back end, uh, basically, uh, processing power that'll analyze, aggregate the data, and the web page that'll present the data for you to use in your studies. So taking a look first at the local unit directories, this is how the um, the hardware stations that you'll be able to purchase will interface with the website itself. Uh, and when you sign up to make an account with our website, you'll be asked to register any stations and instruments you have. And when you do so, it creates a directory, which is shown in the blue text up there on the screen. Um, those are all the directories that correspond to your stations. And when you are going in to upload that data to the website. Uh, it'll be uploaded in a couple of different ways. So in the bottom picture there in the red, uh, those are the observations data uploads corresponding to magnetometer data. Uh, and if you look closely, they, you can see that um, each observations vial co corresponds to a day's worth of collected data. Uh, on the other hand, you can also collect uh, spectrum data with the grave or the tangerine instruments and those are stored in their own directories uh, within the station directories for observations themselves. And then if you step into one of those uh, spectrum station directories shown in the bottom picture, you can see we have another directory for the continuous data uploads. Uh, there's a directory there for every hour's worth of collected data, in addition to a DRF properties file and metadata to give a little more information to our system about the data you're uploading. So you've uploaded the data, that's great. We can't really do anything with it just yet. It's in the network, not the system. And so we have what we call the watchdog script. The watchdog script is sitting there waiting for uploads to occur. Um, however, it's not waiting for the zip file or the spectrum data, right? Because if it spots that and tries to do something with it, mid-upload, that's bad. And so we have trigger files, as you can see in that top uh, picture, that are basically little metadata tags that say, hey, I'm done uploading, please check what I've done. Um, you can see we have a start date uh, in that uh, MOBS 2021, and then in between that is GMAG, which is the instrument type, and then uh, appending that is the end date. And so that gives Watchdog a little information that will parse and add to our database. Um, in addition, it'll go look for the observation and get a, uh, some additional information. Um, below that, we basically have the parsing uh, code, just a little interesting tidbit. Um, basically, it's watching each uh, station. Uh, station directory and then looking for a specific uh, pattern in the file upload. Um, and then it has the parsing code. So this basically uh, goes through the observation and gets a basic metadata. An important note to make though, is that they we don't put the full row by row information of uh, observation into the database. There's just too much information. We keep them as zip files that we will point to uh, whenever we need to do processing on the data um, when we or need to make it available for download. And then below we have the watchdog log file. So we used to keep those uh, trigger files uh, as logging, but as you can imagine, those get large very quickly with all that loads. And so we decided to compile it down into a watchdog log file which will track the SQL uh, inserts into our database, the uploads, and just basic system, uh, system activity. And moving on to the uh, front, the Django back end as well as the front end of the web page, this is the part that uh, defines how you will interact with the website and all of its functionality. So just starting from a high level, we chose to use uh, Django as our Python-based web framework because it is very powerful and provides a lot of useful shortcuts for um, web development while still preserving the security that's so important when we're working with data like this. So on the left is the uh, high level directory structure for our Django project. Each of those directories under the top level directory corresponds to an app within the project. Uh, so you see, you can see we have apps for accounts where user profiles are created and stored, um, band center frequencies, data types, all pertaining to observations, which is, has its own app as well. 
uh, corresponding to how that information is stored and organized, as well as um, a, an app for stations for adding, updating them, your basic uh, database CRUD operations there. And then if we step into the observations directory, you can see that structure on the right. And this is generally what any structure within one of these directories will look like, but focusing on observations for now. Uh, really, the important stuff here is the models file, the views, and the URLs along with the HTML templates. So starting with the models file, this is what defines how the information is stored in the database. So if we were to step into that file, you would see that observations have uh, a schema that includes uh, center frequencies, bands, the related station that the observation was collected by, as well as information to help the system find the file path and the name of the file itself, among other things. Um, looking at the views code, this is the Python code that defines how each page functions, how um, you'll be able to interact with it. And this works hand in hand with the HTML templates that define how the um, web page looks, how you'll be able to interact with it. And then the URL file ties these two pieces together by just adding a list of views and which templates they correspond to. So here we have, this is the front page of our website. Um, here you can see the map is the main feature. We'll be able to pan and scroll, zoom in and out around the map and see the locations of all registered stations. Uh, the green points on the map are showing the stations that are currently online have, recent, have very recently been uploading, collecting data to the website. Uh, the red points are stations that are currently offline or have not uploaded in some time. And there's also, there aren't any here, but there's an option for possibly online stations uh, that would appear in yellow. These are stations that have uploaded data recently, but not recently enough. And so the status is a little bit unclear, but those are designated. And really moving into the core piece of the website, we have the observations page. This is where you'll be able to locate any observation data that you're looking for and download it for your use. Uh, so that bar on the left there is our filtering system just to help you find the data you're looking for. You'll be able to filter by different uh, different instrument types, excuse me, um, center frequencies. Um, you can look for any observations under a given station name, uh, observations collected within a day range or within a rough rectangular region um, by providing a couple of latitude and longitude coordinates. Moving to the table itself, you'll see that all of those fields are located there. And as, in addition to the name of the observations file. And if you click on that, you'll be able to download the observation data directly from the website uh, for your use, however you will. Uh, if you were to click on magnetometer data, you can download it straight away from the website. Or if you were to click on observations in a spectrum format, it'll take you to another page where you can specify a date range to get grab the specific piece of data you want. You can download anywhere up to a range of one to seven days. And the reason we limit it to seven days, because as we've seen, those spectrum uploads get very large very quickly. And we found that limiting it to seven days of download at a time is the best way to keep the website um, easy and convenient to use for everyone. Moving on to the more cutting edge, the more uh, the current development, we're looking at the analysis page. Now, the analysis page is where we're looking to really dig deep into the data. Right, because we want to make it available for you to download, but we also wanted to make it visual and tangible just right there on our website. And that's what we've been working on currently. Uh, the big thing is getting the map more functional. So right now, we actually added functionality where you can click on a little dot and it'll bring up the station name. And you can click on that to go into a table that has all the observations related to that station. Uh, you can see that table down below. Um, the big thing is hopefully we can get some graphing on that with each um, observation. So you can, instead of having to download it and analyze it yourself, be able to click through each station, scan through the graphs we have available, and find what's as interesting to you for uh, use. And that's what we've been working on recently. Um, our current work in future directions really revolves around graphing, making this data more tangible and more easy to use. Um, mostly, uh, we want to do the basic X and Y charts. Nicholas will talk about about that in a second, but also we want to try maybe you know 3D modeling, right? Creating a 3D model based on our data, and potentially we could even 3D print that to, as a way of outreach to hold the ionosphere in your hands or something. And then we can look at sonification, so converting these observations into waveform files. Then you can listen to the ionosphere right then and there. 
And then finally, we're looking to enhance our tables and filters, improve, or, improve the user experience as much as we can to make this data as usable as possible. So as Anderson said, uh, graphing and plotting the data is really our biggest focus for these next steps. Uh, so what we have here is a is an observation data collected with a simulation of the tangerine instrument. Um, this is collected, I believe, over the course of one night in September of 2020. And in using that, we are hoping to create something on our website where you could plot the data on the website and have it look something like this. And so, as you can see, we have the more refined, um, easier to interpret graph on the bottom there, with, where you can easily pick out the peaks and troughs for sunset and sunrise. And then in between, you can see that oscillation, which we believe comes from traveling ionospheric disturbances. And we're hoping that um, by making this more available for you on the website, you'll be able to um, more easily analyze the data and then uh, eventually come to better understand the causes and effects of phenomena such as these. And one thing with the graphing, too, is it's right there. You might think it's easy. Uh, it is relatively but the big thing is getting it as efficient as possible because there's going to be a massive amount of uploads and the server can't simply graph every single one of them. So we're working on either uh, converting the script into C to make it more efficient, or we're also working on a workflow idea that might be able to handle all the graphing. Um, what we got for you today, special thanks to our uh, NSF fundings. There's the numbers right there. And then and we'd also like to thank... Um... Bill Engelke, our chief architect at the University of Alabama, as well as Dr. Travis Atkinson, our principal investigator, for all of their help and support along the way. And thank you for your time. Do you have any questions? Yes. When can we start registering nodes? You start registering nodes. Um, basically now, Bill, correct? Yes. yes. So you can start that. Um, we hopefully will be able to walk you through the process during our poster presentation. So mm -hmm. if you need help with that, we're here to help. And if you have any concerns, let us know. It's uh, we really getting it into y'all's hands so we can change as needed. Any other? Yes, sir. Yeah, my question is, given that these stations are going to integrate, integrate 10 gigabytes. This is going to be user-driven, that is. So you never know how that's going to happen. Per day basis in terms of the number of upgrades. How that's going to work? That's a great question. That's something we're looking into now. 10 gigabytes is not something I was totally aware of per day, but most of these observations will be smaller. But that is something the team's working on. Again, making the process as efficient as possible. I can't put a number on how many users, but we'll try to accommodate as many as we can. So maybe this question for the thing. Gentlemen, KB1HFT here on the Zoom. Can yes, you hear hello. me? Hello. Um, I suspect that this is uh, tuned to use digital RF data and perhaps not FL Digi data from Grape Ones. Is that true? Yes. yes. Bill says yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, yes. So, uh, a couple of thoughts on that. The uh, this system is designed to be, I'm envisioning, I guess, for initial success to be on the order of, say, a few hundred users um, that could, uh, currently we're funded in this prototype phase. So hopefully we can expand that and test it to uh, support many more. So uh, working on robustness is going to be important. Um, also, with regard to the digital RF data, I should say that the the way the grapes are observing the data right now with that single frequency type of observation, that was just an initial, that was an initial, um, yeah, that was part of the initial design of the project. But we very quickly found that just recording the data in that single frequency FL Digi format is really insufficient to do the science we need to do. So we have to move to a format that it can support saving uh, a certain amount of spectrum around the carrier. It's the only way to really do the science. Um, with that said, there are ways to 
take that recorded spectrum and convert it uh, into an equivalent format that would match uh, what the grapes are currently doing right now. So it will be backwards compatible. Uh, we're working on developing that or that will be developed, but it's certainly theoretical, theoretically possible to do that. Excellent. Any other questions? Yes. yes. What are you using for your graphic? Our graphic currently Python and digital RF library. Uh, we're beginning to make the jump into converting that into C because Python's slow as Christmas. So trying to get it and to see for something that we can actually use on the website. Um, but I mean, but the visual, that was some Excel stuff. So that, that was, that wasn't very in depth. Right? That's just a visualization, right? Any other questions? Thank you for your time. Thank you. I'm uh, David McGaw, N1HAC. I work as a research engineer at Dartmouth College under uh, Dr. Jim LaBelle, who's the principal investigator of our project. And um, we have two uh, undergraduates currently working with us doing um, hardware and uh, software development. Thank you. So I, traveling ionospheric disturbances are propagating variations in the ionosphere. We found that they can be tracked by observing the Doppler shifted carriers of clear channel AM broadcast stations. We look for clear channels so that there's not interference from um, other local stations. Um, we have developed a system of receivers using software defined radios that are stabilized by GPS. Um, to um, um, they've been deployed and collecting data in the Northeast. Um, the existing system of six receivers, we're now looking to build out to uh, as many as 15 to cover much of the Eastern United States. And the expanded network promises to be able to detect and track these as well as um, terminator spread F and eclipse effects. Um, this is our current system. Um, we've got, uh, it was kind of centered around a station WGY in um, the Schenectady area, though we um, also were monitoring a number of others. Uh, but um, we had um, six, one station right at WGY um, for um, picking up the uh, local ground wave, and then um, five stations uh, in a, a circle around it. And the um, stations are marked here, um, and the reflection points halfway in between, theoretical reflection point off the ionosphere. Um, we use a small loop. Uh, it's two turns, um, about a two tenths of a meter squared, um, on a, a, a mast made of PVC, easily deployed and put out in the middle in a backyard or whatever. Um, the preamp that we use, I actually gave a, a talk last year on um, the preamps. Um, this one's fine tuned to um, the AM broadcast band, um, you know, approximately 500 kilohertz to 1500 kilohertz. Um, we have other versions of the preamp that go as wide as 100 kilohertz to five megahertz or even up to 10. Um, but this one was fine tuned to keep out of band interference down. This is the receiver that we have constructed. Um, 
it's a uh, you know built in uh, a box that is easily um, installed at somebody's site. Um, it's got an external hard drive, um, Ethernet interface. Here we have a, you can see a, a sort of a hockey puck to the left, which is um, a cell phone interface, but uh, usually it's hardwired to somebody's uh, network. Uh, this is what's inside of it. We use uh, um, RTL SDR as the basic SDR in it. Um, and see um, down on the right, we have the GPSDO disciplined oscillator, which is the heart of the system um, for timing uh, for, well, frequency um, reference. Uh, we don't actually use it for timing. We let the network take care of that. We're not time critical, but we're frequency critical. The thing is that the Doppler shifts we see on the carriers are on the order of 10 to the minus seventh, tenths of a hertz on a megahertz carrier. Um, and so we need to be um, have a frequency reference with it better than that. And the GPSDO um, handles that quite nicely. Um, it uses a, um, there's a power, um, a power input um, and the uh, bias T for the preamplifier is in the lower right. There it goes through an attenuator to, so that we can adjust signal levels depending upon local um, conditions. Um, goes into the up converter because um, limitations of the RTL SDR. Um, jumps it up to the RTL SDR um, has a low frequency limitation of 24 <laughs> megahertz. So we have convert the AM broadcast band to the range that it can uh, receive, um, pick it up there, um, and then uh, run it into a Raspberry Pi. And uh, so um, the RTL SDR and the up converter have um, local oscillators. We you, you know, supply that externally using a small chip frequency synthesizer. Um, and uh, the up converter has a local oscillator of 129.6 megahertz and the RTL SDR is 28.8. The um, up, up converter one, it happens to be a fractional multiple of the RTL SDR basic frequencies which is why that's odd. It, internally, they come with a 125 megahertz um, oscillator. Um, 129.6 is within the pass band of the filters they've put in there. So it works out for us and keeps um, birdies and such to a minimum. Um, the, um, so the loop antenna picks up the signal, goes through the preamp, um, goes through our attenuator, into the Hammett up, up converter, RTL SDR. Raspberry Pi gets the samples. It's sampled at one mega sample per second, 8 bit data, um, centered at one megahertz. Goes through um, in the Raspberry Pi, it does um, double FFT. First, it um, samples it down to um, the 10 kilohertz channels. And then within the ch 10 kilohertz channels of our interest, we then um, reduce it to something on the order of a few hertz um, window. And then that is the data that's then transferred over the internet to our um, central server at Dartmouth. Um, there it uh, gets um, PDF files are made for us to look at and um, see when uh, there are um, events of interest. Um, there have been programs uh, developed, I'll show a little bit more in a bit, um, to track the data and um, help us analyze them. So this is the raw data display that we get um, watching each of the our stations um, and um, the, the um, 10 carriers that we will watch. Um, and then 
And you'll notice that it's kind of ripply. Some of that is data and some of that is the, the carriers themselves. Um, so what we've done is uh, the raw data comes in. Uh, this is work done by Claire Trope, who also has given a talk here. Um, the data comes in and we first have to subtract the known variations of the AM carrier. It would be nice if they had nice oscillators on them, but they <laughs> don't. And I know there's a whole body of work out there tracking what these carriers are doing. But, um, you know, this WGY, we found out, has a this ripple in it. And you'll notice the period even changes. So presumably it's got a, an ovenized oscillator that's not really tightly held. It just holds to whatever FCC requirements are. But uh, it's certainly not GPS locked or anything of that sort. So we um, first, from, you know, from local ground wave receptions, we'll figure out what the oscillator variations are, and then we subtract it from the raw data so that we can actually see the Doppler shifts. And here you'll see uh, on the top is the raw data that we get, and sometimes it's pretty sparse, uh, you know, pretty diffuse. Um, but we have. Um, developed a tracking program to find the, do the best guess at the uh, carrier center frequency. And um, that, that tracking is used to um, follow whatever waves we may be finding in there. So that, again, we subtract the carrier variations, we track the carrier center, and then we stack the receivers one on top of each other so that we can um, look for events that might be traveling ionospheric disturbances or whatever else we may see. So we also do see terminator features. Um, the uh, dawn and dusk, as um, you already saw in one of the others, this is actually complementary to the WWV. Uh, grape observations. Um, we see it, uh, in, um, the Doppler shift um, go positive when at sun up and Doppler shift go negative at uh, dusk as the ionosphere falls, as it gets up further ionized during the day and then it rises at night. And um, the data would, can show a, the, um, year, you know, if you plot it over the year, you can see the time change of sunrise and sunset. Um, and um, we actually are looking to expand our, the time of day, because we had been, we're primarily interested in nighttime observations, because during the day, it, um, the absorption is high on the AM broadcast band. So the presumption is there's not much to see, but we would it would be good to see the the at least the full day of um, you know sunset to su sunrise to sun yeah sunset to sunrise, um, but we have an eclipse coming, which happens during the day, so. Um, uh, Oh, well, one thing that we have discovered is that the AM broadcast uh, frequency uh, changes. Um, uh, well, the the higher carrier frequencies are more sensitive to. Um, it's a lot easier to see the Doppler shifts because it's proportional to frequency. So the high carrier frequencies we try to um, favor. Unfortunately, the fifteen sixty. Um, WFME in New York went off the air, um, which was one of our primary ones. Um, but there are others, and I'll get to that. Um, this is our proposed system. Um, you know, we had been limited to just like New England and a little bit into New York and New Jersey, but we want to put it out toward the um, toward, um, for the most of the eastern U.S. 
And um, you'll notice that we do have a number of sites secured. There are a few sites that we're still looking for hosts, um, North Dakota, Missouri, and Tennessee are places if anyone's um, thinking they might be uh, willing to site one of ours. And you'll notice on the lower right, our proposed um, carrier frequencies are up in the 1500 um, kilohertz range. Um, we found a number of stations that should be good. And um, this just shows that we don't need to have the each of the, the analyze the whole system. We just want to, we can um, kind of come up with the surrounding stations of a particular carrier. And, um, you know, we have one, want to have one of our receivers that's nearby that gets the ground wave. We get a good clear signal of, um, and can get its, track its variations, just its inherent variations. Then we have the propagating stations and um, uh, get the propagating waves. And I wanted to put up where the eclipse is going to be going in 2024. Uh, the one in the, the end of this year is primarily West Coast, so Western US. So we might be able to see something, but not so likely. But this is going right down the heart of our proposed um, network. So it would be very nice to have this up and running. Uh, a year from now and watch the uh, propagation effects as the shadow goes over. Oh, uh, one thing I did forget to, oh, spread F is this broadening of the, um, of the carrier. And we do see that a lot. It makes it a little difficult to find the um, center frequency of the Doppler shifted carrier, but it's science also. And uh, so we're able to see that um, and look at that. So um, again, the, with, you know, the TIDs are something that's very interesting going on in the ionosphere. Um, we have been able to correlate ours, our observations with um, GPS um, total electron content observations. We should try to correlate them with the WWV grape observations and such, but um, we're looking to see that this system, uh, you know, that, that our local system has been successful. We want to expand it to the rest of it. And I wanted to um, point out this, our team has been um, over the years uh, quite extensive, uh, expansive. Uh, Jim LaBelle is our principal investigator. Uh, Phil Erickson and Shenrong Zhang have been some of the science uh, contributors, um, Mike Trimpey, myself, Terry Kovacs, and Juha Virnan have put in engineering on this system. And then we have a large number of students who have been able to contribute. And I put et al at the bottom because I'm sure there are some that I've forgotten, but uh, we thank everybody. Any questions? Yes. Any, any thought about uh, working with the stations to make their signal more stable? Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a money thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a good question. Why they don't have better oscillators? But well, I can understand why they don't have better oscillators, but. Them be, have a better so that's an interesting team. question. Um, hadn't thought about that. Better oscillators, yes. In that vein, are they are the stations that are in the Northern Hemisphere are they the stations that are in the Northern Yes. Yeah, that's the idea is to try to figure out where what's driving the um, traveling ionospheric disturbances. Yeah, it can be flares, it can be CMEs, it could be just 
weather. Oh, um, another one? What? I'm just going to say your there it was pretty much right over where uh, three of us are. Yes, actually, I'm aware of that. I talked to Dave uh, about that. Yes, I think one of you guys probably could host it quite nice. Okay, thank you. Just on that note. Do it this way. Apologize for the technical difficulty here. Yeah, I, I don't think it'll, it's not going to work. High floating meaning controls. I no, I, I don't. 
It's gonna show it like um yeah, show it like just Okay, just like that. That's the best we can do. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. All right. Sorry about that. I'm my 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 name is Jonathan Rizzo, KC3 EEY. I'm a VLF natural radio enthusiast and electrical engineer. It's been a year since Nathaniel and I installed my Whistler Catcher VLF reception system at Nathaniel's QTH at the W2NAF KC3 EEY VLF Observatory. In that year, the system captured millions of spherics, um, millions of spherics and tweaks over 40 Whistler events, two Dawn Chorus events, a handful of riser events, two SAQ transmissions, and for the first time, an amateur VLF transmission from TL3 JMM using the ABNOT digital mode. The data collected from the system can be used for many scientific and amateur applications in VLF phenomena, space weather study, amateur VLF trans and amateur VLF transmissions. A network of these systems is extremely powerful and can be used for real-time lightning location and amateur VLF transmission interferometry, just to name a few. Uh, Please see me for this information. Uh, here are some photos of the installation of the VLF reception system at Thanos QTH to run the cable to the antenna site. Nathaniel and I marked a trench path, dug a 275 foot trench, put in a two inch conduit uh, with the drag line. Then, the, then a cable bundle that included a CAT6 cable for the VLF active antenna was pulled through the conduit. There was a lot of physical labor but it produced some very nice results. And, and a big thank you to Nathaniel for hosting the system. Here are some pictures of the VLF active antenna and the earth ground strap around the mast. The earth ground connection is provided by the mast. The mast is aluminum so as not to interfere with the ground magnetometer installed nearby. This is the inside of the VLF active antenna. On the left is a picture a VLF receiver preamp board constructed using Manhattan construction. In the middle, you can see the boards fit inside the foam insert. On the right, the E-field antenna is comprised of copper tape. On the, on the outside of the foam insert, the antenna wire is soldered directly to the copper tape and the front end input of the VLF receiver. The foam insert is used to dampen microphonic vibrations due to the wind. Cat six pairs and earth ground connection attached to the green screw terminal connector. Everything fits inside a PVC pipe. This is a high level schematic of the system. I, I do apologize uh, for the uh, graininess. Uh, it illustrates the front end and line driver of the VLF active antenna and electrical isolation between the preamp and the shaft using isolated DC to DC converters and audio isolation transformers. And credit and thanks go to Gary AF8A. Uh, this is the Raspberry Pi enclosure with the isolated DC to DC converter and audio isolation transformer, uh, main power converter, Trimble Res SMT 360 GPS timing receiver, and audio injector stereo sound card in Raspberry Pi 3. Spectrum data is stored on a USB thumb drive and is also streamed to a local server for storage. Spectrum data is streamed over the internet to an aggregation server where you could listen to the VLF receiver in, v in, in real time, look at captured events from the event detector and see plots from the VLF power spectrum. It is also streamed over the internet to my server at home. As you can see, not much has changed at the antenna site, casing both the receiver and antenna, and antenna element with wind vibration damping has proven, success, has proven a successful design choice in producing reliable VLF uh, in producing a reliable VLF active antenna with minimal wind noise. This VLF uh, um, active antenna is still operational to this day. Over the course of the year, there were some issues with the system that had to be resolved. VLF receiver and inside interfacing circuit uses an isolated DC to DC converter and audio isolation transformer to isolate mains hum from the receiver. The image on the top left shows both the VLF receiver board and image, and the, and the image on the top right shows both 
on the inside interfacing circuit. These components account for about $80 of cost in parts. The isolation is essential for proper operation and lower noise floor. During the installation, the ground wire was erroneously installed alongside the conduit containing the VLF receiver's feed line, effectively breaking the isolation between the VLF receiver and, uh, and, and the shack. Um, whoops. Uh, many weaker natural radio events were missed as a result. Once the ground wire was finally pulled out and removed, the isolation was restored and the noise floor was lowered. On the bottom left is a time series plot of amplitude of the 180 hertz harmonic. With the ground wire installed up to about 1730 UT, you can see the high levels of 180 hertz. After the, after the removal, the level is much lower. On the right is a narrow band spectrogram of the 8270 hertz band, the dreamers band. The yellow portion is the main sum pollution. After the, after the removal, you can see the stark difference. This made it possible to receive an amateur transmission from DL3JMM. Um, using the Trimble Res SMT360 GPS timing receiver in the VLF reception system, I came across an interesting problem. In situations of poor signal reception, the rising edge, falling edge, or both of the pulse per second signal will jitter in time by around 1.5 milliseconds. When this occurs, the VLF, uh, VLF RX tool software that looks for the rising edge of the pulse to occur within a certain time window misses the pulse because it, it occurs outside that window. As a result, the GPS time snap spectrum is out, it, output is muted in the signal chain buffer and the spectrum data is not recorded. Once the signal reception improves, the rising edge does not jitter in time anymore and spectrum data is output to the signal chain. Upon further investigation and discussion from a Trimble engineer, it turns out that during the time the receiver's pulse per second edges are jittering, the receiver is toggling between the timing solution and internal counter run by the oscillator. On the left is a plot showing the PPS captured by the sound card. This is the PPS that is generated by the timing solution. On the right is the PPS captured four seconds later and generated by the internal counter. You can see that the rising edge has shifted in, in time as indicated by the arrows. Trimble solution to this was to use an outdoor antenna in, 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 in the proper location so it has a, cl a clear view of the sky without any, any obstructions. I captured many different types of natural radio emissions and VLA phenomena with the system. Here is an example of some nice multimode tweaks with the 1.7 kilohertz and 3.4 uh, modes. Uh, more modes, the more ping sound is present. Uh, here's a beautiful dawn course event that occurred April 10th during a uh, uh, G7 geomagnetic storm. This, this was a three hour long event. The frequency components extended to five kilohertz. Let's see if I could get it to play. Dawn course event had quite a large footprint because it was detected at a VLF receiver in Forest, Virginia. Notice the horizontal alignment of spherics, which is made possible by GPS time stamping of both receivers. On December 22nd, at around 4 a.m. local time, a beautiful dawn course event occurred during some weak geomagnetic storming. It was four hours long with the total uh, peak intensity around 5 a.m. local time. What was unique about this dawn course event was how wideband it was, extending up to seven kilohertz. It sounded absolutely beautiful. It also had a wide footprint and was observed at a VLF receiver in, in uh, for, Forest. Um, and also uh, about an hour earlier, a similar event was observed in the UK. You'll notice the higher frequency tones. And this was, this was taken during the peak. On March 10, 2023, there was some Whistler events that occurred a few days after some strong geomagnetic storming. Here are some examples of these Whistler events. As seen in the spectrogram, these Whistlers do not have a long frequency dispersion 
and are also pretty uh, uh, diffuse. They were pretty strong and audible. One question worthy of investig uh, one question worthy of investigating is how strong how the strong geomagnetic storming influenced the electron density of the Whistler ducts, resulting in a short uh, resulting in short duration uh, frequency dispersion. There's, there's one. On February 27th, uh, during some strong geomagnetic storming, riser events were observed. Risers are rising frequency components associated with geomagnetic storming. They differ from dawn force in that there are only a few rising frequency, uh, a few rising frequency components that are more discrete, whereas dawn chorus contains many rising fruits, um, rising fruits components um, that um, that are often more diffuse. Here are some examples of a diurnal amplitude plots of NAA, one of Navy's VLF transmitters on April 30th and May 4th, showing the characteristic shark fins that indicate solar flares occur. At VLF, the, the, um, at VLF, the ionization caused by solar flares causes a propagation uh, enhancement as opposed to blackouts at HF. You can see these, uh, Shark fins here. Uh, there is evidence that transient luminous events, also referred to as mesospheric lightning, are often generated by lightning strokes with continuing currents. And th it was observed uh, that continuing current strokes produce a delayed ELF component. Um, with TLEs like L, sometimes the source lightning stroke exhibits a continuing current that will generate an ELF tail that can be observed at long propagation distances. On the top is the ELVES event with a negative 333 kiloamp stroke. The associated spheric is seen in the time domain plot on the bottom left with the characteristic ELF tail captured by the VLF reception system. Further analysis can be done to the spheric's time of group arrival data. This histogram plot is of Whistler count data uh, for, uh, for the VLF receiver's location in Springbrook Township from December 2021 20, uh, until now. During the first four months, the VLF receiver was plagued with high levels of main hum noise due to ground, due to the ground uh, wire. So many whistlers were missed by the detector due to the high noise floor. As you can see, there's an uptick in whistler events during both the early spring and fall months. This raises some interesting science questions worth investigating. How much of the conjugate points, climb, um, how much of the conjugate, uh, how much of the conjugate points climatology had an influence on early spring and fall whistler counts? How much of an influence did geomagnetic activity have in creating and maximizing conditions for ducts to form? And how did this affect the whistler's dispersion measure? Using data from a network of VLF receivers can help answer these questions. It is also interesting to monitor changing levels of main sum throughout a period of time, especially if you're trying to troubleshoot a uh, main sum issue. On, on the left is an amplitude plot of 60 hertz, and on the right is an amplitude plot of 180 hertz. This data can be used uh, in power grid studies without even attaching any instrument to the power grid itself. Uh, VLF RX tools has the ability to create uh, compressed spectrograms of recorded VLF spectrum. Here are two compressed spectrogram plots showing frequency up to 16 kilohertz for the duration of the UT day. On the top is the VLF spectrum from the September 11th, and on the bottom is from November 11th. You can clearly see the lower spheric density on the November plot, which is expected due to less hemispheric lightning. The nighttime Earth ionospheric waveguide cutoff modes can can easily be seen and also have a longer duration due to shorter seasonal days. The regular spaced lines are, are hum harmonics. Uh, local interference, um, the event detector that automatically uh, detects chorus and risers can sometimes be triggered due to 
electric motor startups in the local environment. It looks for rising frequency components common to both chorus, risers, and motor startups. The main spectrogram shows the motor of Nathaniel's vacuum cleaner with a fundamental of an, and, and at least three harmonics. Uh, on, on the left are other examples. SAQ is a VLF station in Grimmiton, Sweden, that still transmits CW messages on special occasions on a frequency of 17.2K. On the left is a non-coherent spectrogram plot of SAC's 17.2 uh, uh, K Hertz uh, Christmas Eve 2021 transmission and also February 13th, 2023. They're indicated by these large peaks. Uh, the 2023 transmission was clearly audible and copyable. Uh, this is the QSL card that, that we got from them for the uh, Christmas Eve transmission. Uh, finally, this presentation is dedicated to Carl Eddy, AA3WR, who was my Elmer uh, electronic communications professor and friend. It was because of Mr. Eddie that I became a ham, and he's the reason I am the engineer that I am today. I have uh, 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 background information. Uh, please see me if you need this. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you. Well, you, hold on a minute. <laughs> Your uh, KB1HFT here. Your slides are very interesting, but um, you only had a little bit of time to go through them. Will they be available on the MSide site? Yes, they are available on MSide site, and I invite you to uh, go over them. And if you have any questions, just uh, uh, send me an email. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Um, well, so so that's a very interesting thing um, that I I wanted to uh, do. So um, uh, there are a lot of interesting effects that occur at each of the conjugate points, um, and unfortunately, where these whisper uh, whispers come from, they could come from, from over the sea, you know, anywhere. But what I would like to do is have a network, a global network of VLF receivers that I could eventually have antennas at, at these conjugate points. And I could do further analysis from that. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone. We will now have a coffee break until uh, 1030. Thank you. Okay, everybody, we'll uh, begin the session now. So I am Gareth Perry from NGIT. I am the chair of this session. Uh, we have a bit of a schedule change for our first speaker. Um, unfortunately, I'm trying to report our first speaker, uh, Dr. Anna Elias, uh, had her father passed away, so she's unable to give her talk. Um, so we will uh, allow her to give her a talk uh, during a special hand size seminar at a future date. This one here. Yep. One second. Better, better, better. There we go. So uh, as I said, our uh, first speaker, uh, her father passed away, so she's unable to be able to talk. Um, and we send our, our loving condolences to her. Um, what we'll do is have her give a special hand size seminar at a later time uh, when it's uh, she'll be able to when it's more comfortable for her. Um, so uh, replacing, we'd like to thank uh, Steve Serwin for for uh, sorry one second here giving a talk. There's Steve. So we have uh, Steve Serwin WA5 FRF. We have talked about on air multipath TDOA experiments for ionospheric layer height measurements using amateur radio stations. If you want to use this, okay, hold on to it. Thanks. So, um, I'm Steve Serwin. No, 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 this is a substitute talk. For, well, he just explained, yes, that's right. So, one of the objectives for the upcoming eclipses is, is to measure um, propagation changes, and in particular, we're interested in the change in the effective height of the refraction layers, like the F2 layer. 
caused by the momentary blockage of the sun and then how it comes back after it passes. You know, in uh, the last eclipse, I took WWVB amplitude data and it showed a beautiful triangular 10 dB increase in signal strength as the D layer went away. Um, Steve Ryer, WA9VNJ, took Doppler data that I was able to integrate and back project what the height had to do. And it, it matched really well with Ionison data. So this time we're going to try and make a little more concerted effort to measuring the changes in height of the, of the ionization layers as the eclipse comes by. And we want to do it with just ham radio style. So, you know, you could deduce layer height uh, if you could make an absolute time of flight measurement, but then the stations would have to have precise uh, time references, which you can get from a GPS DO. But even worse is almost all modern radios use a lot of DSP processing and they have serious time delays, longer actually than the propagation delay, for example, from WWV in Colorado down to South Texas. My 7610 had four milliseconds of delay time through its IF. My R8600 had 12. Propagation delay time is only four and a half. So anyway, it's doable, but, but you got to do a lot of things. Uh, so I was looking for a way. To do it, that uh, was a lot easier to do. Um, so if you have a path that will support multiple hops, like a one hop and a two hop mode, you can kind of get the same data if you can measure the time difference of arrival, the TDOA, between the one and two hop modes. And you can do that if you transmit waveforms that are sensitive to the simultaneous presence of things that are slightly displaced in time. Two hop modes, longer path, takes longer to get here. So. Um, We've done that. We've made some waveforms. Christina, KD8 OXT, made them on um, MATLAB. We've got some short pulses and some chirps. So anyway, here's here's the idea. You can get a path that has both one and two hop modes. Then, and you look at the time difference of arrival between the two, you can get back to layer height because it's it's longer. Um, if you use a virtual height model you can come up with some really, really simple equations that you can use to predict propagation delays. So for example, yeah, that's working. Over here is the, prop, is the path length on this side, and this is the time of flight in milliseconds. Uh, this is between Fort Collins, Colorado, and here, or South Texas, I should say, 1,350 kilometers. Here's the one hop, two hops, three hops. So what we're talking about doing is, me is measuring this, the time difference of arrival, between the one hop and two hop modes. For example, here, um, the, that TDO is 0.67 milliseconds at the layer heights at 225 kilometers, and it's 1.1 um, milliseconds if you're at 300. In fact, I have a spreadsheet here that, that helps me to uh, run these numbers out with a lot more precision. You enter a distance, a ground distance over here, and it calculates the one hop path, two hop path, the uh, time of arrivals, time of flights, and then the, the difference, the time difference of arrival. So here's how on, on this path, 317 kilometers, which is the path I'm gonna report on experiments today, uh, how you would relate the time difference, and this is in milliseconds, to, to layer height. It also gives you the takeoff angles or the angle of propagation, which is kind of important. Uh, Tells you the path lengths. Here's the, here's the time of flight for the one hop and two hop modes. And this last line down here is the difference between them. So you can see that there is a definite relationship between ionization height and um, time difference of arrival. In fact, I use that spreadsheet to generate this conversion chart. Uh, this is time difference of arrival across the bottom. This is the uh, ionization height in a virtual height model here in kilometers. So here you can see down here at the low elevations is the D region, there's the E region, F1 and F2. Uh, the test we ran showed propagation delays of about 1.7 milliseconds at 317 kilometers. So you're growing up here, here's, here's 250, here's 500, 
317 is about right there, and that would correspond to a height of around 260 to 280 kilometers. So what we did was take this data and compare it to uh, Anasan height data. So a short one cycle pulse is one thing because you can just see the time difference of arrival. I'll show you some of those. But another thing you can do is transmit a chirp. So if you have this multipath where both the one and two hop modes make it into your receiver at the same time, you've got two chirps that are displaced in time. And when you sum, two chirps displaced in time, you get a beat note. And the beat note is uh, simply the, the delta frequency, frequency that you're after is the sweep rate times delta T. For example, here's, here's two chirps that go at 100 hertz per millisecond at zero time and then displaced by one millisecond over here and two milliseconds over here. And then when you add them together, you see this beat note. So at, uh, at one millisecond, it's uh, 100 hertz milliseconds times 100 hertz per millisecond is a, is a, a millisecond. Um, and there's the peak note. And you can measure it by looking at the distance between the nulls or the or measure the period anyway, or the distance between the uh, time difference between the peaks. And then here at, at two milliseconds delay, uh, it's a 200 hertz peak note. So here's the experiment that we ran. Um, Here's San Antonio, here's Abilene, here's Dallas, Fort Worth. My QTH is over here just west of San Antonio. My friend Paul, N5DUP, who is listening to us, I believe, right now in Zoom, and we're going to go talk to him in the station here a little bit later today. He's queued up to, to work us here. He's up just south of Abilene. That's a 317-kilometer path. Here was the idea. I took this, this uh, waveform, set it to my... ICOM 7610 on sideband. We did this on two bands, 60 meters and 75. Got to be low enough in frequency that you can actually get that second hop. And then he received it on his end with uh, a couple of different receivers and recorded it. He used a 7300 and the 7610, both of which have a record button right there in the front panel. And that's how he recorded the waveforms. So our test waveform consisted of uh, six different things. It was five repetitions of a one cycle pulse centered at one and a half kilohertz. That's as short as you can get. Um, I've done time arrival data on WWV. There are one second tick pulses. Those are five cycles at one kilohertz. But with the difference of propagation delays being in the millihertz range, that time delay is less than the pulse width. So they come down on top of each other and they some and interfere. So you really need a much shorter pulse. One and a half kilohertz is right in the middle of a three kilohertz pass band. That's as high as you can go and get through an amateur audio channel. So that's one thing we sent, five repetitions of this one cycle at one and a half kilohertz. And the others were chirps uh, at different chirp rates, five repetitions of hundred hertz per millisecond, and then half that, half that again, and then down to 10 hertz per millisecond. Uh, and then 10 repetitions of the, that fast chirp, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. So here's the chirp down here. Here's the one cycle pulse. Here's what it sounded like. So the, the sensitivity here is in that waveform, right? The ingredients are you have to know your path distance. You have to have a pick up a band that will support both one and two hop modes. So you have to have propagation of both of them. And you have to have a waveform that is sensitive to um, time difference of arrival. <laughs> Go to the next slide, it plays a sound for you again. Thank you. So here's what it looked like. Uh, this is the one that was on 75 meters. This is the wave five, wave file he recorded. You can see right away that we've got some structure in these chirps. Here was the uh, one we did on 60 meters. Let me assure you that we did not bust the bandwidth limit on 60 meters. I'll show you proof of that because even though these waveforms coming off the file, the wave file have five kilohertz components, that doesn't make it through the radio. I mean, the radio's normal filters are still there. When you speak into your microphone, after all, you're, you have components beyond five kilohertz, yet you have a 2800 hertz uh, band pass, which is what we have. 
Okay, so here's what some of a close up of what some of these look like. Um, here are the two pulses. It transmitted as one, but we received two. Nice thing about pulses is you immediately can see that there's two things that are arriving at different times. And the difference between these two is about 1.6 milliseconds. Here is uh, the chirp. A couple of things to notice is first of all, we indeed get did get the uh, the beat note in here. And I measure that by looking at the at the time difference between the two adjacent nulls. You could use the peaks, but because of the amplitude roll off and the artifacts from the processing, I found that the nulls are uh, a little more reliable. This is as pretty as it can get, just like all radio, all depends on conditions, right? Here's one that was uh, a little more complicated, still worked. I was still able to use this null compared to this null. This one's got some other interesting things going on here. Notice that we've got some very close together uh, beat notes up here. That's about a half a millisecond, which if you look at that chart I had up earlier, it's just right for the E layer. So it looks like in this particular uh, return, we had both one and two hops from the F layer and one and two hops from the E layer. Those uh, up down chirps, real fast ones, for example, here it starts out at near zero, five kilohertz, back to zero again. But what actually comes to the radio looks like this. You can see we're not transmitting and receiving these five kilohertz components because of the filters in the radio. So no, we did not bust the bandwidth limit on 60 meters. Um, so I took all that data and looked at every waveform uh, on both bands and calculated the time difference of arrival and converted that to layer height. Uh, so here's the 75 meter data, here's the 60 meter data. This was on the 24th of February, this past February, and the 26th. Average uh, was 248 with a max of 282 and 232. So there's a scatter of 50 kilometers there. Um, on 60 meters, the average height was 272 kilometers, max of 292, min of 244. And that's what it looks like when you overlay it on the Austin ionosonde, which was convenient to this path. It was, was fairly close. So you can query these ionosons and you can pull height of maximum F2 layer, HMF2, which is a spread curve on top, HMF1, here's the uh, F1 layers. And you notice it doesn't, doesn't show up until after dawn. This is nighttime, this is daytime. And then this is the E layer down here at the bottom, the height of the maximum E. This flat line here actually means that the E layer was not detected. Um, Unfortunately, they, they print it anyway, even though it wasn't there. Both the E and the F1 layer go away at night. Not always, but they are now and uh, appear during the day. So this was the, uh, the first one, 75 meters. This was the average, not bad. Uh, of those 20 measurements, 19 of them scattered between these two bars right here with one flyer up here. On uh, 60 meters, several days later, we did that during the middle part of the day. Here was the average, here was the extreme spread, and 18 of those 20 clustered within these two bars with two flyers out here. It always happens that way. I don't care if you're bench rest shooting or taking data, you're going to get two flyers that always open things up. But really, I was pretty encouraged with this, um, that it was even on the same chart. <laughs> But actually, I think it's going to work. Now, remember, our objective here is to see what happens to the layer height as the eclipse passes. So really, I wasn't banking so much on absolute accuracy as being able to detect the changes as the, as the eclipse comes by. So we should be able to see the, as, as it gets darker, the uh, ionization regions should rise and then they should come right back down. That's what they did in 2017, and I'm, I'm sure they'll do it again now. So the idea, the ideal way to do this, it, initially we were talking about maybe in the true spirit of a contest, the solar eclipse QSO party, make it a, a bonus thing that stations could do, but you know, really random contacts at random times and random directions, it, it'd be kind of hard to paint a coherent picture with that. I think the best thing to do is to get two dedicated stations 
like the example, the one I just showed you between uh, Paul up in Abilene and me down in San Antonio, and just hit that, oh, maybe every six to 10 minutes so that you get enough resolution. Start two hours before maximum eclipse is supposed to be where you are, and then continue for two hours after, and then just plot what you get. So um, and it'd be good to have other stations do this as well. If we could, and by the way, you don't have to be, you don't necessarily have to have the eclipse path transect your two stations. Yes, that would be nice, but that amplitude data I took in 2017 was from Fort Collins down to Texas, and the path of totality was north of both of those places. I mean, it affected the ionosphere as far as south as South Texas, even though it was north of Colorado. Yeah, we're essentially done. So um, anyway, the results are encouraging. It, it looks like these layer heights gave reasonable uh, results or consistent with what I saw on the Austin Ionison. Uh, I'm encouraged. Um, I think it's gonna work. It doesn't work all the time. I mean, this is HF radio after all, uh, but it appears to work under, under good conditions. The one cycle pulses are valuable. They give you an immediate direct indication of time difference of arrival. Um, and they're good to back up what you see with the trip, trip data, so I'm going to keep them. They are subject to uh, phase shifts and wave shape distortion, which happens in receivers, different receivers. It's receiver dependent. I'd like to get higher than one and a half kilohertz. I do have some experiments using a, a ramp with controlled slope to see if I could just hit something in the impulse response of the receiver and look for that time delay. <laughs> Uh, I did find out that the fastest chirp, the 100 hertz per millisecond chirp, is too fast for Paul 7610. It gave numbers that were off by uh, two thirds. So we're going to delete that one. But the, but the longer, slower ones are, are fine, and they all agree pretty well. The bandwidths of the receiver and transmitter should be as high as possible. We did five kilohertz. By the way, these were the Test waveforms at WWV has been transmitting at eight and 48 minutes past the hour, 48 for WWVB, and they do have five kilohertz of bandwidth. The nulls um, are more consistent than using the peaks, looking for the, the time differences. Now, I brought my hat so I can stand here and hold it in front of you. Reducing this data by hand is time consuming. We need somebody who's good friends with Mr. Fourier and good with MATLAB or something to be able to pull these beat frequencies out of those chirps. So if you're looking for something to do with your free time, look me up. Don't laugh. Somebody will come through. On no, I'm, I need it seriously. Yeah. Because uh, if we do get multiple stations taking this thing, um, it, it'll be overwhelming. It took me hours to, to pull these two records out. And we're talking about having... 10, a minute, 10 an hour for four hours and multiple map paths. We need an automated way of pulling these deep frequencies out. We have to clone you. <laughs> but, but not at this age. <laughs> okay, any questions? Okay. Hi, uh, yes, Jim. Yeah. Uh, yes, a very nice talk. Very interesting, as always. Uh, I was wondering your model that you did, your your uh, calculator that you made. It seems to infer a uniform ionosphere between the different reflection points. But it seems like in the eclipse, you might have some significant horizontal gradient. I was wondering if you have plans to maybe make that model a little bit more, um, introduce some horizontal gradients or something like that. And, you mean on the theoretical part? Use the theoretical. Exactly this here. So those very gradients you're talking about is what we hope to measure. This thing, it seems like your calculation assumes that you've got a, a uniform uh, it, it does. Your, uh, in terms of a height layer. But if you have a gradient present, it would certainly change these, these numbers. So you, you, I was wondering if you were trying to do it, it would be. It, it would, I guess, because the uh, apex of the one and two hot modes would be displaced. Yeah, you're right. It would change it. That's a good thing to look at. Good point. Time for one last quick question. 
Okay. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker is Veronica Romanek from the University of Scranton. And the title is I'll read it together. Climatology <laughs> of Ines. Ionospheric variability with MSTID periods observed during great version one HF Doppler receivers. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. Uh, during... Hello. Hello, everyone. My name is Veronica, and I will be talking about um, the research I've been doing studying MSTIDs. So a brief outline of what I'll be aiming to address today is what are medium scale traveling ionospheric disturbances? What is the great personal space weather station? What are the occurrence rates of MSTIDs observed with the great personal space weather station? And does this differ seasonally? And then my future work and a summary. So a brief introduction of MSTIDs. Um, what they are is a space weather effect that's generated by propagating gravity waves or geomagnetic activity that disturbs the electron density in the ionosphere and creates moving wave-like irregularities of charged particles in a planet's atmosphere. Um, Medium-scale traveling ionospheric disturbances, or MSTIDs, um, have specific parameters, including a wavelength between 50 and 500 kilometers, um, and periods of 15 to 60 minutes. Um, so I did want to briefly go over a radio station called WWV. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but just in case. Um, WWV is a National Institute of Standards and Technology Time Standards Station. It's located near Fort Collins, Colorado. It tra transmits extremely accurate frequencies um, on a number of different frequencies. And for the purpose of the research I've been doing, I've been working specifically with the 10 megahertz frequency from WWE. Um, I don't want to get too in-depth about the group. Uh, John Gibbons gave a very nice talk about the group this morning, but just a brief overview. Um, I'm working with one of the great version ones. It was developed by the HAM Radio Science Citizen Investigation and its members at Case Western. And what it is, is a small measurement-based platform that can be used to make ground-based observations of the space environment. And I'm using it to actively monitor, uh, as I mentioned, a 10 megahertz transmission from WWV. So the grape that I'm working with for the data that I'll be showing you today is located very close by to where we are at this conference in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, and this is just a map that depicts the path the radio wave takes from WWV to the grape. So what I'm actually doing is um, as the radio wave interacts with the ionosphere, it refracts off of it. And so any variations that we're seeing in the atmosphere, we can detect as, um, with Doppler shift in the received carrier wave. And so in the bottom, that is what that's showing. That's the, um, the Doppler shift to 10 megahertz wave from WWV. The plot above it, so the plot in the middle, that is showing the, um, the power spectral density of the plot in the bottom. So I applied a filter to the data. So I'm specifically looking for oscillations of periods between 50 to six, 15 to 60 minutes. Um, and then um, oscillations that fit that period um, are shown as brighter yellow spots in the power spectral density plots. And then the plot on top um, is taking plots in the middle. Uh, this one specifically looks at two year, a two year time frame, and it averages the plots to see where we're seeing the most. Um, activity in the region of, of the periods that we would expect to see for MSTIDs. Um, and you can see that this specific plot for two, the two years from 2021 to uh, January of 2023 is showing increased periods of activity from between about 10.30 to 11 a.m. local time, so Eastern time. Um, and so looking at this, we decided we want to see how this differs um, seasonally. 
So I split up the data uh, by season, starting with uh, looking at one year at a time. So this is looking for uh, 2021. And uh, the way I defined the seasons was I looked at um, either the solstices or the equinoxes, and I did one month before and after those days. Um, so this is for the winter, and you can see um, the top is the average for uh, the entire winter of 2021. And um, and the middle one is just one specific day where you can see that there are, I, I thought this was a good example that shows how the, the power spectrum density coincides with the oscillations that we're seeing in the Doppler shift degrees. And you can see that in the winter, there seems to be increased um, uh, power spectral densities between 8.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. all the time. So for the spring, um, I, again, I split this up based on the, uh, the vernal equinox. And, um, and we see that there's increased periods of activity between 10.30 p.m. and 8.30 a.m. For the summer, we see um, a little bit more activity, and there's several hot spots here, um, including 10.30 p.m. to 1 a.m. and uh, about 4 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. And then for the fall, um, we're seeing uh, several hot spots again from 10.30 p.m. to about 1 a.m. and then again from 6 a.m. to about 11 a.m. local time. Um, so one thought that I did have looking at this is um, it is possible that some of this is because of the sunrise, because the sunrise is, um, depending on the season, anywhere from like 5.30 a.m. to like 7 a.m. So um, I did notice in a lot of these plots that there are hot spots in that region, but there also are um, promising signs of MSTID, MSTID activity at other times of the day as well. And so what I did was I compared um, each season to the two-year uh, average power spectral density plot that I made to see how the different um, periods of increased MSTID period activity um, compares with each other. And so based on all this, I determined that so far the data suggests that there's increased MSTID, MSTID activity between 10.30 p.m. and 1 a.m., and then again between 6 a.m. and 8.30 a.m. Um, and I just highlighted that with some uh, boxes. So um, conclusions. Um, conclusions. So I am looking for medium scale tropic ionospheric disturbances or MSTIDs. I'm doing this by working with data from a great space weather station located near Scranton, Pennsylvania. I'm looking at the power spectral density of the Doppler shifted 10 megahertz carrier signal from WWB. And then I'm seeing um, MSTID period hotspots around 10.30 p.m. to 1 a.m. and 6 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. And this activity is consistent with um, MSTIDs also seen through the whole night. And um, there does appear to be seasonal variations in the activity that we're seeing. So where do I go from here? Um, so I plan to examine hotspots further to see if the hotspots are actually due to MSC period oscillations, um, or as I mentioned, if it's just due to the dusk dawn uh, transition um, leaking through the filter. I also plan to investigate the underlying cause of the nighttime MSTID-like signatures. Um, I'm going to further investigate the seasonal variations and apply this to larger uh, periods of data and see how this compares with what we're seeing with other great version one stations that are set up already. Um, and then uh, I'm going to address how would this climatology be different if we listen on different frequencies and account for any geomagnetically disturbed and quiet days and see um, how the data that we see on those types of days differs. Um, thank you for all the funding that goes into this project, my references, um, and if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Questions, yes. Yeah, um, now you, you're using Doppler shift for this. Are you uh, using just uh, a variation from a mean, or are you actually are you able to put the plus and the minus 
on the directional movement. So I'm looking at how the 10 megahertz frequency, um, so in this bottom plot, how the 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 amplitude that you're seeing is the offset from the 10 megahertz frequency that I'm receiving. Um, and you can tell how the ion sphere is moving based on the direction. Um, so if it's a positive or a negative amplitude, that will indicate which way it's moving. Um, I'm not I'm not sure does that answer your question. You, if you once once you convert it into the power spectra, that does does that go away in your analysis, or are you keeping track of it? So I believe to, uh, the answer to your question would be it goes away. This is just showing the strength of the frequency. Um, so you wouldn't be able to tell like the specifics of it. Yes. Uh, oh, again, a very nice uh, talk, very interesting yeah. the result. Yeah. Um, I was curious to know whether, you know, you have these hot spots. I was curious whether they result from like very strong activity on a few days over the two months, or whether it's kind of consistently day after day, you're having a small level of activity day after day. Do you have a distinction between that, or do you have a sense for which is the case? Or? Yeah, so are you talking about the hot spots in the top pots or the middle? The hot spots in the middle there. I just curious, you know, do they come, do they tend to come, do you have like two or three active days that are really active and that makes the hot spot? Or do you consistently day after day see something at that time? So the middle spot is coming from just one day of observations. Um, so if we see a strong oscillation in the bottom, we see a stronger um, or like a brighter yellow spot in the middle. And then the top averages that season. So that would be like what we're seeing on average for several days, but um, just, are you talking about like okay yeah so the two months of data right yeah two months of data you know the hot spot is it like for a few days over the two months that's making that hot spot or is it the every day kind of seeing that activity see what i mean it it would be um every day because it's the average so it looks at every day whether it's active or not um and then generates the hot spot based on that so all the days in the two month period Great average could be the few days being really huge to give you a hot spot, and even if the other days don't pass the session. That is a good point. I'll have to be sure to account for that. Well, it might be interesting to kind of look at that and get, mm -hmm. you know, even, uh, yeah, that's, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. Yes. Can you just go to the seasonal variation This one? Yeah. I mean, you mm -hmm. have. In mind even some vague physical explanations for the variation? Um not at uh not at this point. My like off the top guess would be um during different seasons. So the sun like strengthens the ionosphere. Um and so different seasons like in the summer it gets more sunlight. So it's probably a little bit stronger than it would be in the winter when there's less sunlight. Um I don't know if, uh, if Dr. Purcell would agree with that, but I, I have to look in to have an official um, answer for that, but that would be off the top of my head what I would think. Yep. Just, just heading here, I was thinking, is there a real possibility this is a standing wave pattern in the ions, in these waves going around? You mean that is like the wave constantly well, there? Peaks and peaks and um, I think that this would be more like a traveling wave from the disturbance, um, based on the way that we're collecting the data. And I think if it was a standing wave, we would expect to see the same thing every day, but we don't. I don't know. Any other? Because I have a quick question. Um, so this is from Grape. There's several grapes around, including a few in New Jersey. Um, have you looked at that data? Does it look similar activity, or do, do you have any? So I've only looked at the grape in Scranton as of now, but uh, right after this conference, my next thing on my to-do list is to apply this to other groups. Awesome. Good. Yeah. Oh, because there is the possibility that it's Nate Daniels next door neighbor's garage door or something like that. Right. So okay. I really need to look at one side would be able to move out things like that. Yeah, that's a really good point. That's one of the reasons that we're gonna apply this to different groups. Okay. Oh, 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 what are the back? Do we have two questions online? Oh, go ahead. Uh, so 
This is from uh, Lynn Campy. How many half between Colorado and your site are there? And to measuring the properties of each half, is it really an average of all the half? Oh, the hop distance of like the wave pro propagating from WWV. Um, I haven't been looking specifically at hops. I've just been working under the assumption that it refracts off the ionosphere once it goes directly to the station. Um, but definitely going forward, I can work to take that into consideration. If that answers this question. And there's another question from username Hi Five Five Thousand. Are you still using the Great V One unit? Oh, you mean use the great V2 unit? So, for my specific study, I'm just using the network of data that we have from the great V ones that have been set up for a while. Um, although I believe that board is discontinued um, and they're working towards the version two for. Um, they just announced the new version. Yeah. The new version this morning. Yeah, so they announced the new version this morning. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes. All right. Our next speaker is Diego Sanchez from the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Uh, Diego's call sign is KD2RLM, and his talk title is Climatology of Large Scale Traveling Ionospheric Disturbances Observed with Amateur Radio Networks. I'll wait up here and uh, five minutes to be here. Yeah. Is it working or? Yeah. Cool. No, uh, so yeah, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Diego Sanchez. I'm a student at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. And this is my talk on uh, climatology of large scale travel and spheric disturbances observed with amateur radio networks. So, um, large scale travel and spheric disturbances, uh, they are quasi periodic uh, structures in the F region of the uh, F region electron density. Uh, they have profound effects on uh, radio wave propagation. And they typically have wavelengths of about uh, over a thousand kilometers um, and have periodicities from between 60 to 180 minutes. Um, there are many different instruments that can observe them, like uh, the super darn radars, uh, GPS, and ionosons. However, for the most part, uh, there is very low geographical coverage of the existing instruments. Um, so, this is just an example of what happens uh, to radio propagation uh, with travel and spheric disturbances. Uh, so as a traveling spheric disturbance goes through the ionosphere, uh, you see that the actual distance uh, of the radio wave of propagation changes over time, um, and they're perceived as a type of uh, HF fading. And uh, for this study, uh, we use three, uh, uh, three databases, or uh, the reverse beacon network, uh, WhisperNet, and PSK Reporter. Um, I'm sure many people here are acquainted with these, but... Um, uh, these are passive receiver networks that uh, have been collecting uh, ham radio spot data. And the really interesting thing I've been finding is that the amount of data available has been growing pretty significantly uh, over the last few years. Uh, for this study in particular, we used uh, only 2017, uh, but the amount of data available in subsequent years has been has been pretty substantial. Um, so here we have an example. Uh, so. For this study, we use these uh, uh, these this data from all three networks uh, to try and find to see if we could see these uh, structures um, in the data. And so down here, uh, these are uh, histograms of spot data using uh, two of the networks for this one in particular, uh, uh, WhisperNet and uh, Reverse Beacon Network. And so uh, this is showing uh, spot data. Uh, the actual distance from transmitter to receiver on the y-axis uh, over time. This is for a full day. And you can see here uh, a TID structure. So these 
uh, manifest as these bottom line wave structures in the ham radio data. Um, we're also plotting uh, geomagnetic activity uh, in uh, plot A up here and plot B. Uh, this is showing uh, solar uh, solar activity just to see if uh, any uh, perturbations or inconsistencies in the ham radio data histograms uh, could be caused by something else other than uh, TID. And we also have uh, the actual locations for all the spots. Uh, in this one in particular, we are only looking at uh, continental United States. Uh, so this technique was developed by uh, Dr. Purcell. Um, he actually had this published last year, um, but we took uh, you know, those structures that we were seeing in the ham radio data compared, uh, any day that we saw one was compared uh, using the other instruments. Uh, for example, super darn radars here in the middle and down here uh, using GPS. Um, and I mean, uh, showed pretty consistently that whenever we saw a TID structure in the ham radio data, we could find it in other instruments. And now here's an example of um, events that we did not include in this climatology. Uh, so in both of these plots here, you can see some pretty significant uh, solar activity. Uh, you can see these shark fins here. Um, these are pretty uh, uh, solar flares that were happening during these days. Uh, there was a particular week in September that had a lot of solar activity. And these are causing some pretty massive blackouts um, in the uh, ham radio data. <laughs> And a special mention, um, we could really see when contests are happening. Uh, <laughs> see, it lights up the data like a Christmas tree here. <laughs> but um, uh, for the most part, uh, they don't really affect the observation capabilities. Um, sometimes they would saturate uh, and you wouldn't actually be able to pick up anything. But uh, for the most part, they wouldn't have a negative effect. And now for the actual climatology results. So uh, I went through. Uh, 365 days for the full year 2017, and uh, looked for every uh, TID potential TID structure that I found. Um, and this was not just me. Uh, we had another member of the team, um, Dr. Mary Lou West of uh, Montclair State University, also painstakingly went through the data with me, um, just to kind of minimize uh, any human error. You know, if we were seeing different things, but for the most part, uh, it was pretty consistent. We were seeing uh, very similar structures uh, in the data. And so uh, we found that um, there was a lot more TID activity during the uh, winter months as opposed to the summer months with a spike in, um, in June. We have no idea why, uh, where that spike in June is coming from, um, but that is, uh, we are currently looking at what could be causing that. And um, this was compared to uh, previous uh, studies. Uh, in this one in particular, this was uh, Dr. Fursell's 2014 paper, uh, MSTID is using uh, super darn radars and um, very consistent results. Uh, the only problem is this spike in June, uh, super darn would not really be able to see. Uh, there is a lack of ground scatter in the summer and um, super darn requires that to be able to make observations. Uh, then uh, I went through and also tried to find days uh, that had uh, that were very noticeably quiet with no perturbations um, and did a, another climatology on that. And again, uh, found uh, fewer quiet events during the winter months uh, with much more uh, quiet events during the summer months. And um, also consistent with Super Darn, uh, obviously not in the summer, just because uh, Super Darn does not have the same observation capabilities during the summer. And so next, uh, we've been trying to find uh, the actual drivers for these events. Um, there could be many potential ones uh, from geomagnetic or rural uh, to gravity waves. Uh, and we've been now looking at uh, polar vortex and uh, zonal winds as potential drivers. Um, we could see down here, uh, these structures are showing uh, polar vortex structure um, with the red spots here, uh, gravity waves. And so uh, two of the first uh, drivers that I tried to find, so geomagnetic and a rural, we have in the first two here. Uh, so these are uh, looking at geomagnetic uh, activity through the SIM H uh, index. Um, not really any conclusive results there. We find, found that on average, um, uh, TID events generally had, um, they averaged out closer to negative 20 SIM H. 
uh, whereas uh, quiet events geared more towards zero or be, uh, between negative 20 and zero, um, but very slightly. And then the same thing, uh, we looked at the Kyoto Max AE Index um, for rural activity. Um, and again, hot, slightly higher values of um, uh, Max AE for TID events as opposed to quiet events, uh, but very, again, very slightly. Um, the next thing that I went through looking at was um, uh, zonal uh, winds, uh, zonal speed data uh, from, oops, uh, sorry about that, uh, zonal wind speed data from uh, Mirror 2, and um, I plotted out, so we have here, the colors here are showing uh, wind speeds, so uh, blue is uh, eastward winds, uh, red would be westward, westward winds, um, and the black line is showing uh, average uh, daily TID activity uh, over the year, and um, there seemed to be some correlation when whenever we had a big shift in the uh, wind directionality, there seemed to be a, it would be followed by a drop, uh, pretty significant drops in TID activity um, with a slight lag. Um, but this uh, did not really show anything for, uh, for the summer months. Yeah, so conclusions, uh, the current results and potential drivers for observed TID structures, uh, they're still inconclusive. Um, however, the results, uh, consistent uh, the manual search is completed by different members of the team. Um, the results also stay consistent with other studies done using different instruments. Um, the current method of observation is very slow. Um, I mean, going through each day manually looking for these things. Um, so uh, we've been trying to develop a new method, uh, an automatic method of detecting these TID structures in the data. Yeah, and um, that's it. Thank you very much. Any questions? Questions? Back there, yes. Uh, for uh, the uh, RBN data, that doesn't come with the, uh, they don't, the postings for that don't have the uh, geographic location data on that. How did you back that out? Um, I'm actually, that's actually Nathaniel. Do you have an answer? As I was questioning it, uh, RBN uh, does not come with the geographic location data. Um, sure. In fact, uh, we mostly do QRZ lookups, and I bet in the next talk it'll probably be answered. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was going to use this study uh, on the factors and climate change. Have you ever been using this to study different climate factors? Some of the problem in cycles, like the CDO and quasi by by real oscillation or like maybe Enzo, MJO, the whole universe? Um, not sure as of right now. Um, we're just mainly focusing on, on you know, whatever is causing these things in particular, but I mean, for future work. Yeah. Can I answer that? Oh, sorry. Um, you'll see in my talk, which is a couple of talks from now, uh, we are relating this to uh, climatological or large scale neutral atmospheric uh, phenomena like the polar vortex and winds. And some of those things may end up leading us down the path of looking at like QBO or some of that other stuff. Yes. Yeah. Very naive question. Would you expect differences in climatology between the MSPIDs and large scale and medium scale and large scale? Um, I've only really looked at uh, large scale challenge here disturbances. I don't know if. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> our, our work's closely related. So, yes, um, you would expect. I would have expected potentially some difference because uh, MSTIDs are um, more related. There's more support already for relating them to like gravity waves and neutral atmospheric things. And if you look in the literature, large scale traveling atmospheric disturbances are generally tied to geomagnetic disturbances. Um, however, we are seeing in our work now that there does seem to be a, a strong correlation as um, he's been showing. So we think there may be a closer tie than might have been previously thought. Yes. Uh, uh, my question has to do with uh, ham radio contest and i.e. the high levels of ham radio activity versus low levels of ham radio activity. Uh, are, did you notice that that is, has an effect on this and or did you do any corrections to, to try to cancel that out? Yes, uh, so it has a massive impact on it. Um, I mean, you need a minimum. Oh, sorry. Is that, is it working? Yeah, um, so uh, you need a minimum of at least uh, 
20, 30,000 spots in a day to even be able to potentially see something. On average days with TID structures, they were between 80 to 100,000 uh, just for the uh, for the continental United States. Um, contest days, I mean, that that would, uh, you know, the amount of spots is is way higher. It'd go up into 500,000, maybe a million spots uh, for one day. But um, sometimes it would oversaturate. So um, I, I didn't make any corrections during this. Uh, however, um, in the future, I think I showed the plot earlier um, with the, just the amount of data here. Uh, so the amount that, that we're getting, uh, so like, for example, this last year, 2021, I mean, 27 million spots as opposed to 2.5 that I had when I did the study. Um, I think we might have to start doing some uh, filtering to cut out some of those spots. Um, I'm personally, I, I want to try and uh, do smaller slices, uh, geographic space, uh, location, see if maybe we could pull out smaller structures. Yes. Uh, have you considered meteors? Meteors? Uh, not for this. <laughs> well, I was, okay. There, there were, what, the, what about the frequency distribution of these spots? Like, I remember, uh, I think I, you showed results pretty, previously, so these folks don't know about it, but showing really, really high for like 20, 20 megahertz, about 20 megahertz spots. Were there, were there many there in your analysis? Um, there were not. So for the most oh, okay. part, um, 20. That about like megahertz. about, yeah. So what frequencies were you using? Uh, so I was using primarily 7 and 14 megahertz. Okay. Um, 14 megahertz was predominant. There wasn't a lot of observations done on 7. Uh, but for the most part, all structures that we really saw, um, I have here. Uh, so you could see here, for example, uh, this is uh, 28 megahertz on this top one and C. Uh, D here is 21 megahertz. And on the bottom two, you have uh, 3.5 and 1.8. Um, there were almost no observations made on any of those other ones. For the most part, it was just 14 megahertz. Any final point? Right, yeah. We have two questions from Alex, KR1ST. Is global data used for the spotting networks or only from the northern hemisphere? If global, could the June spike be explained by the fact that it's winter in the southern hemisphere? Um, so we do have global data. I just, uh, depending on where I was looking, I have also done climatology of Europe. Uh, but for the most part, we only really had enough concentration of spots in uh, Europe and continental United States to make any observations. Okay. No more questions? Okay. Second case. All right. Our, our next speaker is uh, Bill Engelke, AB4EJ. And uh, from the University of Alabama, and Bill will be talking about uh, analyzing large-scale traveling ionospheric disturbances using spot data and curve fitting. I'll give you a way that I can do five minutes. Okay. It is not also the propagation. How many shirts? Morning, thanks. Um, Bill Engelke here from University of Alabama, Alpha Bravo 4 Echo Juliet is my call sign. For those of you who hear me coughing and sneezing, fear not, I'm not sick. This is seasonal allergies, which is the springtime is the season for it. And I have this in spite of taking two or three different antihistamines. So I'll do the best I can here. Um, so let's see, how do we advance the... Okay. All right. Uh, some of this I'm just going to gloss over because Diego did a very good job of doing a lot of basic definitions. So, but um, what I'm talking about here is a NASA sponsored project to use amateur radio spot data to study waves in the ionosphere. Uh, we're using combined spots from Whisper, RBN, and PSK. And now we're looking at a several different techniques to, to automate the detection. Um, a lot of the work that has been done by Diego and Mary Lou from Montclair State has been done manually by examining the data um, manually. And that's 
it starts to get very labor intensive if you're trying to do years across multiple continents. And, and uh, so we're looking to see if we can automate that. Um, so that I'm gonna gloss over this has already been discussed. Um, this is what TIDs look at, look like when you use, um, when you look at the super darn data. Um, this is the Blackstone um, radar, Blackstone, Virginia. On the left, you can see the range in which the sweep of the signal goes. Uh, it covers most of the continental US and Canada. And um, on the right, you see the ground scatter. So you see these um, sine wave-like structures in the, in the data um, with a period of one to four hours. Now, I, I think Diego said one to three hours. So I've, I've heard both definitions. Um, you know, that's one of those things that is subject to interpretation. But um, anyway, um, why do we use spot data? Uh, mainly because of volume of it. There's uh, over 25 million, it's up north of 30 million, sometimes even more uh, per day. And that's big data. You can do a lot of work with that. Um, it's complementary to super darn HF data in that we continue getting a lot of good data in the summer. Uh, when super darn doesn't have a lot of ground scatter, and we can use this to do climatology studies. So each spot, for each spot, we have the signal's origin and where it was heard. So we've got uh, an estimated path. Uh, we got a date, time, and frequency, and um, we have to assume short path. We don't have a good way of teasing out whether the signal went the other way around the earth, but with this volume of data, I think that those oddball cases tend to wash out in, in the, as averaging together. So typically what we do is we started out plotting this stuff to show a direct comparison to the super darn plot. Go back and take a look at how the, how the super darn plot is laid out. Uh, on the X axis here, uh, you go, you've got a, um, yes, that's time. So you're looking at a part of, part of a day here. And on the y-axis, you have range in kilometers. So we're going to plot our spot data in exactly the same format so we can do direct comparisons. So for, for, uh, we're, we're working mainly with 20 meters, that is 14 megahertz, uh, for this first effort. Um, so we're looking at UTC 1200 to 2400. That's when the 20 meter band is open over North America. So again, y-axis is spot distance in kilometers, and the color of the point uh, indicates the number of spots this minute at this range. Um, when I say uh, the point, um, each bin is one pixel, and the bins are one minute by 10 kilometers in range. So here's an example plot. Laid out the same way as the... Uh, super darn data. And this lower edge here that you see, I have defined as minimum useful range. Um, and that's kind of um, not always the case because you do see some spots at uh, shorter ranges, but the majority of the spots seem to follow the underside of the ionosphere as it changes throughout the day. It's a little bit fuzzy because the, the LSTIDs are actually moving. So you do see a little bit of smear due to their movement, but you do tend to see this sinusoidal looking underside. And sometimes it's damped. It's a damped wave sometimes, sometimes it's not. Uh, that's one of those things that we don't yet know what's going on there exactly. Uh, that's a good, good uh, area for study. But this is what we're gonna work with. So we wanna try and figure out how can we automate the detection of these curves, because on a day without LSTID, this will just be a straight flat uh, propagation, like the propagation distance is the same all day. When you have LSTIDs traveling through North America, then you see these variations. So we have a lot of data. We have data from 2015 through present. That's over 3000 image files for each band in each continent. And we have useful data only for 20 meters and 40 meters. That's where you see the most of this, most of this data. That's over 12,000 images. And we've created a lot since, um, uh, there's been a lot more since I made this slide. So what we need is an automated way to look at, uh, de detect the, what months are the most average because we wanna do the climatology studies 
that Diego was talking about. So we want to determine the period and amplitude of those waves. Um, the idea is to study uh, and these get a better understanding of LSTID activity. So progress so far. The first approach, uh, we developed a neural net system to recognize LSTIDs and images of propagation uh, using object detection. So this is uh, something that TensorFlow is object detection. You give it a bunch of little images of those curvy underside sh uh, shots of the ionosphere and say, now look at all the data we have included in the training set and see how many of them you can find. Um, we do get a climatology that is quite similar to the hand-derived climatologies, um, but we get a, a few more false positives and false negatives. That's not uncommon in object detection until you have everything tuned. Um, so what we're working on now is we're looking at an alternate approach to see if we can do this using a decision tree uh, and a least squares fit to a sine wave. Uh, so let's take a look at how we do that. We start with our standard, standard image of, of the spots. And um, that is, uh, as you see one, you see an example here where you see a, this appears to have a sine wave underside in it. Um, I've also played around with taking this image and 3D printing it. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll let it, everybody would be happy, be interested in this. If you come take a look at it during the break, you can see the LSTIDs in this. And you can also see something interesting that the um, what you this the LSTID sinusoidal signature is going to differ depending upon the threshold. The threshold being defined by how high you cut off what you're going to look at, because it changes uh, depending upon how you threshold it. Uh, so, and this is a day that only had one little lump in it. This one has some significant ones. So what we do is we apply a binary filter to this. So we split it up into uh, parts of the curve, uh, parts of the data that fall below a threshold are shown as black, above the threshold is shown as gray, and the transition is shown as white. Then we can extract that underside, that white, that's our minimum useful range curve. Uh, so, we can use heuristics to look for sine wave-like features in that, um, but let's take a look at some ways to go about doing that. Heuristics meaning a rule-based approach. Um, how do we do least squares fit to a sine wave? Well, we use a sliding window of 240 minutes. That's our maximum LSTID uh, length that we're gonna be sensitive to. And we look at 10 minute intervals. So we take, uh, look at the first 240 minutes of our snapshot of, uh, of our day, uh, look for, do a sine wave fit to it, then move over 10 minutes and repeat the process, saving all the data each time. So we are using uh, something in the Python library called SciPy Optimize. It will do least squares fit to a sine curve and to do other things as well, but we're using the sine wave. So here's the detected edge. This is simply uh, taking that edge and showing it in Excel. But this is, here's an illustration of, of what the windowing looks like. Uh, let's take this first window. This first window isn't very useful because uh, this shows a time when 20 meters is just starting to get prop, uh, show propagation at the beginning of the day. So it, we consider this noise. So we're going to throw away most of the data from this window, but we keep moving over. Now over here now, what we have now, this window here is now something that has a clear sine wave in it we can analyze. And uh, we run that through the sine wave analyzer and keep doing that all the way across the rest of the data. And now we extract the amplitude period and max covariance uh, for each uh, 10 minute window. The max covariance is a measure of how much noise and uncertainty is present in the data. So the more squiggles we have in it, uh, the higher the max covariance. So this is a, a first attempt at doing this. I will admit this doesn't really stand up to very good scrutiny because some of the uh, heuristics have been basically chosen arbitrarily just based on manually examining the data. 
And um, I'll talk about that more in a moment. But first thing you got to do is you got to take away the outliers. Uh, it's typical that a, your SciPy optimizer is going to produce some garbage numbers because of the noise in the data. So you have to identify those and ignore those, take those away. What you're left with is a, a table, which you can then go through minute by, uh, for each 10 minute window, you can give it a score of how cl closely it matches a TID uh, in terms of amplitude uh, period and with a low, low covariance. And then you can assign a score uh, for each line, add those up and gives you an aggregate score for uh, that day. <clears throat> then you can go through and do that on a whole year's or five years worth of data and get a climatology. So if you remember from last year, I presented this results a couple of times. Um, we did climatology results, uh, climatology studies using the object detection method. That was the previous way. That was our first shot at doing this. And we got fairly good co uh, co um, correspondence with the manually derived climatology. Um, so you see the sort of uh, uh, peaks in the summer, uh, rather the, the, the winter peaks in the winter and a little bit of a peak in the summer. Um, the um, International Space Weather Action people will say that they believe that some of that is upwelling energy uh, coming from the troposphere and it shoots all the way up to produce TIDs. That's yet to be proven, but that's the speculation. All right, so this is last year's results. What about when we try and use the decision tree approach, the heuristics? Well, we get some good matching, but also we see some dramatic differences. Uh, over on the right is the LST IDs selected or shown by uh, the climatology shown by my decision, tr uh, decision tree and heuristic approach and comparison. You see some dramatic differences, particularly you don't see a big uh, spike in the winter time. You do see the spike in June. And so um, we do see that in spring and fall equinox, you got low numbers, just like the manually desired results. So we're, we're getting some progress, but why would there be the differences? Um, so let's think about that. Uh, some reasons we think that we may have differences is maybe that I haven't selected the heuristics chosen uh, op optimally. Maybe the window methoding is, isn't really right. Maybe it's thresholding. Uh, looking at our 3D model, you can see that you're going to get different results quite dramatically by the height of the height indicates a threshold because the height on this is quantity of spots. There's also some other um, things that you see in this model that you don't see in the 2D representation, a period of an enhancement of propagation, which uh, that's a, coin, a term coined by Nathaniel, a little um, oscillations in propagation that have yet to be explained. Um, and it, one thing I, it, that occurred to me why we don't see the, the uh, sh, um, strong uh, TID activity in the, in the wintertime using this new method is it could be that the characteristics of the LSTIDs could differ between winter and summer. Once again, that's just a speculation, has yet to be analyzed in detail and proven. So next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna try a thing called TensorFlow Yggdrasil. That Yggdrasil is an, that's a, an old Viking term uh, that relates to the tree of life. Uh, it's just a funky name they came up with. That's what TensorFlow calls their decision tree system. So we think we can take those tables I showed you a minute ago and train the system on a series of those and uh, tell the system which ones of these tables seem to correspond to actual LSTIDs, train it, and then turn it loose on novel data and see how good of a job it does and see if it can beat the heuristic approach. So that's a two-step process. You have to process it each window to see if it's got an LSTID signature. And then you just use a second step to decide if that day is, has, is an active LSTID day. And you also want to calculate the start and end time of LST because you, LSTID activity because you'd like to know how much activity there is, not whether activity yes or no, you'd like to know how many hours worth of activity. 
So in summary, we have a couple of different machine learning approaches for automated detection of LSTIDs. Uh, they both have their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, what we're working on now is to improve our decision tree system to see if it can perform comparably or hopefully better than the neural net approach that used the uh, object uh, detection. So that's my presentation. Thank you. No, no, we have a few minutes for questions. Sure. Yes, right there. I'm curious now with all the new AI that you think the marketplace like this, you know, the model. Have you thought about maybe just jumping on the bandwagon and training with somebody else, somebody else and just say, like, ask it? Well, it would be stated as a phrase, but it would a lot of the a lot of the stuff that I've seen that's been in the news lately has been text based, and so the data we're dealing with here, it's gigabytes of data that isn't text based. So a lot of it revolves around how do you prepare the data for one of those AI systems? Uh, it it's not going to know what to do with a a twenty gigabyte image. I mean that I think. That you know, maybe some may they may have some ways we can learn from them as to how to work with this data. Um, but I don't think the current systems that are in the news, like Chat GPT and Bing, are really designed to solve a different problem than what we're dealing with here. Anything else? Yeah, right there. Yeah, so I was just wondering, is there any difference in, in damping, you know, whether there is damping or what the damping rates are in different seedings? That is one of those things that we're going to try and analyze. Um, we we all only see that sometimes, and it's and it may be, I don't know if it's for real or if it's just some sort of a data processing artifacts. So that's you know you have because because propagation changes throughout the day, it could be fooling our system. So we're still pretty kind of early into this. This is, you know, it's it. A little small team working on this is tough to make progress, especially when you don't understand everything that's going on over here. Shabadi, yeah, we have a question about the uh, prediction you have done in the monitoring post study. So, have you tried using the convolution because they are more predominantly used for object detection in the images? Well, the when we use TensorFlow object detection. It uses a convolutional approach. That's how ten TensorFlow object detection does work that way. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, neural net approaches tend to work well with 2D data like images or 3D data in this case, but there's a color involved. Uh, and then we're, for working with tables like we're now de designing, um, decision trees, they say, uh, work better for that. Uh, so we'll see. Anyway, I'd encourage everybody to come take a look at these 3D models because it, it really is a cool representation of what the uh, propagation surface looks like on, on 20 meters. So I guess I'm done. Yes. I think I'm out yes. of time. No, that's so, perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Francis Dolly from the University of Sask or Saskatchewan, sorry, Scranton. Uh, and title is A New Web Interface to the Super Darn MSTID Analysis Toolkit. I'll give you a wait of five minutes to go. I'll be okay. Hey. Hi right, again, my name is Francis Dolly, and in today's presentation, I'll be uh, giving a talk about um, the new web interface uh, to the Super Darn MSCID Analysis Toolkit that we've been working on. Now, uh, what's the MSCID Analysis Toolkit? It's um, an application that um, uh, we use to analyze the characteristics of MSCID data. And next. Now, where do we get our data from? We get our data from the Super Darn uh, radar, uh, um, Super Darn uh, uh, network of high frequency uh, radars. Uh, this radars can be found both in the Northern Hemisphere and in the Southern Hemisphere as displayed uh, by uh, the image right there. Now, first off, what are TIDs? Uh, TIDs are quasi-periodic uh, variation of the um, F region in uh, the Earth's ionosphere. And uh, our study mainly focuses on uh, medium-scale travel and atmospheric disturbances. They have periods between um, 
uh, 15 to 60 minutes and um, speeds of up to between uh, 100 and 250 meters a uh, second and several hundred uh, kilometers in horizontal wavelength. And uh, previous studies have indicated that it's actually quite uh, difficult to um, determine uh, the actual source of MSTIDs. So our, our study uh, focuses on that, trying to use the um, music analysis, uh, MSCID uh, analysis toolkit to try to uh, determine that. Now, how does uh, the MSCID uh, data looks like? Uh, this is just uh, one, uh, uh, one uh, sampling uh, period of the data, uh, the black uh, black stone radar to be more specific. And uh, wherever you see uh, negative slopes, as indicated right there by the horizontal, uh, I mean by the uh, negative slope uh, lines, uh, as indicative of MSCIDs detected in this um, data set. This uh, sampling period only uh, looks at one beam. Each radar uh, field of view has uh, about uh, 16 to 22, I believe, uh, beams and range gates up to um, 110, I believe, range gates. This is just looking at beam 15 and uh, for the period between 12 UT to 24 uh, UT uh, uh, sampling period. Uh, now, what's the problem that our system tries to address? Again, as mentioned uh, prior, our system, uh, it's still ambiguous as to uh, what the true cause of MSCIDs um, are. Um, uh, based on previous studies, there have been uh, two suspected candidates, which are space weather and um, atmospheric uh, dynamics. There have been uh, prior implementations of the MSCID analysis toolkit. Um, uh, one of those implementations was uh, DAVAPI, but it has since uh, been deprecated. It was initially implemented in Python 2. So our new system hopes to uh, uh, re-implement all the functionalities provided by uh, the predecessor DAVAPI and also add uh, additional functionalities. And our system uses uh, mainly our uh, atmospheric research scientists, uh, atmospheric research students, and also US citizens, since our uh, research is funded by uh, NASA. Uh, now, what are the two main components of our system? Uh, mainly, are, uh, they are Python music and darn TID. Uh, the Python uh, music uh, is the new and improved uh, re-implementation of uh, the music algorithm. Uh, it replaces the data by uh, uh, the previous implementation. Uh, Python music is implemented in Python 3, and the darn TID um, is uh, an application that handles classifying uh, MSCIDs, uh, uses the Python music, the new implementation to classify uh, MSCIDs as either uh, MSCID active or MSCID quiet, um, and also none if there's no uh, MSCID signatures detected in the uh, uh, time range that uh, the user sets. Now, how does it work? Um, the Python music works by taking the uh, user's input, uh, first up the start date uh, and also the end date, and also the specified beam that the user is interested in. And it also takes in a couple hundred parameters. I just didn't have enough space to input all of them in here, but those are just the main uh, inputs that, the, uh, that are required uh, to run the music uh, analysis. And then uh, the data is then loaded and the uh, music object is created. Uh, by the uh, by the music application. From then, the user can plot a rain time plot and also a fan plot. Uh, the user can use the rain time plot to um, uh, for, uh, specify which region in the um, rain time plot, the plot that I showed you earlier, to focus the uh, analysis on. And uh, based off of that, they can uh, run the music uh, analysis within that region. And the fan plot uh, just displays uh, the radius field of view. And that shows the electron density uh, using the radius field of view. And from there, uh, the application um, uh, uses the limits that the user set uh, for the region of forecast. And it removes both the gap in time and space and uh, also uh, filters the music uh, data object. It then calculates the uh, fast Fourier, uh, Fourier transform for every cell within the range, uh, the radius field of view. And also plot the spectrum for the magnitude and phase and plot the full spectrum view. And uh, also it calculates uh, the cross spectral metrics uh, using the music data object. 
and plots the cross uh, spectral metrics as well as um, uh, calculate in the horizontal wave number, which is indicative of the uh, dominant MSCIDs detected within that region. It then plots the um, horizontal wave number. And uh, from the uh, plot, we can determine in what direction the MSCID is traveling. Now for the density IDs, again, um, the user can specify a start uh, date and end date for the list. And um, they can uh, input in a couple other parameters like how many processes they want to use in the plot and the analysis, as well as whether or not they want to run a, a MSCID classification or run the music um, algorithm or not. And a couple more parameters here. And from there, then uh, the darn TID application creates a list, which then uh, uh, the Python uh, music algorithm uses to um, uh, whether or not uh, the user specifies to run a classification or music uh, analysis or not. The uh, darn TID application would then uh, uh, run, uh, do that. And uh, the data is then saved in the Mongo uh, DB database. And this is just our system domain. Currently, we are using actually two uh, databases. Uh, the Mongo database is for handling uh, the MSCID uh, computed uh, data. And uh, the po uh, Postgres for uh, database that we're using uh, handles the user's uh, data. And this is just the current iterations that we've completed and uh, those that are on the way. Uh, I've already uh, mentioned them earlier. Uh, loading the data, uh, creating a music object, uh, viewing a music data object. I'm not gonna go through the whole list. And what's on the way right now is um, uh, we are still currently working on the web uh, interface. It's still under uh, progress. And this is just more uh, iterations for the part of music that have been completed. And uh, as of now, uh, this is how the homepage, uh, the app homepage looks like. There's not a whole lot currently because it's still under uh, works. And, and uh, this is the login page. After the user creates their account, they can come in here and log in. And this is the registration page. Uh, user can put in a, a username. Uh, the email has to be unique because that's how we identify unique uh, users. And uh, the user can specify which user type from the early mentioned user types. And also they can put in a password that they would like. And uh, this is the authenticated users on page. As of now, we don't have a whole lot of, uh, whole lot of tabs in here. We only have the MSCID uh, link classification. When the user clicks on that, uh, they get redirected to the MSCID classification page, which is this page. And uh, from here, as you can see, uh, the user can select uh, whichever radius they want to conduct the classification on. Uh, as uh, of now, the default is uh, just the Northern Hemisphere, but they can also select the Southern Hemisphere radius and select a couple other parameters here. Um, I have we have this implemented where and since uh, the and uh, our classification and analysis takes long uh, takes a lot of uh, resources. We have a background tax handler that handles any requests that um, are submit submitted in this uh, uh, web page. So when the user uh, clicks in uh, run classification, that gets uh, sent into uh, the into the background tax handler, which handles uh, that. And once the classification has been completed, uh, the user would then receive an email that the system will send to them. There's still a bug in there where in uh, um, a sense in uh, a sense uh, email when the classification starts and uh, when the classification ends, but we are only interested when the classification ends. So I'm still trying to, uh, we're still trying, trying to figure out uh, uh, how to fix that bug where it only sends the email after the classification have been completed. And uh, this is just a, uh, um, a manual page when uh, uh, the user get redirected to this page once the classification has been completed. Uh, from here, the drop down menu, the user can select uh, which um, classified uh, period that they are interested in and load that right here. And the user can uh, then uh, plot the range time plot manually. And they can compare uh, with, um, uh, this is the automated, um, Detection for the classification. If the user thinks that it's there's no MSCID signatures here, they can manually update it right here by clicking on the update uh, category. 
And the next page is the music page. From here, the user can create a music object and run the music uh, analysis. As of now, um, we don't have this implemented where in the background uh, tax handler handles this because I'm still working on uh, the previous page, the classification page. So I don't have the background tax handler uh, handling this uh, web page currently, but it still uh, works when you click on create music object and also run the music uh, process analysis. And uh, that's pretty much it. Questions? Yeah. Pardon me, but what does music refer to? Uh, multiple classification uh, analysis. Multiple? No, no, but multiple signal classification. <laughs> My ear something completely different. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Go ahead. Oh, please, from the microphone. We have some feedback from the uh, people on Zoom saying they wanted us to pass the microphone around. So, thanks. Um, apologies, you already said this, but the music algorithm has a lot of applications. Is there how much of your implementation is like you use any existing libraries? How much of it is custom? <laughs> How much of it is custom to only super darn data? Um, or, or do you use the existing implementation? And then I guess a second question is what is the general enough that it could be used for other applications what you wrote? Uh, yeah, as general enough, it could be used. Actually, uh, Dr. Purcells, I believe, uses it for other applications as well. And uh, we uh, implemented it using the previous uh, um, implementation. So there's like pretty much set. Um, so I, I'll take this one. Um, so I, this particular algorithm really is tuned to the super darn radars, looking at uh, traveling asteroid disturbances moving through the super darn field of view. So music is a very general algorithm. It's widely used throughout um, engineering. And it's what you use it for is for detecting which multiple waves moving through an array of sensors and knowing which way those signals are going. Um, the, it was, I believe, Risto, Bill Risto, 1994, um, John Sampson, they had originally implemented it for Superdome looking at traveling asteroid disturbances. And then when I was in graduate school, I read their paper and I re-implemented it using Python. So this is based on their description of the music algorithm. And then I passed my code over to Francis and Francis took my implementation and that's what he's using now. I think quick question. Um, for ingesting it, you you were showing super darn range time plots. Is that the main input, or is that no? The main input is actually the, uh, the data. Oh, the okay. ACF. So it's actually yeah. just taking the yeah, it's taking the uh, ACF file and uh, creating those plots. Okay. okay, great. Yeah, and when you when it takes in that data, it doesn't just use a single RTP plot. It's using data from an array of ranges and gates. So right. it's a two-dimensional right. And it's a three-dimensional because we have some time there. Yeah. Any final questions? Okay. Let's thank our speaker. Okay. Oh I'll just introduce you. Okay. So uh I'm you're gonna know I'll take over. Because I'm a special now. Oh, okay. Not a good one, but I okay. I'll let you do it. All right. Go ahead. So, um, yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm glad we have a couple extra minutes here, but just before my talk is supposed to begin, uh, because I do need to make an announcement. Um, I we received an email this morning that, unfortunately, our very good friend and collaborator in Hamside, uh, Jules Mady, I uh, take. K2, um, KGJ, became a silent key this past Sunday. So um, Jules is a really amazing person. And um, I feel very, very fortunate to have gotten to meet him, if only over Zoom, and to have him contribute so much to our project. These magnetometers that we are developing and selling probably would not be the way they are without him today. And would you agree with that? People, yeah. So um, Jules 
so the way I first met Jules was I was we were running this project and one day Jules just showed up on the uh, ham side listserv asking a bunch of questions I'd never heard of him before. I'm like, where did this guy come from? And when we found out a little bit more about him, it, it turned out that he was actually quite famous. So um, Jules, uh, he he's famous for a number of reasons, but perhaps the one I'm most uh, fond of is the fact that in uh, 1957 and 1958, that time during the International Geophysical Year, which Bob Reif will talk more about tomorrow, he and his brother John were teenagers in Clark, New Jersey, and they ran phone patches for the people who are working in Antarctica and allowing the people in Antarctica to talk home to their families um, and have that communication. This is before the time of satellite communication. So this is a really important service. Their contributions were recognized um, so greatly that the uh, federal government, they officially named a ridge down in Antarctica, the Mady Ridge after Jules. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, so this is the type of person that came to our project and has been working with us just alongside us, um, you know, every day. And and then um, even you know, a couple of weeks ago when Bob Wright said he was going to talk about his experiences with the International Geophysical Year, I started looking up um, some results, past results from the International Geophysical Year, and I came across a paper that was just published this year. Uh, by uh, Dr. Veronica Deladoro. She's a professor at Royal Holloway um, at, in London, UK. And she wrote this big, she just published this large chapter and book on the International Geophysical Year and amateur radio contributions to that. And she had given an interview, I, I emailed her and she sent me back that she'd given an interview about you know, why she did it. And she said one of the reasons she did it was because she was going through old National Geographic magazines and she said, I was particularly inspired by the story I found about these two young teenagers in New Jersey who ran phone patches to Antarctica. I, I emailed her back. I'm like, that's amazing. I'm like, I'm friends with one of them. <laughs> and, you know, I, I thought that was just really, really touching. And um, Jules, Jules is also famous for something else that many of you will Remember, as you come, as you came to this conference, and as you leave this conference to go home, if you're driving, he invented Easy Pass. <laughs> so I, I think, um, you know, he he was diagnosed with melanoma just a couple weeks ago, and he said to give his regards to everyone. And I know a few of us we had tried to um, send, you know, cheer him up by sending QSL cards to him. So we all sent, you know, sent QSL cards to him. And I, I believe his. Um, uh, nephew Andrew is listening right now. Um, so I'd just like to take a, I'd like to do two things. First thing I'd like to do is I'd like to dedicate this conference to Jules Mady. And um, and we remember his work and we're going to, of course, keep going on with the conference because that's what he would want us to do. But we're going to dedicate all of what we're doing here to Jules Mady and his memory and the good things that he's done. And um, I'd like to take a moment of silence and uh, to remember him, pray for them. So thank you, and thank you to the Meany family and uh, to all of you who have been friends to Jules and uh, to each other here. Thank you. Would anyone like to say anything before we go on? Well, I will uh, go on with the last talk before lunch, which is always the most difficult talk in the conference. <laughs> okay, well, Microsoft is here. You open the trust center. Are we even looking at the right screen here? All right. You're looking at the right screen. I'm going to enable content.
yes, I do want to make this a trusted document is the document I created using my own Microsoft OneDrive account that I have to duo authenticate onto. Like, yes. All right. <laughs> I don't know. I think I have to duplicate this screen here too so the Zoom people hopefully see the right thing. And I'll try to get rid of this blinking thing after lunch. I, I read how to do it. I think I can get rid of it later. Anyway, let's move along for now. Um, I, I think that this previous session, we saw a lot of great results coming from my collaborators and my students looking at traveling atmospheric disturbances. And as you've seen, it is not easy counting cycles in a wave and you know, knowing where they're going in space and all of that sort of stuff. And um, it, it's complicated, but I, I think they did a really nice job. And so um, I'm gonna talk about the work that I'm doing in that same vein. And that I'm also um, doing with uh, all of these collaborators that you can see here on the screen. So this includes the project that uh, Francis just gave. So a lot of his work enabled me to bring my code for my PhD back up. Um, after Python 2 got deprecated and a few other things got deprecated. So he helped me get that back up so I could get these results today. Um, we have our team, uh, Lynn Harvey, Sophie Phillips, Katrina Bazer, uh, Sebag, Larissa, Rich Collins uh, from the NASA project that we're on. Um, Dr. Mary Lou West, wave Dr. West. Yeah, that lady right over there, she's a, a saint. So... <laughs> <laughs> make sure make sure you say nice things to her and uh diego for doing all the painstaking work with dr west and uh gareth and um bob gerzoff and phil erickson and uh bill and his team and uh and my phd advisors uh mike Rahani and joe baker okay so Okay, what are we after? Uh, what is the connection between the lower neutral atmosphere and the ionosphere? This is a really big question, and one of our uh, people in the audience actually alluded to that earlier, you know, asking how is it connected to these other structures. We are very much interested in that particular question. As you know, as amateur radio operators, if you go take your license exam right now, you have to read about, learn about how the ionosphere affects radio propagation and you learn what affects the ionosphere. And mostly what it says, it's the sun and solar flares and maybe geomagnetic storms. They talk about KP a little bit, and then that's about it. They really don't say a whole lot about how the neutral atmosphere and what's going on underneath might affect, say, HF radio propagation. But we're learning that it does. So one of the ways we look at this is these things called traveling ionospheric disturbances. And so they are you know, quasi-periodic regions of the region electron density, uh, variations of the of region electron density, which you heard about in the last couple of talks. And they're generally broken up into two different categories historically. We have medium scale traveling ionospheric disturbances and large scale ones. The medium scale ones have periods between about 15 to 60 minutes. The large scale ones have periods um, up to about three hours and much larger wavelengths, greater than a thousand kilometers. Um, usually, we, both of these can be associated with atmospheric gravity waves. So a lot of people ask, well, what's a gravity wave? It's any sort of wave where gravity is a restoring force. So uh, if you look, go to the ocean, you see the waves there. Those are gravity waves because there's something pushing the uh, water up and then the gravity is pulling it down and buoyancy pushes it back up. You can have the same thing happen in the air. You get a parcel of air where it, it gets pushed up for some reason and then gravity pulls it back down and buoyancy pushes it back up and it oscillates. Um, so both of these can be associated with atmospheric gravity waves, um, but they can also, the question is what's generating those atmospheric gravity waves off, often? Is it things happening in the lower atmosphere that's sharing the waves? Or is it say like um, auroral precipitation or currents in the high latitude ionosphere that are causing heating that are generating those waves? And so that's what we're trying to figure out. So to connect this back to ham radio again, uh, Diego showed this figure from a paper that we published uh, earlier last year, and this is ham radio RBM PSK reporter and spot data, and you can see the nice wave that Diego and Bill just showed right there. This is a large scale wave. Down here is the uh, super darn observations. We'll talk more about super darn in a minute, but you can see the same wave there. But on top of that, you can also see, you see this smaller scale variation there? 
Yeah, those are the medium scale waves. So the large scale waves is this big structure. The medium scale waves are little ones running on top. And I'm sure they're affecting our ham radio signals as well, but you can't really see it in the RBN PSK reporter data just because the data is so noisy. You can probably see it in the grape data and some of the like PSWS data. Um, but it's for this talk, it's the smaller stuff that we're interested in. Um, so I'm going to be using uh, data from this thing called the Super Dual Overall Radar Network, which is uh, what I used in my PhD dissertation. And uh, for all of you radio transmitter people out there, uh, this is a coherent scatter radar operates between 8 to 20 megahertz, has a 16 antenna linear phased array, and it does 200, 800 watts per channel and sends out multi-pulse sequence. So this is a, a nice picture of the one in Blackstone, Virginia. Um, you can see it's 750 feet long antenna array and sending most of the energy that way. There's this curtain reflector that you can't see right there. Um, so the way that the, the super darns and ham radios would detect traveling atmospheric disturbances is if you have a TAD moving in the ionosphere overhead, you'll see these ripples like this horizontally. You'll see a vertical profile like that. And it will cause the radio signals to focus and defocus as the wave moves overhead. And that focusing bunches these rays together. This is at like 14 megahertz. And wherever the rays are bunched together, you get high signal to noise ratio. And wherever they're defocused, you get low signal to noise ratio. And so that's where, or, or equivalently, you get the um, range that you see moving in and out as the TID moves overhead. So, um, and then here's the signature. We can plot the data like that. So you can just see in a nice plot that way. So we can do that. And um, I also want to point out the, di the distance between the lower atmosphere and the upper atmosphere. So the ionosphere is up at, say, the F2 region between 200, around 220 kilometers, 250 kilometers altitude. And we're going to be very interested in what's going on in the troposphere, the stratosphere, and the mesosphere. The mesosphere goes up to 85 kilometers altitude. Uh, this is the neutral atmosphere over here. That's almost 200 kilometers below what's happening in the F2 region peak. So we're trying to relate things that are going on down here, 200 kilometers away from what's going on up here. That's a long distance. There's a lot of physics that can happen between the two, so it's complicated. Um, now, back in 2016, for my PhD thesis, I developed a system to use the super darn radars to look at these traveling atmospheric disturbances in an automated fashion. And I all this data up here corresponds with the data all across North America for the year from November 2012 to May 2013. And the red means more traveling atmospheric disturbances, the blue means less. And what I got out of this is two big things. One is we saw the seasonal trend, more rents in the fall and winter, uh, less TIDs in the spring. And then, um, so there's a seasonal trend. And then we saw this period where you have these aperiodic, so not regular, just multi-week depletions in traveling atmospheric disturbances. Here's like for a week at a time. And in my PhD, I figured out that these seem to be correlated with the polar vortex. Um, so what is the polar vortex? It's this wind structure that sets up in a cyclonic pattern going this way uh, around the Arctic regions, and it generally traps all the cold air up there. It sets up in the winter. So when the polar vortex was strong, I'd see more TIDs. When the polar vortex was uh, weak, um, I'd see less TIDs. So that was actually a, a big finding for my PhD. Um, and that prompted you know, a lot of the work that I'm doing today because we got that far, but now we, we never really filled in the dots as to what's happening in between and all the details. So that's what we're trying to do now. Um, this is a slide from Lynn Harvey showing what the polar vortex looked like just a few days ago. You know, we had a nor'easter come in, so you might suspect the polar vortex is broken up. And so uh, sure enough, she sent me this figure from earth.lschool.net, and you can see that there's no real coherent vortex here. There's like two smaller structures. So it's a very weak vortex right now. And uh, this is about at about 50 kilometers altitude. The other, but the other thing she sent me is this figure over here. This is a three-dimensional uh, picture of the polar vortex. And you can see that it, you know, it's 
the structure changes significantly with altitude. So looking at it just in this one at one level doesn't give you the full picture. And that's one of the things I think that's creating so much trouble in trying to really understand these correlations and you know track all this stuff down. Um, I've also been giving a little advertisement. If you go onto YouTube and uh, search for Lynn Harvey and polar vortex, you get a great video of her giving a lecture on what the polar vortex actually is and all the physics behind it. Um, so she sent me this. So we're what we're going to do is we're going to try to look at a polar vortex um, traveling atmospheric disturbance relationship again. But we're going to start by looking at just for the year 2018 to 2019, because during this time, there is an event called a sudden stratospheric warming. When you have a sudden stratospheric warming, um, the stratosphere warms, so other parts of the atmosphere actually cool, but the polar vortex actually breaks down and the winds stop going from an eastward direction to a, they can often reverse and go to a westward direction. And so we have this movie that she sent in the 2000, December 1st, 2018 through January 31st, 2019 right here. So you can see the, the polar vortex moving and you'll eventually see a break in, uh, break into like two there. So now you have the sudden stratospheric warming. And then it'll eventually come back together. Like that. Isn't that nice? Now, the other thing that's really neat about this figure that she sent is you see all the color stuff here? So those are measurements from a satellite instrument called AIRS. And what AIRS is measuring is gravity wave variance. So it's actually measuring not traveling atmospheric disturbances, but gravity waves in the say like 40 kilometer altitude region. So we have a way of actually visualizing where these say middle atmospheric gravity wave hot spots are with time. So we're hoping that connecting that data together will help us fill out the picture. So, um, or I also reran my code, thanks to Francis's help bringing my code back up. Um, I reran it for the 2018-2019 Northern Hemisphere winter. This again shows all the superdar data from all of these radars um, from November to May from 2018 to 2019. And once again, so here the reds mean more uh, traveling atmospheric disturbances, blue means less. Can you see the sudden stratospheric warming or the, I should say, here, we're, this is showing the lack of traveling atmospheric disturbances right there. It's lasting for a good couple of weeks. So we're going to try to relate all of this together. Um, and so one thing we can do is I can take snapshots of the movie she just sent us. And so sure enough, you can see here where there's lots of TIDs, nice strong uh, polar vortex structure. That's good. Then over here, um, when we see the depletion, we see that the, it break down. And so that's good too, that matches. It stays broken down over here. And that's, um, but over, but you see, even though it's still broken down over here, we actually get the TID starting to come back. So that's a little inconsistent with the picture up there. So this is something we have to figure out. Finally, over, over at this point, does it return to the full uh, polar vortex cyclones? going this way. Yeah. So there's a little bit of a mystery here. So this doesn't fully hold up. It, it's, I think it's leading us in a good direction, but there's definitely details that we need to figure out here. Um, some other ways you can look at the data. Uh, this, uh, the colors you see in the background here are wind direction as a function of altitude and time. This wind direction comes from an empirical model called Mera 2. Um, and the most of the colors, the greens and the reds, mean eastward winds. So this is strong. This is polar vortex here. That's polar vortex there. Um, you can see that. And then over here, you have the sudden stratospheric warming. You can see, depending on what altitude you make your cut, you get a different answer as to whether there's a strong polar vortex or not. Traditionally, it's defined at 30 kilometers altitude, but we're thinking it may be better to define it at 50 kilometers altitude for our particular project. Also, the black line here shows the uh, gravity waves um, from that AIRS data. It gives an index of that. And then there's another um, instrument called SIPS, which gives you gravity waves at 50 kilometers altitude. That's in pink. So you can see the polar vortex is nice and strong. The gravity waves are ramping up. Polar vortex breaks up. Gravity waves drop. And then the gravity waves come back as the polar vortex returns. So that's a really nice picture. Um, 
This is also a picture from this AIRS data from uh, Sophie Phillips and Katrina Bazer. This is showing you before and after the sun stratosphere warming. Here you can actually see all the nice gravity waves in the polar regions in the northern hemisphere up here. And then after the sun stratosphere warming, you can see they have gone away. So that's very nice. And then this is from uh, Sarabag and Larissa up at the MIT Haystack Observatory. This is looking at uh, traveling atmospheric disturbances using GPS TEC. So again, you can use GPS to not just tell you where you are, but you can use them to measure um, how, many ion, how many electrons are in the atmosphere between you and the ground. So here you can see a bunch of um, gravity wave activity or traveling atmospheric disturbance activity. It goes away for a period and then comes back. So if we try to stack everything together, you can see that there's actually fairly good agreement. You get the drop off, you get a whole bunch of gravity wave and TID stuff happening over here. And then you get this drop off over there. You get a corresponding drop off over here in, um, in the GPS TEC. You start to see some depletion in super darn. And then over here, you see a real depletion in the TEC and that matches uh, super darn here. So that's really good. And that's still consistent over here. Um, I think what's tricky is it seems like there's a little bit of a delay between what's between the start here and when you actually see the response up here. So that's one of the things we're trying to figure out. Um, back to uh, back to what uh, Mary Lou and Diego were doing. Uh, Mary Lou went through uh, the data and she found out that the LSTIDs showed a similar pattern of depletions around that time, except for this little anomalous part, which we might be able to explain what we're working on. Um, but it, it did show some sort of uh, similar depletion there in the LSTID signatures matching our MSTID depletions. So um, I think it's also worth noting that there are modelers out there, people who aren't, aren't just looking at the data, but are really looking at the physics equations and trying to run them in computers. And so one group is um, Eric Becker and Sharon Vada et al. And they published a paper in 2022, and they were actually able to create uh, calculations of gravity wave fluxes as all the way up to 300 kilometers altitude. So most of the measurements don't, that we have don't actually go up that high. So this shows all that coupling. And they tell us a couple of things. First of all, you know, if you see a gravity wave down here, it doesn't simply just propagate up to the upper um, altitudes. What happens is it goes up, it breaks, new gravity waves are created with a different spectrum. There's this multi-step system going up. Uh, but their model, so it's com again complicated, but their model for the 2016-2017 year uh, matches my super darn observations very nicely. So you can see you get a little bit of a depletion up here at 300 kilometers, 250, 300 kilometers altitude here. It matches really well with their, with these depletions match very, very well. Even over here, you can see more intense, more intense, a little bit of a drop, a little bit of a drop, more intense, more intense, a little bit of a drop, a little bit of a drop. So that's really good. Now, um, I should say, uh, one of the things about ham size, you get people who come up to you and say, hey, I have this particular skill, can I help? And so one of those people uh, was Bob Gerzoff, WK2Y. He came to me back when I was working at NJIT and said, hey, I'm a, a public health statistician, can I help? And, and so it took a while to figure out how to actually, you know, really have him do stuff, but we figured out that we can really have him look at the statistics on these um, numbers. And so that's what he's doing. And um, what we're learning, so he's told me a few things. Um, he's told me that our observation so far, the correlation counts for about 12% of the variability that we're seeing the way he's doing the statistics. That's, that's a good positive correlation. So it does show that these things are related, but also show that shows there's a lot more that's unexplained. Um, so that's something that we're trying to figure out. Um, Bob is also helping to keep us honest in regard to like a lot of these little details, because, you know, I do a lot of this data visualization, see things by eye, and he's doing a lot of, you know, looking at the statistics. So I'm um, working closely with him to try to uh, really make sure our analysis is as uh, good as possible and to try and find out maybe some of these additional effects in addition to you know the polar vortex or to better identify like what altitude things are happening happening at or what the real drivers are. Um, but the last slide I'll leave you with here is oops 
that last slide, the Zoom thing is. Um, I took, we ran, I'm going to show it to you. I, I was going to cut it from the thing. This, <laughs> this is 12 years of observations of Super Darn, which we um, ran on our servers here at Scranton. And um, we're able to look at these uh, seasonal and trends and these individual episodic trends for 12 years. And we're able to correlate it with uh, the polar vortex index that I came up with in my 2016 paper. And when you run that correlation for all of those years, you get a plot that looks like this. And so you do get a uh, positive correlation. Um, it does show this uh, lag that I was talking about that's consistent with my earlier paper. Um, so I, I think we're going in the right direction. And I'm really excited to see us figure out the rest of these details as I continue to work with my other collaborators. So thank you. Questions? You mentioned gravity waves, and then, and in this context, does that imply uh, uh, variations in mass? Um, no, the it does not imply variations in mass. Well, and then my question is, what is, uh, is can you go further and describe what it is? So uh, I should say that don't confuse gravity wave with a gravitational wave from astronomy. Don't confuse those two things. So maybe that's all as much as I need to go into detail right now. Just imagine a parcel of air, you move it up, gravity pulls that parcel down, and the buoyancy pushes it back up again. And it goes like this. Yeah. Uh, this is Daniel. Uh, we got a quick look at the radar in the, where you had done the 12 or the 20 years. Right. It looks like things got really sparse from last year or this year. Oh, yeah. Well, Yes. Or, um, there, there could be a couple of things. Uh, one thing, you know, a lot of the sparsity starts to happen around March 2020. <laughs> 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 but no, no, like, so, um, so COVID hit, right? So, so one problem is COVID hit and, you know, then some of the radars ended up not being able to be maintained because you couldn't actually send people up to Canada to go fix them. So, so that's one, one problem with sparsity. The, um, I think the solar cycle is something else to consider though. You know, uh, we haven't really taken the solar cycle into account here and the technique that we're using does look at, uh, it does depend on getting what we call ground scatter. And the that grounds maybe we just don't get as much ground scatter as we go into higher levels of um, of geomag higher levels of uh, what do you call it? sun solar activity. Thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah. So so that is something to consider also. Yeah. Hi. Very nice work. Um, Thank just you. a comment on you know, our recent work with Sharon Lawrence. We also found good correlation between TAD not TID. Um, traveling and spread experiences in the satellite um, measurement with the uh, polar box. Great. Yes. I, yes, we, we need to do that. And I, I know I, I spoke with Sharon quite a bit at HU this past December and, and with Erich as well. And we'd like to keep trying to collaborate. Right. Yeah. Okay, last one, and then it's lunchtime. You can talk to me at lunch. <laughs> um, hi, Hi. Hey, Bob. Um, but, but has anybody thought of, you know, the ionosphere has two depths. Mm -hmm. We only use one. But, but is there a corresponding, do we have any feeling where there's a corresponding way in the upper side? So Gareth, you're, you're a little more of a top side person than I am, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know how to answer that question. Yeah. I mean, we have seen observations of, uh, of, of top side, what we call top side disturbances uh, that are correlated with bottom side disturbances. 
Um, and by we, I mean me and have, I mean, one observation here in 2017. Is like, so, yeah. <laughs> The physics of it and the uh, specific circumstances, I'm not familiar yeah. with, they're at least comfortable way I could. So. Well, yeah. I'm just thinking, you know, there's stimulus from the bottom. Yeah. 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 Just there's inputs, there's energetic inputs from the top as well. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's an excellent question and something that uh, we should look at more. Yes. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. One more from Joe. I've got to take Joe's question. Joe is our uh, invited speaker tomorrow, and he's a uh, he's a real fast um, We're going to work in Texas using P and S and P satellite data at 800 kilometers, and they're also looking for P and P lights uh, relations and things like that at the upper uh, atmosphere. What's going on? All right, we'll get one from Jason too, and then I promise I'll show. Thank you, work. Jason, you just finished your PhD too, right? Uh, no, so I've been on a postdoc for a few years. A few years, okay. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Darren. Oh, just got the amateur radio light. Oh, thank you. So, the question is about the climate change and whether it's going to modify the solar vortex, I think, is going to modify the latitudinal distribution of. Gravity waves and the ideas. Well, if if in fact the polar vortex is the thing that's driving this, which we think it is, it we should be able to see some sort of signature like that. Okay, cool. Very some in something we can look for. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Um, lunch is served upstairs, so just go out here. Uh, you can go right up. Uh, there will be a lunch buffet. Uh, be back here, you know, uh, in time for the one thirty talk. Zoom people have a good lunch as well. We're going to leave the Zoom running, um, but uh, you know, feel free to chat as you wish. Thank you. All right, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started again here. I know people, uh, poor Garrett only has a few people in the room since everyone stole lunch, but I do have 66 people on Zoom right now. Oh, perfect. So you actually have a bigger audience than uh, you might think. And I'll keep chatting here for a minute to maybe encourage more people from outside to come in here and listen to uh, Garrett. I said that the uh, talk right before lunch was divorce, that it might be the talk. I, I don't think that. We know the time slot. I don't know. Yeah, because it's supposed to be The other thing I just found out um, John has brought, John Gibbons has brought a uh, Built and tested. A built and tested grape version 1.12, and we're going to raffle it off as a door prize. Oh boy, yeah, door prize tonight at the um, at the banquet. Door prize for the highest bidder. <laughs> Donations to ham side. All right, let's try this again. We're going to duplicate the screen. There, how about that? Good. Okay, we're starting to get a couple more people in here, too. We'll give them another minute. Well, here, what I'll do is I'll introduce uh, Gareth, and then if you want to chat for a minute before people try and get more people in. So, um, this next session is all about the upcoming 2023 and 2024 eclipses. And this is a huge deal for us because the eclipses really represent a controlled ionospheric physics experiment, which I'm sure you'll probably talk about a little bit. Yep. Yes. So uh, Dr. Perry will be talking about this. And um, it's so big that NASA has created this event called the Heliophysics Big Year because there are these two eclipses and we're on the rise of the solar cycle. And we've really got, we've really benefited from this. Um, so, you know, NASA has really um, focused on citizen science for this. We got named a, a NASA citizen science project. Uh, we also, NASA has also sent not only their uh, program uh, project scientist here, but we also have a, a NASA videographer uh, running around here, Joy Eng. Uh, she is working on a video project about HamSci and the heliophysics figure. So it, it's really neat stuff. 
So uh, the neat thing about the eclipses is that they're going right over the United States, and we are going to have a chance to participate as a whole nation. And Canadians too, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Canadian, yeah. Canadians too. It's the same sun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I think when I first met Gareth, he was at the University of Scranton. I mean, Saskatchewan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's like uh, <laughs> so here's Dr. Gareth Perry. Yeah. Should I use the mic or the is the, the mic? Use the hand mic. Hand yeah. mic. Okay. All right, so thank you. Uh, let's get started. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, thanks everybody for coming back from your delicious, delicious lunches. Uh, yes, I'm Gareth Perry from the uh, New Jersey Institute of Technology. And um, Nathaniel asked me to give a, uh, a talk just on a few science questions that uh, Hems I can help with, uh, help addressing, uh, and Hems in general for the uh, 2023 and 2024 eclipses. I'd like to acknowledge my co authors there, um, Nathaniel, of course, and then Joe Huba, who's well, he's not here yet. Well, he's probably still eating lunch, but uh, he's uh, third yeah. author. Then. Okay, let's get started. All right, great. Just a quick outline. I'm just going to give a brief overview, very brief overview, of what occurs in the ionosphere thermosphere system during the eclipse. What I mean, ionosphere thermosphere, that's the, the system of the plasma that is the ionosphere. Oh, is there something? Yeah, I think we got to do this. Oh, mm -hmm. spoilers. Though. And the, uh, the thermosphere, that's the neutral component of the uh, ionosphere thermosphere system. Um, and I mean, there are many, many, many science questions one can dig up or, or, or address during an eclipse. I mean, eclipses are very unique events, um, and they present a really unique time, an interesting time to study this coupled ionosphere thermosphere system. Here are three questions uh, that myself and the co authors are interested in. I'm going to talk about two of them, the ones that are bolded there. So the first one is, there's an asymmetry observed in the recovery of the bottom side ionosphere. And when we mean by bottom side, that's the portion of the ionosphere that is below the F peak, right? So um, 250, 300 kilometers below. Um, when uh, there's an asymmetry in the recovery, so you see a change, of course, in the ionosphere when there's an eclipse, and then a recovery, but it's not a symmetric um, uh, depletion and, and, and recovery. Um, so how does that vary or what is the difference between that for a total eclipse, which you're going to see in 2024, and an annual, annual eclipse, which you're going to see before that in 2023. Uh, second one is how accurate are our model predictions of the bottom side ionosphere during the eclipse. So again, for modelers, the eclipse is a really nice time to actually try and predict what's going to happen. And then, of course, as being scientists, we go and measure it and check our predictions and get the old scientific method going. The third question, which I'm not going to address today, I don't have Time, but uh, how do gray line propagation conditions compare during an eclipse um, between the annual and solar eclipse and then ones that we see during dawn dusk every day? So, unfortunately, I don't have time for that. And of course, I'm going to talk about how hams and hams I can help address these questions, be a big part of that science. So, here's what we got to look forward to in 23, right? We have this nice October 14, 23, we have this nice annual eclipse going to start, you can barely see it here, just uh, the Pacific Northwest. Uh, or where I grew up, we call that down south. Um, and it's going to go in a southeasterly direction here. Um, and then uh, in 24 here, yeah, April 8th, 24, uh, we're going to have a totality. So total uh, solar eclipse going to start down here in, in, in Mexico, what we call down south, and then going to go up northeast and cross over uh, uh, eastern maritimes of Canada. So we got those two things to look forward to. I don't know about you, but I'm extremely excited especially for us on the East Coast, where we are right now in the East, uh, we're only at probably a few hours drive from seeing totality. So if you haven't booked hotels or made a trip planned, please do so. I really highly encourage it. Okay. So what happens during the eclipse? There's several things that happen during the eclipse. Most obvious is, you know, moon covers the sun, uh, but that has an effect on the ionosphere, the plasma density, right? Uh, because the sun is effectively obscured. Um, some, not completely during annular or partial eclipses, but totality almost entirely obscured. Um, and because of that, we, we see a decrease in the plasma density of the ionosphere, right? So the plasma production caused by the sun is, is cut off. And so the plasma begins to recombine and deplete. There's actually a lot of transport effects that happen as well. So we see this giant metamorphosis happening. That's the charge 
plasma gas side, we have the thermosphere, right, which is the neutral particles. It cools because, again, you're covering up the sun, things start to cool down. Uh, the umbra and the penumbra, you have that cooling effect. Um, neutral winds start to kick up because you have this giant cooling spot uh, in the middle of the day. So the winds kind of shift to kind of uh, in response to this giant cooling uh, area. Um, and then also, so those combined with the plasma depleting actually set up quite a complex set of dynamics. We actually don't quite understand what we see and we're trying to unravel. And of course, it's really hard as physicists trying to unravel this because you have to generally wait for another eclipse to actually get it to go or get it to measure it. So uh, th that, those are some of the salient points what happens during eclipse. Um, we also see, of course, these effects during the day and night transition when we go to night, right? Sun goes away, plasma depletes, cooling effects, you get some winds kicking up. But of course, during the eclipse, it happens much quicker, right? It's happening very quick. So it's analogous. Some people like to say, describe it as we're studying an impulse response of the coupled ionosphere thermosphere system when we study an eclipse. All right. So just some uh, considerations about obscuration uh, during an eclipse and, and altitude considerations, which also have an effect. So this is from Joe Huba's paper, uh, Joe, uh, Huba and Drob, um, showing modeling. They were modeling, they, uh, they put out a prediction of what we should see in the 2017 eclipse before the 2017 eclipse happened, which is really cool. And then we all went and tested it. and. Uh, wrote a lot of people wrote a lot of papers and it was really really great scientifically so here uh is a kind of a plot of the obscuration uh factor during the eclipse you see it doesn't quite act so here's the eclipse the moon going over the sun so on and so forth uh, for totality but you see that actually it doesn't quite go down straight to zero there's still a little bit left here that's of course you know you do not cover up completely and also there's effects from the corona and stuff so you do still get a bit of this uh uv flux on the uh, uh, producing some plasma, but for the most part, you do shut off the sun for during an eclipse, albeit very, very, very briefly. Altitude considerations as well. Um, there's this paper by uh, Verlus and Stankoff, I guess, uh, 2020, who, who kind of pointed out that a lot of times when uh, in a lot of papers we show, you know, the totality path of the eclipse for 2017. And yeah, that's the totality path at the surface of the Earth. Uh, but we're three dimensional, right? We have altitude considerations, and the umbra um, isn't necessarily at that point higher up, right? And higher up is important because that's where the IT, the ionosphere starts and the thermosphere starts. So here's a plot uh, of the path of the 2017 eclipse, and you can see different color traces for different altitudes of where the umbra or the central totality is. So those are important things to consider up. And it, and it does make a, an important uh, uh, detail when you're trying to interpret some of the results. Okay, so what does it actually look like? This is some observations from 2017. You see the white circle, that's totality, the dashed circle, that's 75% obscuration. What you're looking at is a, uh, a TEC, total electron content map that's kind of been detrended and filtered such that you can just see little perturbations in uh, above the background. So of course, I'll replay this. You see this giant blue is uh, a, a negative delta TEC, so it's a giant depletion. And then the yellow is more uh, an increase in TEC. And so, of course, you see as the totality goes across, going southeast, you see this giant depletion in TEC, which is what we expect to see, of course, during the eclipse. Again, the plasma recombines. What you'll also see is a whole lot of waves, right, and a whole lot of jigglies. Those are, those are there, right? Um, I was part of a paper where we took uh, an occultation with GNSS, and we saw the same spectra of waves that we see with the TEC. So those are two independent measurements. So those are there. Uh, and there's been a lot of work done on trying to figure out what was the actual cause of those things and, and sort out those details. So it's an extremely dynamic uh, event. So let's talk about that first question, the, uh, the recovery of the bottom side ionosphere. So on the left is a, a model prediction of the peak plasma density. Um, Oh, sorry, that's the plasma density at an altitude, sorry, 306 kilometers. This is from Hugo and Rob. The black trace you see here is the electron density uh, without an eclipse. So this has been modeled. And then the red trace is during the eclipse. And so you see the depletion happening during the eclipse. Uh, and then you see the recovery. So you can just look, even by eye, see that this is what we call an asymmetric recovery in this kind of parameter, in this measurement 
a plasma density, the slope is quite steep, but it doesn't quite get back up to where it is. And the slope for recovery of that plasma density is quite, uh, quite uh, shallower, much more shallower than, than uh, the depletion when we have the onset of the eclipse. This green line measures or marks when we had maximum obscuration during the eclipse. We see the same trend in total electron content. So that total electron content is an integrated measurement. So it kind of, you integrate along a column or a vertical altitude profile and you pull up all the, uh, the, the, the uh, integrated plasma density essentially. And you can get that measurement from GNSS instrumentation. Um, but again, you see the same thing, this very kind of slow recovery. Um, interesting all, also to note that you see that these are slightly offsets, the kind of bottom of that, uh, of that rut there. And uh, the TEC kind of lags, which is actually an interesting effect. So that's what we talk about when we're uh, when we mean asymmetric recovery of that bottom side ionosphere. Um, there's other measurements. This is on the right here. This is from the Arecibo ISR. Uh, may it rest in peace. Um, from February 26, 98. This is looking at an eclipse, and this is the peak plasma density. And the obscuration at this measurement point was 90 percent. And so. Uh, the peak of the day, you see about 1130, I believe this is local time. And what you see is three traces, the, the dots or the, the crosses rather is the measurement from the radar. Uh, they had a model, which is the long line, the solid line, and then this dash line is the control. So this is, I think, probably the day before, the day after measuring this NMF2. And again, you see as the eclipse starts off just after 13 here, 13 o'clock, uh, you see this depletion. And you could probably argue there's an asymmetric, but it's not as obvious here. Uh, and an asymmetric recovery. So we do see asymmetric recovery, but sometimes we don't see it or it's not as pronounced, meaning that there's just some sort of, there's other factors that are determining that. And that's where a lot of the interesting science is. All right. Right, so again, several factors could uh, determine that response or do de determine that response, the obscuration, like how much of the solar disk is being covered up, the time of day when the eclipse is happening, the, the inclination, right? What the declination, inclination of the magnetic field is, at these points and neutral winds. So you have neutral winds of the day um, or also neutral winds that are also set up by the, uh, the event itself. Uh, so all those add together to kind of give you this response and this recovery and this asymmetric recovery. So that makes it difficult to, to try and actually sort out what is driving and what, what's doing what and what's contributing how much. Um, but that's the fun part for, for the science part of it because we get to go, go ahead and figure that out, right? That's, that's the challenge. Um, the nice thing is the 2023 and 2024, if you remember those maps of the eclipses, one is earlier in the day, it's going, it's partial, right? It's an annual eclipse, it's going west to south or northwest to southeast. And then 2024, it's totality, it's a little later in the day and it's going southwest to northeast, right? So those are different geometries in terms of geomagnetic variation, declination, the neutral winds will be different, the time of day is different and the solar obstacle. So we get in those, the short amount of time, we get two eclipses over the continent of the US to kind of identify some of this and sort it out. Here we see, uh, this is just that same Arecibo plot. This is HMF2, right? So this is the altitude of the peak density. And we see, again, some uh, interesting variations. You see the HMF2 actually increase, right? It goes, the bottom side goes up when we have that eclipse and eclipse totality. Okay, so we also see it not only in ISR data, we see it in um, QSOs and in spots. This is from Nathaniel's 2018 paper. And I just want to point everybody's eye. This is a histogram of, uh, this is RBN spots. And this is the top panel here is 14 megahertz. You could probably barely see it, but here's this dashed line showing uh, the, the eclipse and the obscuration. And here's the peak here. Uh, but you see all the spot activity is going strong here. Um, so this is distance between spots. And you see this nice strong, uh, a uh, bit of activity here before the eclipse and then after the eclipse. And then you see this slow recovery here, uh, which is uh, indi indicative of a, of a uh, uh, asymmetric response. So we can also see it not only in ISR, we can see it in, in QSO data, which is, which, is the, which is the link here, which is the hook, right? Okay. So, so that's, that's, that's one way that, and, and I think this is going to be a really powerful way that the ham radio community and, and TAM side can help address that question about asymmetric recovery. Um, the broader question too is helping assess predictions of the ionosphere. Again, as I mentioned, this is a really, uh, Eclipse is a really nice time for modelers to get to work to make predictions to see how their models are working. Joe Hube has been doing a lot of that, which is really, really great. Um, and this helps really advance our understanding of how 
the ionosphere and thermosphere coupled, how they respond to external influences. Thanks to uh, the prolif proliferation of GPS, GNSS, we can actually get these uh, really dense um, measurements of total electron content that really kind of help us. But there's a lot of value in that bottom side measurement. As I showed before, that Joe Huber plot showing the peak density going into that trough during the eclipse, and it's an offset from the total electron content. So they're decoupled, they're, they're related, but they're not quite in sync. So you, you get a bit of a different measurement if you're going from the bottom side than if you're doing for a TEC, which speaks to the value. Um, and, um, and so the, the, the issue, though, is that these vertical profiles that we see during an eclipse are extremely rare. Even bottom side profiles are rare as well. So uh, with HamSci and the Ham Radio community, we can really um, uh, take advantage of that and, and really find a niche and provide some really valuable data sets for, to, to, to help address some of these questions. So we get model, uh, model predictions of the, uh, of the ionosphere thermosphere system during eclipses. Sometimes they disagree, and that's good. Right. My advisor, I remember made a comment once at a talk where somebody said, oh, I have some data. I looked at the model and they disagreed. And he said it could be worse. They could agree. Right. Which is a good joke. I, think. I always like that joke. The worst thing is when they agree. All right. So um, there's some work that's been done on this. Mag uh, Magda Moses, who's a who's a ham. I can't remember. We all signed on, fortunately. Um, she used SuperDarn and looked at some SuperDarn data. But this was really a fusion of modeling data modeling HF data and, and radio wave propagation to understand and to test and to assess the, um, the, uh, the how accurate models are at, uh, at describing eclipses. And what she found was that there was actually some general agreement, but there's some subtle differences between the two and for various reasons, neutral winds and, and so on and so forth. But it really shows, um, and that's what's shown here on the right, we saw some, uh, Francis showed some Super RTI plots. This is range versus time, and these are uh, radar echoes. And then Magda modeled where we should see radar echoes, and you can kind of see good agreement between the two, which helps kind of uh, remotely sense the ionosphere. So there's good agreement there, but this is uh, shown to be you can use this technique to test models, um, especially during the eclipse. And of course, we can do the same thing with ham science, with ham radio, with RVN spots, and, and, and which is really one of the drivers behind. Uh, the QSO parties. Um, this is again from uh, Nathaniel's 2018 paper showing uh, the eclipse here on the right, showing all these spots with the totality obscuration factor on the right, and here's just a ray trace. So really, the, the key here is to uh, use these emissions on cooperative or cooperative to sample, to remotely sense that bottom side ion sphere to really study what's going on during the eclipse, and to use that as a method for uh, assessing and constraining modeling to get a better understanding about what's going on. And really how this works is if you recall uh, plots, look at my, my time, plots uh, made by Diego and Nathaniel that were shown earlier, you see that they're looking at LSTIDs where you see the wiggle of the bottom side of these uh, RVN plots. That's really a function of the skip distance, right? The skip distance is a function of the plasma energy in HMF2. So there's that link there. If we can monitor, say, the skip distance and how it changes, and these spots, we can get a sense of what the ionosphere density is doing, what that bottom side profile is doing. Okay, right, summary. So there are many questions we can ask about the eclipse. Uh, myself and the co-authors are interested specifically in these three, and I just described the two. There's a lot to talk about in the third as well. But the key here is that this community, the Hamside community, uh, was there in 2017 and, and offered some uh, amazing data that was that uh, you could probably still parse through and write some interesting papers. Um, the key here is for 2023 and 2024 and having the QSO parties is to really do that again and do it better and have more spots so we can actually get a good sense and answer some of these, start picking off some of these questions. And I, I believe that community is uniquely, uniquely uh, on the vanguard to do that. And we'll probably have a very unique data set that will really be unfairly. Anyways, I'll stop talking there and hopefully we have time for questions. And you have one or two questions as Rachel on that. And you have a microphone right there. Uh, no, 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 there's, there's one. This one. Yeah. Thanks. Um, for science question one, um, this difference you're looking for between the eclipses, are you looking for difference 
that you're hoping you account for just by the amount of the solar yeah. disk that's secure? Or are you hoping that you're going to see something more interesting than just like, not to say that it wouldn't be interesting, sorry, but are, are you hoping to see like some effect of the fact that there's a ring of the disk that isn't exposed, and that kind of thing? Yeah, so a, a couple of things that can drive that asymmetry are, you know, the obscuration factor, how much of the solar disk is covered up. Uh, I think I went past it, but also the uh, the time of day is also another one as well, and and also this the the inclination and declination of, of the, the geomagnetic field at that position. So trying to, I mean, with two events, it's really hard to decipher four different effects, right? But that's the that's the idea. Some of the things we can uh, hopefully try and disentangle. All right, thank you. Yep. Why don't we move along to the next talk? I know uh, Garrett will be around, so if you have any more questions for him, he will be happy to answer them on the break. And I would like to introduce Rachel Bodeker, AC8XY. Rachel is the new PhD student from Case Western Reserve University working on the Great Project now that Christina has graduated. Um, I can't say that for later to introduce you as Dr. Collins, which I will still do. Um, so, but yes, congratulations. Uh, so, I'd like to introduce uh, Rachel, measuring daily atmospheric variability and 2023 and 2024 solar eclipse atmospheric effects using campsite HF Doppler shift receivers. Take it away. Yeah, okay. Hi, I'm Rachel, uh, Alpha Charlie X ray Yankee. Um, so we've, yeah, basically covered that. I'm from Case Western, I'm the new grad student. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the new grant that we have um, in the works for the great project in the Case Western side of things specifically. Talk a little bit about the introduction. Most of you will have already seen most of the introduction and have been seeing the introduction for about a day now. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about what makes the great methodology unique and what we'll be doing and the scientific questions we'll be trying to answer. Um, Oh, so first, brief note on the ionosphere and the merits of solar eclipses, most of which you were already sold on, all of you. Uh, a lot of you are ham radio operators, not all, but most. Uh, so you're very familiar with the atmospheric layers already um, and how when you know the Earth is bombarded by solar radiation, it forms these ionized layers in the atmosphere. Um, and we can look at those as somewhat discrete layers as well. And those are different up uh, during day and night, right? So there's a certain time of night you're in your station, you're like, it's time to switch bands. That's because of the ionosphere. Um, your sources of ionospheric variability, we've talked a lot about this already in this conference, but you've got the dial shifts, so day night transitions, solar flares, auroral, auroral substorms, uh, kernel mass ejections, geomagnetic storms, traveling, on, traveling ionospheric disturbances, which we've talked a lot about uh, in AGWs, and solar eclipses. And you might have noticed that we're all super excited for solar eclipses in particular, right? And that's for very good reasons, right? We have a very predictable idea when, when something is going to happen, the path that it's going to take, the direction it will be taking, and the amount of solar radiation that will be involved in the undertaking. So there will be some variation between eclipses, um, depending on the time of year, um, what kind of eclipse it is, annual or, or total. Um, the location and direction. So there are still variances in eclipses, but for the most part, they provide this really nice, almost controlled system for the to, to take measurements during um, in an otherwise very complex system with a lot going on that's hard to separate. And so your typical Earth being bombarded by solar radiation during an eclipse, we have this nice moment where we have a very specific, almost localized nighttime, right? Where we have a total solar, total or an area of totality in the center. And then we also have a region around the eclipse where people see a partial eclipse. So how are we going to take, this? all of this is well and nice. We have an ionosphere. Um, how are we supposed to be measuring it, right? And that brings us to, you know, what do we want to be measuring? Why do we care? Well, we we're all hands, I shouldn't say all. Uh, we care about how the eclipse or ionospheric change in particular will affect HF communications. We care about what kind of disturbances these will cause and how the effects will last. Um, and we also might wonder things about eclipses on how similar they are to day 
and nighttime, right? So I said previously that it's almost like a localized nighttime if you've been in eclipse. Uh, is, is that accurate to say, or are there some unique effects? Um, so first thing we're going to need is to recall WWV, right? So the nice thing about the United States is that one of the many nice things is that we have a national time standard that's being broadcast at all times. Uh, and it also goes out on a very tightly controlled carrier frequency, which is really cool. Um, and all of this is brought to us by NIST. So uh, over in Fort Collins. And so we are sending out at all times of day, a very, very precise signal with a very precise time measurement, the you know, very precise carrier that's being bounced off of our ionosphere and received at a ham station near you um, and Fox near you. And the thing that we're most interested in, which you've heard mentioned a lot at this point in the day already, is Doppler shift, right? So if our ionosphere is changing, right, we have a solar change or some kind of change on our ionosphere, then the layer height would be changing, right? So say, you know, the ionosphere backs off at night, we have a, hot, you know, a Doppler shift, uh, a red shift, what we call it, with the path length increases, and therefore we have you know, a decrease in the received frequency. And if you have a layer height decrease or your ionosphere comes down, there's more solar radiation, then you'll get a blue shift. Um, so you'll look at a increase in your received frequency. So we can kind of measure this, right? But in order to have that, we also need one more thing, which is a really, really precise receiver to a certain extent, right? So it doesn't, it's not necessarily sufficient to say that we have a very precise and accurate transmitted uh, signal, we also need to be able to compare that signal. So the grape, which you've heard a lot about already, um, which was developed by John Gibbons, is a GPS disciplined, has a GPS disciplined oscillator. So that allows us to make really careful comparisons between um, w, the signal and WWV. And it makes, allows us to make a really accurate measurement of the Doppler shift in that carrier frequency. The other nice thing about it is it's inexpensive. It's just it's we can distribute it all over. If you don't have one and you want one, please get on the Hamsa mailing group list and focus about that. Um, especially with the new grape out and fingers crossed the grape version two um, at some point. Um, so which we'll be able to monitor three HF channels at a time. So the other the really cool thing about the grape is that it's inexpensive. Right, and we can send them all over. We can have a bunch of them. We don't have just really one very expensive radio dish or incoherent scatter radar. We have a distributed network, and the more of them we have, the better this works. Um, so, here is a map that currently has um, some existing receiver sites that are starred and some more proposed sites as well as the map of the eclipse. So we have the 2023 eclipse, which you've already seen this map a couple of times um, on the Western part of the United States going down and it's going to be an annual eclipse. And then we have the total solar eclipse, which is going to very nicely pass through Case Western in 2024. Um, so now we have this, presumably we get a bunch of grapes together. We distribute them all over. We have quite a few already and we get version two out, what are we really looking to see? What's the science questions here? Um, it breaks down into mostly uh, dawn dusk type variations, right? So what kind of changes are happening during the eclipse? Um, can we compare eclipses and day night uh, variation? And what can we observe more specifically about those signals during the eclipse? So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So the actual scientific questions that we want to address that's written in our NSF grant is, you know, how do dawn and dusk ionospheric variability vary with local time, season, latitude, longitude, frequency, distance, and direction, right? So this is stuff that we could be recording all the time. We have great receivers on as much of the time as we can, and we can be gathering this data specifically for the eclipse. We wanna know, is that ionospheric response symmetric with regard to the onset and recovery timing? So you heard a lot about that in our in the last chat, we'll talk a little bit more about it. How similar is the eclipse to the daily dawn and dusk terminator passage? So that's a fancy word for day-night shift, right? How similar is it to dawn and dusk? And would multi-path HF mode splitting 
So signals taking different ionospheric layer paths, basically, um, in the post-eclipse interval be similar to dawn, right? Um, so similar to a sunrise. And then, of course, if it's just here, down here at the bottom, would the response be diff different for two different eclipses? So we have a lot of data on 2017, but we have the chance to have two basically back-to-back -back eclipses that we can compare to each other. Um, so first, we're going to focus a little bit on dawn-dusk atmospheric variability, right? So this is a plot that if you've been around Hamsa, you've probably seen a lot of. Um, it was recorded in Macedonia, Ohio by N8OBJ, John Gibbons, who's right over there. <laughs> um, and you can tell, uh, for those who've been around Ryle, or you can tell uh, at the later part of the graph, maybe I'll wave to it, when he got new antennas, um, or new antenna. Um, but this one is a very nice graph because this takes place over quite a long range of time. And you can see a little bit of that seasonal variability, right, in your, your day-night shifts. So we have red shift and blue shift coded. This is from top to bottom, zero local time. So basically midnight to midnight. So you can see the kind of dawn occurrence, that blue shift, that uh, layer height coming down, right? When you presumably change to something higher frequency. And then you see maybe this sometime later in the evening, um, when you start to get that red sh shift, the ionospheric layer height is is rising, right? Um, if we were in the station at pace, we would probably say it's time to switch to 40 meters. <laughs> okay, uh, eclipse symmetry. So you, you probably saw this exact plot in the last um, slide deck as well. So this is generated by uh, Dr. Frizzell. It's 20 meter reverse beacon network data. So, and it's just, it's a histogram plotted from the eclipse and it's compared to a simulation um, that was run using ray tracing. So we see that if we had, you know, the actual occurrence is a little bit um, more asymmetric than what we'd expect from just a straightforward model. So we have all this data from 2017. And if we get this, you know, we're going to get this network distributed so that we can take a look at 2024 and 2023 and see if it has the same kind of behavior and if we can confirm these results. The other question is how similar, so we saw the, the daily dawn and dusk terminator changes, how similar would an eclipse be to that? You've undoubtedly seen this plot as well. So this is data that was also collected in 2017. It's Doppler shift data from WWV um, recorded on 10 megahertz. So this is, the top one is just a control day. So you can kind of see over the course of the day, you have this Doppler shift that changes, you know, at a given interval. And in the bottom half, you see our eclipse time period. And this is a little bit over the, I'm not quite sure where to move it so you can see the key, but um, you've got basically the, obscuration from the eclipse. And we can see that there's a Doppler shift going on, right? There's a change in the Doppler shift happening real time during the eclipse. So hopefully we'll see similar data in 2023 and 2024. I can get this too, there we go. Um, the last one is on, well, not the, quite the last one, but our last concrete one that we're gonna talk about is uh, multi-path mode splitting. Right, oh, I went back. So multipath, right, you can take, if a signal bounces off of a mirror, right, you can, it's just maybe one reflection and then you see it again if you shine a light bulb off a mirror. You could also be shining a um, light off of something that is more of a fun house, right? So you can have multiple hops in an ionospheric jump. And the simplified pictures we looked at before just kind of had the, the one hop going over, but in reality, you can kind of have, you, you can have multiple hops and you can also have signals being propagated along different layers in the ionosphere. Um, so this is an example that was uh, simulated by Dr. Frizzell. Okay, and when we look at the Doppler shift data, you can see that change, right? So you can see the signal, there's splitting that occurs where you can kind of separate the data um, from where 
uh, the signal propagated along one layer or the other. Okay, and then of course the last question is, would the response be different for two different eclipses? So that one, we don't really have any data from 2017 to wonder about and try to make plans for. We just kind of need two more eclipses or at the very least one more eclipse. And luckily the universe has complied because otherwise I don't know who I would bribe for this last one. Um, so our general project timeline, it's already 2023. So we're here we're at Hamside 2023. Um, we're working on grape version two construction and distribution in 20, later this year, we'll see the annular eclipse across the Western United States. Um, even if you're not going to have a grape station, you should maybe go and see it. It's gonna be cool. And in 2024, April, well, 2024, March, we'll be back here and hopefully I'll see all of you again. We're not back here, but somewhere. Okay. Okay. Case question mark. Um, 2024, April, we'll have the total solar eclipse. Um, it will pass through Cleveland. We'll all be very happy and hopefully collecting a lot of data. Fingers crossed, knock on all of the wood. And 2024, uh, we'll begin a lot of data processing. Well, we'll probably begin that in 2023 with the other stuff, but it was a nice timeline addition. Okay, so 2023, 2024, we've got the two solar eclipses. Don't miss them. If you would like, um, in terms of the broader impact of the work, we have public outreach with the ham radio community. Um, and accessible citizen science. Again, if you want a grape, do get on the mailing list and ask for one. Uh, we'll hook you up. A, we also get out of it the grape network to use for many other things. So you'll notice that we're not just looking at solar eclipses. We're also looking at TIDs. We're looking at di dial variations and things, um, and diurnal changes. So there's a lot we can use this for, um, and it's very modular and useful to keep around. Um, it's not the same thing as putting up one really big, expensive antenna tower and then being dependent on it, despite how beautiful those antenna towers are. Um, we can add grape stations and take away grape stations, and all of you could get a grape station tomorrow, and it wouldn't hurt the data collection in any way. We could just move on from there. So it's a very useful tool to have both from the science perspective and from the amateur perspective. And of course, we get graduate students out of it. So there are a couple more graduate students that you'll be seeing from Scranton uh, and me from Case Western working on the project. I have to do this bit. <laughs> so the this work is supported by the NSF, an NS grant, F grant. Oh, I don't think I've been speaking directly into that. Um, there's the number. It, we've also been basing this on work that has been done consistently using other NSF grants. And there is the standard disclaimer, which the NSF has on their website. And basically, uh, I am not the NSF, and these are not their opinions or material. Okay. And then in terms of other thankings, there is a lot of people involved in this project. Uh, not only just everyone in this room, um, but there are whole contingents at Alabama and Scranton and Case and NJIT and Haystack and Tapper. So we have just, and technically Dartmouth, but we have a lot of uh, people everywhere doing this. So this isn't just one NSF grant. It's not one year and it's not, you know, just two years of Eclipse stuff. Um, it's a pretty long-term consistent thing. So this is really cool. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone for being involved in this and making this all possible because I'm really excited to work on this stuff. Um, there are some citations. You may look at them later if you'd like. They're mostly uh Brazil stuff and then if you have any questions or you can comment me uh contact me or the Hamside mailing list if you're interested in the grape stuff at all do come join us uh we are on a we have a great zoom meeting at on Thursdays at 9 a.m uh, and you're all welcome it is completely open you're great we're behind. I'm on. I'm on. But I didn't make you later. I will only be Yeah. Yeah, question. So I was going to ask you mentioned they were going to be distributed. Is there any sort of agenda as to how they'll be distributed or whoever asks when gets one? Is there any cost involved? Okay. The person sitting next to you has the best answer to this question. <laughs> so 
Yeah, uh, in, yard yeah no, no, no. In, in general, uh, the more the merrier, right? Obviously, there are some places and holes. If we were to one day build, you know, a national network once the world becomes a million to study or education at the radio club. Um <laughs> yeah, national network of these things. It would be lovely to have them cleanly distributed along the globe. At the moment though, the more the merrier, really. Um did you want to answer this? Right now the initial build is on maybe 50 of these and they are going to be distributed to pre-selected sites that are optimal along the path for the science that we're trying to collect. After that, we'll be adding to it. That's and version two. That's version no, two. Great one. But a grade one, which is a new board version, is now up on the website of always a new part. The new parts list is being listed. I bought a few of the parts that are all there, including the SA612 answer, which went out to be in January. Um, that you can build and make your own break. So, yes, please join us. We're having a lot of fun with it. Yeah. I was asking about version two. That's the last thing sell out. Thank you so much, Rachel. Let's give her another ball. Round of Okay, next, for those of you who are here because you are operators and not necessarily data analysts or theoreticians or people like that, this is the talk for you. Gary, AF8A. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gary McKeaton. I am one of the many volunteers that help HAMSI move forward. I actually have a title, I guess, in this uh, wonderful thing we're doing here. I'm the Amateur Radio Community Coordinator for HAMSI. And that means my job is basically to attract as many amateur radio and shortwave listening type people to the on-air events that are planned for the next two eclipses. Uh, move forward. Oh, got it. Okay, great. My background, um, I've been a licensed ham radio operator for decades. Like a lot of people, I started in high school on the licensing process. I was a lot younger than that when I started sticking things in electrical outlets and blowing fuses in my parents' homes. So, um, and my suggestion to uh, Nathaniel and Rachel is make sure your outlets are covered because I can see Anthony's probably got those same tendencies. Kind of so. um, I received my engineering degree from CWRU. Uh, not a coincidence that I'm here with a lot of my cohorts here. Um, I'm not necessarily new to the wonders of solar eclipses. When I was working, I worked for the world's largest manufacturer of arc welding equipment which means when there was an eclipse one day during work, it was pretty easy for me to walk out to the lab, grab a welding helmet, pop in a number 14 lens and go outside and watch the eclipse. So that kind of got looked at today. Um, my home station is pretty modest. Uh, I tend to take my operating and contesting skills on the road. Um, here on the left, I'm at Fort Collins. That was the WWV 100th anniversary event. And on the right is one of the 35 field days I participated in with a couple of other CWRU alums. So today, a couple of things we want to talk about. The Festivals of Eclipse Ionospheric Science. Uh, it's kind of an umbrella event to get people on the air and active and uh, generate a lot of RF during the eclipses. I'd like to do a quick recap of the 2017 event. Um, I want to talk about what, you know, the, the 2017 event went really well, so we're not going to broke, we're not going to break what was working well. Um, I'd like to talk about expanding our participation. We're having a new event called the Gladstone Signal Spotting Challenge, uh, one which grew out of the 2017 event. But throughout my talk, I hope to make it clear that HAMSI wants all the participants to have fun with these operating events and know that everyone is contributing to something much bigger than themselves, advancing scientific research and understanding through amateur radio activities. So the Festivals of Eclipse on Anospheric Science, it's an umbrella event, as I said. We've got the two events I'm talking about. You heard about a couple of others that fit under the umbrella pretty well from uh, Steve Sirwin, from Dave McGaugh earlier today. Um, but so you might want to ask yourself, well, what's a festival? Well, Noah Webster would define the festival as a celebration or a program of events having a specific focus, pretty much perfect what we're talking about here. Of course, for us, the main events are the solar eclipses. Um, eclipses have frightened, awed, and inspired millions of people through the ages, right? HAMSI is taking a rather unique approach, not studying the eclipses per se, but studying the eclipses' effects on the ionosphere, that charged reason of, uh, of the atmosphere that lies between 80 and 1,000 kilometers above our heads. In order to do that, though, we've created some, uh, some main events of our own. 
So our goal is to attract a large segment of the ham radio community in the generation of data, not as a chore, but through participating in an interesting, enjoyable and events. One characterized as a party, the other as a challenge. But before I lose, I know there's some non-hams non here or we're listening or watching. I wanna do a little bit of uh, explanation of the term QSO because we're talking about a QSO party. So in one hot, when a QSO is a noun, it's the result of two licensed operators, each operating a ham station, which generally consists of a radio and antenna and often a computer, um, exchanging information and logging or recording what they exchanged. And many times this is a very casual process, the making of QSOs. No one's especially in a hurry. A QSO can last from a few minutes to an hour or more. There are times, however, when I guess I'd say a certain madness kind of takes over people and uh, the QSO rates skyrocket and that's what we call contesting. Contests take place fairly frequently. There's local contests, regional and national ones. But seven or eight years ago, the guy in this room here, Dr. Fursell, had a brainstorm to organize a contest around the August 2017 total eclipse, but with a scientific purpose, using the results, the resulting contacts as a data set, you know, when and where these contacts occurred relative to the eclipse paths for answering science questions regarding the ionosphere. Got to say, it was a resounding success. We, you know, at that time, literally millions of data points were generated and subsequently used in space physics research. As an aside, this graph or, or this graphic on the right just shows how much activity can come from a well-attended contest. Note that the top stations here in this chart during a 48 hour period made over 9,000 contacts. If you do the math, that's over 200 contacts per hour. Now that's pretty impressive, but there's a guy in this room, where's Bob Indergritsen? He was here somewhere before. He was just down in Bonaire at another contest and they made 11,000 contacts in 48 hours. So uh, kudos to, to, to Bob and the PJ4G team. So that's, uh, that's a lot of sending and receiving and logging. Anyhow, so let's take a look real quickly at the uh, 2017 QSO party results. Um, from the participants' log data that was sent in and submitted to the HAMSI website, about 566 people, I was one, submitted their logs. Okay, that's a pretty good number. That's a pretty good segment of the HAM population. But I'd like to take a look at the third line here, the unique call signs in those logs, almost 5,000 calls. So that's a better feel for how many people were actually participating in the SEQP back in 2017. But even more impressive here is chart two, the spotting network data. A spotting network is essentially a set of geographically distributed automated shortwave receivers, which log the time and location of the contacts that they hear. They log them to central databases. So when I said earlier that millions of data points were generated, I wasn't kidding. You can see, you can see those numbers right here. So what about 2023 and 2024? Um, I'm gonna kind of go out on a limb right here and say that I think we can double the numbers of data points that we collect for the next two eclipses. That's, that's my stated goal and I'm putting it out there for everybody and we'll, we'll know in a, in a couple of years how well we've done. But I think with, uh, with a lot of help from the ham side community, I'm sure we can do it. So how do we get there? So the Solar Eclipse QSO Party 2.0 is our main vehicle. Um, it's taking the best of the concepts from the 2017 event. Uh, we freshened up the rules a little bit, added some frequently asked questions on the website. We're doing a lot of work so far as uh, essentially advertising through, uh, you know, the normal ham media. Nowadays, we've got podcasts and other things. So we've got a lot of, uh, a lot of outreach we're doing to the amateur radio community. Um, I don't want to go into the details about the rules and all that sort of stuff. We'll put everybody to sleep. But let just be known that, that stuff's all on the HAMSI website and it's pretty easy to follow, if I do say so myself. Okay, yeah, that's a picture of the rules. Okay, so the key is though, as I say, if we're really gonna double the number of data points that we're gonna collect, I think we really make sure we need to approach and, and attract an even broader range of interest than we did last time. Uh, one way to do that is to widen the appeal of the festival events. So let me give you guys a quick picture and, and you can see this out here. This is a reasonably typical ham station. It's uh, actually a ham radio super station in West Middlesex, PA. Um, but uh, you see a couple of radios there. I see a power amplifier over the ops, uh, left-hand shoulder, a couple of monitors. I'm sure there's a few computers under the desk and a lot of antennas out in the yard. 
that's fairly typical. And that's how a lot of people like to do their ham radio, put together a good sized station like this. But some hams prefer things that are just a little bit simpler, like this picture on the right. There's one right there. Um, to me, that looks like a fully functioning, what's called a whisper station. That station is basically a homebrew PC, I would say, on the left. And on the right hand, there's that little white box is probably a whisper transmitter and receiver. And that's a little box that is capable, with the help of that PC, of sending and receiving propagation beacons. Those, that beacon data can then be fed into those databases where I showed you earlier, we got the, the millions of data points the first time around. But this new event is gonna be called, the, and the festival uh, should be attracting you know, both of these, these mindsets. So what we're calling the second part of the festival is the Gladstone Signal Spotting Challenge. Uh, it's a competition for those who are interested in HF radio wave propagation, perfect fit for the festival's goals. The challenge is built primarily around digital modes, you know, computers encoding and decoding data, which is then sent and received by amateur radio stations. Um, if you're not familiar with it, this is a typical uh, waterfall audio spectrum display. Those little yellow vertical lines are evidence of a couple of, uh, I think about, uh, there's at least a dozen or so signals there on the 14 megahertz ham band. So the most common mode, in, at least since around 2010 for doing this thing, is, uh, is called Whisper, as I mentioned earlier. It stands for Weak Signal Propagation Reporter. We're also promoting a much newer mode called FST4W. The next two speakers are going to cover that. And that should yield a little bit richer of a data set. The nice thing about Whisper and the thing that excites me about it is the equipment needs are very simple. Um, this is a very basic Whisper transmitter here. It's a Raspberry Pi, the green board. That red whisper hat is made by our friends from Tapper. You can order one of those online for $30 or $40, and uh, some are pre-built, or you can build them yourself. But this, the nice thing about this mode is it gives you immediate feedback on the reach of the signals it's transmitting. And I think that's especially appealing to young people, ham radio clubs and schools and colleges and whatnot, people that are used to you know, immediate feedback from almost everything they do. So here's a map of uh, signal spotters and signals paths. This is an, uh, an example of that immediate feedback I was talking about. It's a screen grab of what was once a live map of transmitting and receiving stations across the continental US. If you're operating one of these whisper transmitters and your signal goes out, you can flip on this map and within a minute or so, you're gonna see your signal, your transmitter location pop up on the map if you've properly configured it and you're sending your data to the right database and whatnot. Not only that, but the stations that receive you, those stations will appear and the paths between you, between you and them will all appear. So it's, 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 it, it's, it's, it, it can be kind of enthralling. I mean, that's what we hope to do is people really take to this. So, but that's, you know, all well and good for the hams that want to transmit this stuff and can see what they're doing. But as they say, but wait, there's more. From our point of view, the reports of the stations that are spotted by these receiving stations are held in databases created and maintained by the ham community. In fact, the event is named after one such person, Philip Gladstone, who created a site called PSK Reporter over 10 years ago, and it's still running today and still being improved. Um, the records in these databases consist of time and date stamps, station identifi identifiers, location, frequency data, so on and so forth. And this is the type of data that was proven after the 2017 eclipse to have great value to research. So bottom line, these databases represent publicly available long-term data sets of bottom side ionospheric observation. And that, as they say, is just what the doctor ordered. So the Gladstone Signal Spotting Challenge, again, all the details are on the Hampside website. Uh, nothing too exciting to, to mention there, but you can follow these links. And if you're interested in getting involved, that'd be wonderful. Uh, some stations may want to be whisper transmitters. Some may want to be whisper receivers. And if you've got enough real estate, you can certainly do both from, from one station. So in summary, um, the festival's eclipse on atmospheric science will have multiple events. The SEQP and the GSSC I've just covered, designed to be fun, friendly competitions. Um, but you can follow hamside.org slash eclipse and, and, and anywhere on our website and get to uh, the, all the details. 
You can join the Hampshire listserv. We've got an announcement only serve, listserv that's going out to keep to remind people if there's new things come up in the rules or when the events are coming about. Um, participants are welcome and actually encouraged to go to the Hampshire website and pre-register. Uh, one that helps us, you know, as the eclipse gets close, what we'd like to see is a broad spread of stations on both sides of the eclipse path that are planning to operate. If for some reason there is a certain area of the country that's looking a little thin, well, maybe we'll go out and try a little bit harder and recruit people in those areas, contact clubs or whatnot. But pre-registration helps us a lot. Um, if you're talking about these events to other hams, people are going to say, okay, I'm going to have fun doing this, but what else is in it for me? I think the long-term science will benefit the ham radio community greatly. Um, long-term, we should have improved understanding of high-frequency propagation. There should be improved models of the ionosphere. And long-term, hopefully, more accurate propagation, resist, uh, propagation re, uh, forecasts result from all this work. So that's about it. Uh, any questions? Oh, here. Hey, I have uh, two parting comments. I know a lot of the presenters today have thanked various uh, agencies and organizations. There's a lot of alphabet soup up there. Remember, behind all, a lot of those organizations, not all of them, but a lot of them are the U.S. taxpayers, okay? So those of you who pay your taxes regularly, whether you like it or not, you're funding those organizations and it's coming back to Hampshire. So that's a good thing. Okay. My second suggestion is, you know, while our research is the focus of the Earth's atmosphere, don't forget to take time to safely observe the eclipses while you're operating. I did that in 2017, and I, I remember those times very well. So thank you very much, everyone. Question? Yep, yes, Quick question. You mentioned FST or W, yes. I've never heard of that, but we're going to find out more. Um, Next few thoughts, really. Maybe not the next talk, but the talk after that. Talk after, okay. All right, the talk after that. Because next we have, uh, we're now it's time for the DX talks. So this one's uh, coming in from uh, VT7 DXR uh, from Canada. So uh, Nick Paul Patch, are you there? I am. Hello, Nathaniel. Uh, How are you? And can you see my uh, my title screen? Yes, we can. You can okay. Your All right. Um, okay. Um, I'm Nick Hallpatch, uh, V7 uh, DXR. Um, and uh, although I'm a ham, I'm sort of uh, more actually a, a medium wave DXer, which I can tell you a bit more about. And the title of my talk is uh, Broadband Recordings from Medium Wave DXers Could Support Solar Eclipse Science. Um, Medium wave DXers uh, have observed uh, signal strength variations of AM broadcasters during past solar eclipses. Uh, use of uh, software defined radios is now widespread in that group. Uh, and these are capable of making IQ recordings of more than one megahertz bandwidth. And such recordings are going to be made by DXers during this 2023 and 2024 eclipses simply for their own interest. HAMSI could offer guidance to those DXers uh, as to making plan, these planned recordings as useful as possible to the scientific community. And finally, uh, what science could these recordings support? And importantly, who is going to do the processing of the data? Okay, so the introduction here, um, as I said, uh, I'll explain a bit more about medium wave DXing. This is a subset of uh, shortwave listeners. Uh, they monitor the AM broadcast band, uh, 525 to 1705 kilohertz, in order to receive and log uh, distant radio stations. And as in the 160 meter band, DXing is generally done between sunset and sunrise in order to take advantage of the favorable ionospheric conditions there. Um, now, these DXers have been aware of nighttime-like reception conditions that occur during solar eclipses and as far back as 1925, were assisting scientists with data collection. You can see here the screen, the, uh, a, a scientific paper actually, it's a Scientific American organized, uh, I think about 2000 listeners uh, before the eclipse uh, to essentially monitor what happened to the radio signals that they heard on the AM broadcast band. Uh, uh, during, during the course of the eclipse. 
Now, similarly, during the 2017 solar eclipse, uh, total solar eclipse, a, a number of DXers recorded the entire AM broadcast band using software-defined radios. And in fact, this was the uh, first time that uh, such broadband uh, receivers had been used to record um, broadcast AM uh, broadcast band signals uh, during a solar eclipse. They didn't exist in previous uh, eclipses. Uh, these recordings, incidentally, contain good quality signal strength data from carriers of the AM broadcasting stations that were received. Um, a couple of examples here, um, basically Excel files. Um, and during uh, the, 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 this eclipse, the SDR files were, were gathered from several DXers in different locations and were used to illustrate the effects of the eclipse on the signal strength from a signal bro single broadcaster, KSL, on 1160 kilohertz in Salt Lake City, Utah. And there were various DXs listening in places like Grants Pass, Oregon, Victoria, British Columbia, and Medicine Hat, Alberta, and Uppsala, Minnesota. You can see the solar eclipse passed, you know, sort of uh, in, in the middle of the signal path in, in a number of these cases. Based on those uh, KSL signal strength variations over the course of the eclipse, a Hamsai publication was generated. And uh, I'll give a link here. Uh, and the IQ files uh, used were uploaded to the uh, Zenodo repository for use by future researchers. Uh, there seemed to be a number of downloads. Uh, I don't know how many of those were researchers, but certainly there seems to have been some interest in them. But in 2017, found data was used. Uh, this was not something that was planned ahead. Um, it, it, it definitely was after the fact. Uh, we sort of said, well, these people have been recording uh, the, uh, the whole band. Uh, so you know, what's in there? Uh, the result, of course, was that re so the recordings made were a little haphazard. Um, the primary difficulty was that starting and stopping at different times. Uh, one guy changes antenna in the middle of it. Uh, um, and uh, the uh, major problem was that uh, there was actually drift in the uh, um, in the frequency of uh, some of, some of the stations apparently because the clock of the uh, SDR uh, was uh, was drifting because the receiver had only been turned on a few minutes before the recording was started. These people were not thinking in terms of science. Uh, what can be done then in 2023 and 2024 in order to get the best quality data from medium wave DXers? Well, uh, first of all, we need to make sure that the DXers know that HamSci will be interested in their data. Uh, publicizing HamSci's interest through medium wave DXer clubs and email groups in North America, as well as more general SW sites will be helpful. Secondly, um, the suggested, uh, you know, what's the best way to make the data of optimum use to propagation researchers? Um, the, among other things, documenting receiver software and antenna used with as many details as possible. Uh, it was uh, quite interesting actually going over the 2017 data and sort of saying, well, what was your setup like? And said, geez, it was a long time ago. <laughs> I'm not sure I remember. Um, so uh, a second uh, thing, as I mentioned, would be as far as just keeping the, uh, the apparent frequency stability as, as, as solid as possible would be to warm up the receiver for several hours before recording to minimize drift in those recorded signals. Uh, another item for sure is to make sure that the timestamps and the recorded data are as accurate as possible. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, the, the obvious one would be to you know, set the computer clock uh, using network time, which is available, uh, everybody's computer, and, and just making sure that it's up to date. Uh, the recording itself, making sure it start, the recording is started well before maximum totality in their area until well after that time. Um, Still haven't decided, you know, what would be best, but I would say, as, as we mentioned uh, in, on a previous talk, uh, um, probably two hours before, two hours afterwards uh, would be a, a minimum. And if possible, to make additional SDR recordings of, for example, two hours before and after sunset and sunrise on the day of the eclipse. Uh, further possible improvements to the quality of data uh, collection. Um, as been mentioned uh, in talk about grapes, uh, the uh, 
this idea of using GPS um, to, you know, sort of to uh, provide a disciplined oscillator. Uh, essentially, uh, uh, there's a Bodnar uh, GPS disciplined oscillator, which is quite inexpensive, and which a number of people already know about. And in fact, uh, several current SDRs used by medium wave DXers have inputs for the use of external frequency references. And that includes this uh, example here, the uh, uh, inexpensive SDR play RSP DX. The other thing would be to encourage the use of not just setting the time uh, on the computer before the recording computer beforehand, but encourage the use of an NTP uh, time client on the computer that's doing the recording. So um, what science could uh, this, uh, you know, so, so these recordings uh, support? And uh, I you know, thank very much uh, Dr. Perry for his, uh, you know, early, earlier examples of, uh, uh, you know, sort of what, what's, what we need to look at. But uh, um, even without using an SDR locked to a frequency reference, um, one of them would be the, uh, as mentioned earlier, this is, is eclipse ionospheric response symmetric with regard to the onset and recovery timing. Um, the rate of buildup versus decay of the signal strength of target signals could quite possibly indicate differing ionospheric response as the eclipse progresses. The other item was uh, how similar is the eclipse uh, effect of propagation to that of the daily dawn and dusk terminator passage. Uh, that would be the reason to record um, uh, dawn and uh, you know, sunrise and sunset conditions um, uh, as well as the actual conditions during the eclipse. And if a participant is actually using an SDR uh, locked to a reference oscillator, another ham sci scientific objective might be addressed as well. And that is, are, are Doppler shifts observed in a broadcaster's carrier signal as the eclipse progresses? Um, as, as this uh, um, display here, the, the, the detail from the reception of 1530 kilohertz carrier at local sunrise shows indeed that such shifts are possible. Okay, uh, who will be doing the, the processing? It's not known how many medium wave DXing participants there will be. We haven't asked yet, uh, but each individual set of recordings over the eclipse period could be 25 gigabytes per hour and include over 100 broadcast channels to examine. That's a lot of data. Um, and, you know, at, at some point, it'll probably need to be aggregated, all gathered together in one spot. Uh, somebody needs to do that. Uh, I, I did that uh, for the 2017 uh, solar eclipse. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, again, with pre-planning, we're going to have to make sure that, you know, so, that this is done again. And what data should be analyzed and who can do the analysis? Well, one of the uh, things that could be, you know, sort of done very nicely, uh, and this is something that was not available in 2017, from the SDR recordings, participants themselves could generate their own snapshots of what occurred on each channel during the eclipse during, using Carrier Sleuth software, for example. And I give a, a link here for this. Um, and this is an example of a display from this particular software. Uh, and as you know, uh, AM, AM broadcasters, uh, any amplitude modulation has a, uh, um, a, a strong uh, carrier signal. It doesn't, you know, ideally does not change uh, at the transmitter as, as modulation changes. So it's a, you know, like a, a, an excellent um, way of observing propagation effects at the receiver. Uh, you know, or, or observing uh, propagation effects on the path between transmitter and receiver. And for example, here I've uh, got um, some data from the 2017 um, solar eclipse. And as I say, the, the software is not available at the time, but we can pre process it after the fact. Um, in the x axis, we have frequency um, uh, with resolution of one uh, uh, sort of one, one hertz. And uh, we have uh, time on the y-axis uh, starting um, with time progressing as the y-axis goes down. And what we're seeing here is uh, a carrier uh, during the solar eclipse uh, becomes stronger. Um, and this would be from the transmitter probably in California. Um, 
you know, because the, and, and as I say, the receiver's in Alberta. So what is, what is happening here is the, uh, the signal is building in strength as the solar eclipse moves from uh, west to east and then fades out. But as that is happening, there's also another uh, carrier appearing, uh, likely from transmitter in Illinois, and that increases in strength and then fades away as the eclipse moves again further, further to the east. The software in question is inexpensive and fairly easy to use. There are one or two others that allow the amateur to graphically examine their reception by channel and over time. This is the one that I found easiest to use and, and can give the fastest response in terms of uh, you know, visual data. Uh, as an example here, I, I'll just uh, pulse through uh, some frequencies on that same data set from Alberta. Uh, this was the one I showed before in 1690 kilohertz. Look at 1680 kilohertz. No, the, the wiggle is not from the solar eclipse. Uh, some transmitters are not as stable as others. Uh, down to 1670 kilohertz, down to 1660 kilohertz. So you can see that this, you know, it's obviously there's a solar eclipse effect on all, all those um, um, signals being received. In addition, participants could generate their own signal strength data from target stations, carriers using this software. Um, and this might also indicate channels of interest to researchers. Uh, this is the 1530 kilohertz uh, sunrise data that I had showed earlier. And uh, you can zero in to about 0.1 or 0.2 hertz resolution and generate a, uh, um, a, a graph of signal strength and time on the x-axis and strength on the y-axis. Um, so if, uh, you know, this is, yeah, I mean, this is something that participants can be asked to do, you know, I, I, I think it would aid in their actually being able to find DX, being able to examine channel by channel um, signals, you know, rising and falling in strength. Uh, but even if uh, such data is submitted without including such pre-processing, um, the aggregators of the data could perform that pre-processing fairly quickly. And this is preparing it for further examination by interested researchers. In effect, it's giving snapshot channel by channel um, uh, you know, so that uh, you don't have to sort of fish through and, and process everything um, to find out uh, interesting signals. Participants who have more interest in ionospheric propagation um, or developed interest uh, from, say, doing this processing, pre-processing, might be invited to learn how to assist HAMSI with further data processing. As an example, it might be possible to uh, generate audio by tuning a kilohertz below a specific broadcast channel in an I IQ recording and using USB demodulation to generate files in the format required by the great uh, system in, in order to derive uh, Doppler shifts in graphical form. So in conclusion, uh, during the upcoming solar eclipses, medium wave DXs using SDRs will be making IQ recordings, which will cover this range of 525 to 1705 kilohertz. This is a range that, um, you know, except for the 160 meter band, uh, really is not, you know, sort of well covered by amateur radio. HAMSI can offer guidance as to how to make these recordings most useful for solar eclipse uh, science. It should be possible to pre-process the recordings to give a channel-by-channel -channel visual indication of the effects of the solar eclipse upon radio wave propagation of specific uh, signals. And that pre-processing could be done by DXers themselves. Once that visual examination is done, it should be possible to discover what data is worth further processing in order to better understand the state of the ionosphere during solar eclipses, perhaps with the assistance of those DXers. And that's it. Uh, so any questions? And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick. Any questions? I have a question here. This is a, I'm Steve Walters. This is actually a question for, for Nathaniel. Uh, <laughs> are there any standards that MSI uh, uh, has, has suggested that you mentioned the great multi-unit but it seems that if you're going to have 
all these various different efforts going on to measure and collect data during the eclipse. You need some, maybe not just one, but a set of standards for the models so that you can get data in a format so you're not just basically this jumble of math and information that can't be understood. I, I think that's a very good question, and it's a problem we're working towards solving. So, um, with the it's a, it's a difficult problem too because the typical amateur radio gear is not designed for saving data in a scientific format. Um, you can often save IQ files or wave files these days uh, from your computer to country radios, but they're not necessarily my scan properly and they don't have a right data yet. And so then you can go to the other extreme and you can say, well, let's go to uh, a software packages that are designed for this, like the MIT Digital Art, which does have all the data, data. But then that runs fast on Linux and you have to really know what you're doing with that. So the way we're working on solving it right now is uh, with the great, with like the great project, we're working on developing a, you know, basically a you buy it or build it system where we provide the recommended software and get all the things and we work all that stuff out and that's a work in progress. Uh, you know we do have some uh, examples where we are we do have data from that and it's working but it's really have a good standard. And then um the other part is where uh they call patch came to me and basically ask the same question. And so now Nick is on a teleconference with us every Thursday and we're discussing these very things. And uh, I think um Probably the simplest thing to say right now is in the absence of knowing how to use like digital RF and those sorts of things, you know, saving uh, either raw IQ or wave files and making sure that the file has the start time as accurate as possible and you record the um, and you keep track of where your station is located and those things and then you upload that to the Dodo, then that's something we can work with in the future. But um, having some sort of standardized uh, procedure that we that's posted on the NASA website would be something we're working towards. And it's also something, you know, we could encourage the uh, even the uh, manufacturers to uh, come up with standards to make it really easy. If you have a Flex FDR, you know, can you have it so that we hit record? It'll dump all the file, it's, um, it'll dump the files in a reusable format and make sure it includes all the frequency and the timestamp data data um, so that we don't have to think about it so much something so data file. The great one has a file standard in there for potentially on the project that has a metadata header that specify how it goes in and how it's about to be stored. And grade two, there will be an addition for the file format of the storage of the same thing. So we have that in process already. Yeah. And I know you're probably going to talk a lot more about this too, right? Uh, it's very important to me to learn about that. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm going to overwhelm you with data. Okay. <laughs> I mean, if, if there's a place to put it during the eclipse, there will be <laughs> terabytes of recordings that are coming in. So we'll, we'll have to keep, and yeah, we'll have to keep working on this and um, yeah, figure out maybe data uh, man a better because because one of the other problems is you know with the great version one data the beautiful thing about the great version one data is it's really very small amount of data but we're starting talking about doing these wide band data recordings now we're talking large amounts of data but we may have to look towards a bigger management plan and maybe that's something I can, we can talk to the NSF about or we can you know, talk to an AGU and figure out like a, a better management Absolutely. plan for that. So, okay. Um, so we are going to have, thank you very much, Nick. One more round of applause for Nick. And next up, uh, let's see, I have to stop your screen sharing. Oh, Nick, can you stop your screen share? Uh, yes, uh, sorry. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm well, trying to, uh, I'm trying to get out of that. Um, okay. Oh, yeah, I got it. There we go. I just thank you. Things. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So next up, we have another DX, uh, Gwyn Griffiths G3 ZIL. Go ahead, Gwyn. Uh, good day, all. Uh, I hope you're seeing my screen okay. Yes. 
Right. Uh, my aim is to show you why FST4W, a relatively new beacon mode within the WSJTX package, is a really useful propagation analysis tool at HF, even though it was designed specifically for use on LF and MF bands. My colleague Rob Robinett will speak next on the how. I'm grateful to many people for making this work possible, and credits to others will appear later. In my presentation at last year's HAMSI on the sudden collapse of whispered decodes across North America on 7 megahertz during the 4th of November 2021 geomagnetic storm, I could not determine whether the likely cause of this drop was reduced SNR, excessive Doppler spread, or both. When seeking a way to find an answer, I discovered that the FST4W mode in WSJTX can be made to measure spectral spread. This presentation is all about how I've learned to use spectral spread alongside SNR to associate their combined fingerprints to different propagation modes. I can also now show when geomagnetic disturbance leads to sufficient Doppler spread to cause spots not to be decoded. FST4W is a whisper-like beacon mode optimized for use on the LF and MF bands, but with several differences. One difference is that it has four sequence lengths. This talk is almost exclusively on the 122nd variant that works on global paths at HF. Its two performance advantages over Whisper aren't really central to this talk. And Rob will show how to overcome the disadvantages. But here I thank John Siemens at Kiwi SDR and Hans Summers at QRP Labs for the significant reductions in phase noise that they have made to enable the measurements I'll show today. Setting the option to measure spectral spread is unconventional and awkward. An empty file named plot spec must be put in the directory in which WSJTX is run, and that directory varies with the system that you're using. We can now say whether a spot decode failed because of excess spectral spread or because of insufficient SNR. In this example of a failed decode, the spectrum of an FST4W300 spot is in blue, the noise level is in red. Now, very clearly, failure here was not because of lack of SNR, it was because of excess spectral spread. I'll show results from two experiments. First, December 2022, with transmissions from Lynn Rhymes, WB7ABP, Santa Rosa, California, to the receivers at the sites shown with yellow map pins. The second, complementary experiment in February 2023, used transmissions from my own QRP Labs QDX digital transceiver with an external GPSDO from N6GN, Glen Elmore, uh, here at Southampton, UK, to VY0ERC at Eureka, Ellesmere Island, across the Auroral Oval, and to K6RFT, Missouri, to examine ionosphere to ionosphere propagation modes. The December 2022 experiments give a variety of path lengths from a 2.4 kilometer partially obstructed ground wave path through what turned out to be a fascinating set of paths spanning 40 to 1,000 kilometers and out to over 3,000 kilometers to the east, north, and west. For data analysis, I mainly used time series graphs and scatter plots of FST4W spectral spread against signal level or SNR with non-parametric density contours that greatly aided interpretation. Ray tracing using PILAP was invaluable for checking what propagation modes might be supported over particular paths at particular times. 
And I do confess to a great deal of head scratching when trying to interpret several of the graphs, but the answers were out there in the literature and discussion with amateur friends provided sanity checks. Nevertheless, I'd welcome comments and insights from professionals. Let's first look at the 40 kilometer path from WBP APs, ABP uh, to KPH, uh, coastal station at Point Reyes. Now a reminder, this is 14 megahertz and the transmit and receive antennas are both horizontally polarized. As the terrain profile here at the bottom shows, this is not a line of sight path between transmitter and receiver. In the time series graph at left, the signal level of FST4W spots at the receiver input are in blue, red on the left-hand scale. And the spectral spread in millihertz is in orange is red on the right-hand scale. And the cyan humps here are the sun elevation angle at the midpoint of the path, so we can judge local time of day. In the scatter plot at right, on the spectral spread is on the y-axis, again in millihertz, and the signal level at the receiver input on the x-axis. And the density contours, as you'll see, greatly help interpretation when we're dealing here with several hundred spots. They really do bring out the clusters, and those clusters were a really nice surprise for me. Now, I'm proposing that the period marked A on the time series graph at night, characterized by low signal level and low signal uh, spectral spread, and present as two clusters on the scatter plot, was ground wave. There's clearly day to day variation of the ground wave level in both the time series and scatter plots. But what's the propagation mode responsible for cluster B? Whatever mode it is, it produces higher signal level than ground wave and has about 10 times the spectral spread. It's very unlikely to be near vertical incidence sky wave at 14 megahertz and 40 kilometers. Well, have a think and we'll come back to it later. I had hoped that the picture at a range of 960 kilometers would be easier to interpret, but it's not. Here, the path is from Santa Rosa to the northern Utah SDR site, reporting as KA7OEI-1. I've labelled three clusters on the scatter plot and then picked them out on the time series graph, I1, I2 and I3. And I'm only going to consider I1 and I3 uh, today. I1 was a daytime mode with a higher signal level and SNR, and a median spectral spread of about 87 millihertz. Now, interestingly, I3 immediately followed I1 in time, and that's a useful piece of information to keep in mind. But its signal level was about 20 dB lower. Its median spectral spread was 622 millihertz, a value very similar to mystery mode B on the 40 kilometer path to KPH. So let's turn to propagation model and ray tracing to try and help identify cluster I1, or at least really to confirm what we may strongly suspect to be the mode. The daytime single peak in SNR in the propagation model and the PILAP a ray trace really show that for 2000 UTC, that's daytime in Utah, that I1 was one half propagation via the F2 layer. But by 0200 UTC, the maximum usable frequency had dropped and the receiver at a range of 960 kilometers was well within the skip zone. And by 0500 UTC, rays at all angles travel through the ionosphere, at least in this model. So we're left with the question, what was the mode for cluster I3? 
let's look at a candidate above the MUF mode. And I've sk skipped much reading and head scratching to get here. The mode we look at is two hop side scatter. It is mentioned in the ARRL handbook and is well described in several, re several readable papers and reports with numerous examples and descriptions of neat techniques for identifying signals received via this mode. Looking at the map, the clear area centered on Santa Rosa is the skip zone at 0200 UTC, that is 1800 local time at 14 megahertz. And the Northern Utah SDR site is within this zone. But one hop propagation is possible into the shaded region. Now, my cartoon here shows one possible scenario. This is one out of many. I have no evidence at all for choosing this particular scenario over others, but it works for my argument here. So the rays in brown are propagating south from Santa Rosa. They'll undergo ground scatter with the forward scattered energy going on its way to the south. But the interaction is scatter. It's not specular reflection as for a mirror, and there will be energy scattered at all angles. So from each area on the ground, or in this example over the sea, there will be side scatter along paths that reach the receiver at uh, the northern Utah site. So on each of the outward and return paths, there's one hop propagation via the F layer, and hence the overall term two hop side scatter for this mode. Now, the ITU P533 model has a very simple expression for the excess loss for two hop side scatter. And we can use this estimate to test whether the mechanism produced the cluster I3. I estimated the basic MUF at the times of the I3 clusters from data from the closest Digisond at the Idaho National Lab, 195 kilometers north of KA7OEI-1 receiver. Now, the 7 dB difference between the excess loss from the simple model in ITU P533, and the measurement was just about fair for the Northern Utah side. And indeed, it has to be just good fortune that there was no difference for the 679 kilometer path from Santa Rosa to KK6 PR in Oregon. And as you can see, the I3 cluster of spots dominated at, uh, in Oregon, uh, compared to rather few spots via I1, the one hop mode at 679 kilohertz. And on the reasonable match between modeled and measured excess loss, and that I3 immediately followed in time the one hop F2 layer propagation as the MUF dropped below 14 megahertz, I conclude that I3 really is two hop side scatter. Now, furthermore, the daytime clusters labeled B at KPH and indeed at KP4MD, Citrus Heights, they are also, in my opinion, two hop side scatter. So we've been able to ascribe a propagation mode that's probably uh, too little known by the amateur community by using spectral spread from FST4W. Now we look at the 3,702 kilometer path from Santa Rosa to Maui. We have two modes to identify. Pylab ray tracing showed that mode AI5 was most likely two hop F2 layer propagation during daytime. The median spectral spreading was 266 millihertz, very similar to a two hop path to Long Island, New York at 277 millihertz. But it would be interesting to further study uh, the spectral spreads over land and over sea on two hop paths. And what is clear is that spectral spread on two hop paths is over twice that of one hop paths. As to why? Well, that's another topic to study. But what of I6? 
It has a lower SNR, some 45 dB below that of 2-hop propagation. It's not side scatter, as its median spectral spread of about 83 millihertz is typical of single-hop propagation. Now, Pylap did suggest that single-hop refraction may have been possible, but it was fleeting in the model lasting only for tens of minutes, not four hours, as we saw in the observations. Now, might it be ionospheric scattering? Might it be other some other mode? Uh, that would be interesting for us uh, to consider. Now, changing our operating area to the transatlantic, I look at three paths from here in Southampton, UK. First, we look at a comparative pair, a mid-latitude path to WA2TP Long Island and a transauroral oval path to VY0ERC Eureka on Ellesmere Island. The map shows the paths with an overlay of the far UV auroral glow from a US defense satellite to indicate the typical position of the auroral oval over central Greenland. Now, the left scatter plot clearly shows higher spectral spread on the transauroral oval path, that is the purple squares, versus the mid-latitude path, the green dots to Long Island. Now, looking at the scatter plot on the right of spectral spread on the y-axis against Kp, a geomagnetic disturbance index on the x-axis, this shows that decodes were far more numerous when Kp was at or below two than when it was three or above. As Kp increased, there were fewer instances of modest below 400 millihertz spread, and it's likely that many signals at Kp over two had spreads of over 900 millihertz off the top of this graph and not decoded, too much spread for FST to 4W to decode. The third transatlantic path, and my final example, is over the almost 7,000 kilometer path from Southampton, UK, to Houston, Missouri, and K6 RFT. The scatter plot top right of spectral spread against time of day with spreads mostly between four and 600 millihertz, either side of 1200 UTC, suggests three or four hop F2 layer propagation. Now, far more intriguing is this cluster here around 0800 UTC, when almost the entire path was in darkness. And especially interesting was a tight cluster of nine spots with less than 100 millihertz spread on the 18th of February, as a spread of 100 millihertz or less is what I've come to associate with one hop propagation. The spectral spread against SNR scatterbot shows top left here that some of the decodes with less than 100 millihertz spread had far higher SNR than those around midday via three or four hops. Now, Pylab suggests here that ionosphere to ionosphere caudal hop mode could have been present around 0800 UTC, and perhaps those with low spread and SNR below perhaps minus 15 were indeed via caudal hop. And speculatively, but perhaps not unreasonably, those with low spread and the very highest SNR propagated in a duct between the F layer and the top of the E layer with less absorption than if the signal partly traveled through the lower ionosphere as in a caudal hop. So to summarize, FST4W is certainly not just of use on the LF and MF bands. Its 122nd variant is capable of global paths with the right equipment. FST4W's option to estimate spectral spread should be a tick box. It should be in capitals, bold and underlined. I really do think it is that useful. It brings a new measurement capability to low cost amateur radio citizen science. Spectral spread estimates make FST4W a propagation analyzer and not merely a reporter.
I've shown how simple scatter plots and time series of spectral spreading can identify several HF propagation modes from simple one and two hop F2 layer refraction to two hop side scatter and ionosphere to ionosphere modes. It'll be fascinating to use FST4W to study the response of the fast depletion replenishment of the region below the F layer peak during the 2023 and 24 solar eclipses. As for what equipment you'll need, that's the subject of Rob's upcoming talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. That was a very interesting and excellent talk. Uh, I, I think uh, it's really nice to see uh, those sorts of measurements being made and your analysis is just excellent. Uh, so let's bring Rob up um, and I'll go ahead and uh, run. Uh, you can get the question from Pat over there while I bring up Rob's talk. Um, this actually makes up with both this talk and the previous talk. A lot of my friends in Houston are flying uh, Pico balloons with FTA, and uh, you know there's an option to fly a lot of these uh, during the eclipse from the eclipse path through Texas. And I'm wondering if these would be useful transmitters for this kind of uh, experiment. When do you want to say anything? Did you hear that? Uh, sorry, there, there was. Well, <laughs> That there's so much echo on uh, from the room. Could you repeat the substance of the question? Uh, yes, Dr. Pat Wright asked, uh, would it make sense to fly these transmitters on a series of balloons uh, to study the eclipse? Uh, quite possibly, QRP labs do make tiny versions uh, that certainly can be carried by low cost uh, party balloons. Uh, VE3KCL is an expert in that area, so it's certainly a possibility, Pat. Great. Well, let's uh, give uh, Gwyn one more round of applause. And now we'll uh, go over to Rob, who will uh, follow on with the part about the transmitters. Thank you, Nathaniel. And thank you, Gwyn, uh, who's been a key collaborator and uh, with me on, on uh, many projects, including this one. Um, I'm, uh, I think Gwen's discussion has shown the value of uh, a potential value in propagation analysis of the FSD4W uh, mode. And uh, also showed that there are many sites uh, already listening for 4W transmissions. Uh, you saw uh, sites from uh, Maui uh, to, uh, well, at least, uh, to, to, well, there are sites in Europe, all listening 24-7 for 4W. So uh, the received sites are there. They're uh, running my Whisper Demon software. Uh, they're all Kiwi SDRs, which are, uh, so, some of which are now GPS disciplined, but the, even the ones that are just using the uh, built-in standard uh, CP, uh, GPS Referencing those standard Kiwis are accurate enough to provide the kind of data analysis that uh, Gwen was able to do. But um, what we're lacking then are our transmitters. Um, in, in order to, uh, there, there's really very few, there's been very little use of the 4W transmission mode, uh, in part because of a chicken and the egg. The, the way the WSJTX implements the, uh, the uh, reception and transmission is if you go to 4W mode, that's all you transmit and that's all you receive. You transmit one type of mode, you can receive one type of mode. So if you're a receive site and you switch to 4W, you're going to get almost no receive, uh, spot because there are almost no transmitters. The one exception being my friend and colleague, uh, Elmer Muster, who's joined us here at HN3 AGE, he has been transmitting uh, FSD4W from his QTH uh, in Long Island on all bands for months now. So uh, we now can use it. We've been using his site to verify that our received network is ready to receive 4W transmission. So, uh, but how do we how do we make that possible? Now we solve the receive problem. Now we need to solve the transmit problem. 
Elmer is a tremendous experimenter and has uh, developed his own hardware. But for the large community, especially if we want to use 4W in the, uh, during the solar eclipse, we need a, a solution, a transmission solution that is as easy to deploy as uh, the received solutions, the Kiwi SDRs or the SDR plays or whatever, you know, there are many SDRs available. So I'm here to talk about a low cost option for tr uh, transmitting 4W uh, and, and actually have two, two options. Uh, it needs to be something that, that is it's easy to deploy as some of the uh, existing low cost transmission devices, uh, uh, Zach Tech, $150 Zach Tech, the, um, and many people use the uh, the uh, QRP labs, U3Ss. Of course, some people use their transmit their their transceivers, but uh, that's a, a a very expensive and cumbersome way uh, to to transmit and receive uh, whisper. So I'm looking for looking for a a low cost, easy to deploy uh, uh, transmission system transmitter system. Uh, led me to, well, I was going to say that there are a tremendous number of people, candidates out there to add transmitters. If you look at this chart from one of our websites, the associated website, this is whisper.live, one of Arnie's many charts, you can see that there's 3,177 uh, tra uh, transmitters, and this is in the last, I think this is the last, uh, most seven hours or uh, seven days on, on, on 40 meters. So there's thousands of transmitters out there, uh, and, and uh, you know, 1,700 different whisper receive sites. But no, almost none of these sites, uh, apart from the 40 or 50 uh, whisper demon receive sites, almost none of them are ready for 4W. So how do we get them uh, to this? There, there, there are all these paths. This is another page from uh, from uh, Arnie's uh, Grafana pages. Uh, this actually is an interactive page, and you can go and spin the globe around and look at the, all the paths that have been uh, being uh, uh, communicated over uh, over any period of time. How do you how do we get not only North America and Europe, but the many uncovered part of the parts of the world, south the southern parts, the southern hemisphere in particular? How do we get signals and and uh, recordings of, of uh, transmission? In the uh, southern cap hemisphere, well, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the there are uh, let's see this one got chopped up. I don't know why. But anyway, there there are these are the receive sites. Some of the receive sites that already exist. We've just deployed a uh, such a receive site in Tasmania. So that's a GPS, GPS discipline site in the first one in the southern hemisphere. But we have a, a good. Uh, Two dozen or more in the northern hemisphere, but we need need a, a wider distribution of them. So uh, the transmit uh, solution that I'm going to uh, uh, introduce you to, and I will be demonstrating it live uh, here in the demo hall tomorrow, consists of there's actually two options. The the, the first one is this small device. This is a, a device called the QDX, and this is a product maybe a year old. Uh, manufactured by QRP Labs, Ham Summer. Uh, this is a, a full-on digital mode transceiver, transmitter and receiver. Five watts output on transmit. Uh, you need to pair it up with a uh, associated WHJTX machine. Uh, with uh, a Pi Four is a perfect par uh, uh, a partner to this. And in, in to make it useful for 4W transmissions. The built-in, very high quality oscillator, but it is not high enough quality for 4W. So it needs an external oscillator, uh, a GPS DO. And in this case, like many other cases, I'm driving this one with a, a, a mini Wagner. Uh, we are looking to, which dominates the cost. This, this device as a kit is $80. Uh, the case costs $20. And even I am capable of soldering this thing together. It's a, a, and, and my soldering skills are very modest. He also sells it built, pre-built, but uh, you have to wait several months uh, to, to get one pre-built. But this is a, a device that I think is well within the budget and the skill uh, set of many, many hands. And it, uh, it's a, a joy to use. 
it's a you know very easy to use and please you know i'll be out, out on the table uh, uh tomorrow afternoon and i'll be able to show you how it works another option which has uh, a different set of features benefits and and, and limitations so uh, is this device which is a uh, single board computer from both hansen and r0 in copenhagen this is a actually a full-on transmitter well, it's more than a transmitter. You can use it as a GPS DO. But uh, you, you give this five volts, a GPS antenna, and a transmit antenna. Here I'm using a little, uh, uh, you know, a uh, Wi-Fi antenna as a uh, demonstration of it. But those three connections to this, this thing comes up and puts out 20 milliwatts of effort, very high stability and accuracy for W. It's amazingly uh, accurate. Not as good as a Wagner, not quite as good as Wagner. Uh, the spread on this runs at about maybe uh, maybe 30 millihertz uh, at 10 meters. So you know it's a uh, in, in the bands of interest down to 20 to 20 meters. The uh, spectral spread introduced by the transmitter. This is a transmitter will be on the order of 15 millihertz. That's a small fraction of the the uh, spectral spreads that. Uh, that uh, Gwen was uh, using in his investigations. Uh, this does only put out 20 milliwatts and it does require a filter on the output, but Bose 20 meter, uh, 20, uh, 20 meter transmission, 20 milliwatt, 20 meter transmissions are regularly, regularly received by Phil in Tasmania and by uh, another one of our collaborators, uh, Peter in, in Missouri. So, 20 milliwatts is, is enough power to make useful 4W observations on the high frequency bands. So I think we have two options. I mean, I, the, the better one I think for most people is the QDX. Uh, the, uh, you, you can, it does involve, it, 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 as it's delivered normally, it does have a, a capacitor that you have to remove to uh, solder a pigtail onto it. I, my understanding is that hounds will uh, not solder in that capacitor, so it makes it even easier to tack your your pigtail onto the uh, uh, onto the circuit board. So, uh, and I suppose if enough people were interested in deploying these, uh, it probably could induce Hans or somebody to uh, to to actually do the modifications required. Uh, so you didn't even have to do that. I, I was able to recruit one of my friends to <laughs> the make the modifications uh, for me. Uh, this is the, as you see, here is the, uh, the uh, RF0 board. Uh, it's $80 assembled. I, mine arrived in two or three days. It's a full development environment. It, 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 so he provides a whole host of different uh, kinds of application programs. So this is a kind of STEM-like uh, toolkit for students even. Uh, it's a, it's a, a wonderful device. And uh, I think, it, I think it, if these subjects interest you, uh, I encourage you to, uh, to consider getting one of them. That doesn't require any solder. You can just plug it in and start using it. Um, we have considered, now the point for us, for my group of Whisper Demon users, is that we want to utilize these trans transmitters to try to aid the, uh, the solar eclipse observations. So several of us are planning to deploy these devices or perhaps even an enhanced version of this uh, by going out to the, uh, the, uh, the path of the eclipse, of the, the totality of the eclipse in October. And ideally, and we're even considering uh, creating a version based upon this kind of technology that transmitted simultaneously on all bands. So that we take a single head fed uh, vertical uh, and feed into it uh, 80, 40, 30, 20, maybe not 30, 20, 15, and so on. All those simultaneously for every two minute whisper cycle. So that for the duration, you know, the duration of the measurement period, there would be a constant availability of Four W signals from several transmit sites. I'm considering some places in northern Utah. Uh, Clint uh, K7OEI is uh, looking at southern Idaho, uh, southern uh, Idaho. I don't know. 
no, Utah, he lives in Utah. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Elmer is considering going to someplace, I don't know where. I mean, we would, we would like to find some transmit sites along that path, right in the center of the path. And we have received sites that will be able to document these uh, and record. We will save recordings, not just the spot values, but also wave file recordings of all of these things will be stored away for later analysis. So that's why I'm asking what format do you guys want them in? If, you, if they're going to be used by researchers in post-processing, I want to make sure that we create them in a form that's possible. But the software to do that and the infrastructure is all in place. So, uh, so we have received with these devices in, in some form, uh, we have tr transmitters, we already have the receivers in place, and we look forward to making uh, significant contributions uh, to this. Uh, so there's, a, a, you know, there are other dimensions to measurements that we could make that we haven't really discussed. And I won't go into much detail because I think I've run out of time. But uh, one of the other, we've, we've explored the, the Doppler shift on 4W or the really at, uh, spectral spread is, is very closely related, but not exactly, to, I think, uh, Doppler shift. But in addition, we're looking at time of flight by, by uh, disciplining and determining exact transmit times. The Kiwis are capable of making and recording timestamps with 99 second accuracy. So we can, we can timestamp the recordings. And what we need to do with one of these devices is, is time to, to, to determine the transmit time with similar accuracy. So I think I'm probably run Oh, it's great. Time. Yeah, I will be and for questions. I'll be here for the duration. I'm going to have a demo table by the entrance door uh, tomorrow afternoon. I'll have all this set up and running. Please come by. I can discuss this and we can discuss uh, the uh, work that uh, Gwen has done. And I'll be interested in hearing from you and, and seeing if there's any others who are willing to help contribute. And we're going to be, well, it's easy for us on the West Coast to do this uh, fall, help on this fall and put up uh, transit. The real challenge will be the East Coast because that's a long drive for me in an RV. <laughs> so, you know, the, the April of, of 24, uh, it would be great to have uh, similar transmit sites along the uh, uh, along the uh, eclipse path. Elmer will, of course, be there, I'm sure, uh, because he lives on my bed. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think really presentations really highlight how we can push forward the uh, measurement technology using the modes we have now. Yeah. And this really, Wynn and Rob, they really represent just whole amateur effort. They're not being funded um, by any, uh, this is wholly amateur, they're not associated with the university. So this is really amazing. I, 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 yeah, I think we can claim to be true citizen scientists. I agree. <laughs> We have that. I have no, I have only commercial background and not, not in radio, so I don't have uh, any scientific background in this area. So, the, uh, and Nathaniel, uh, it, it, it deserves credit here. I hope you all realize he reached out to me, and, 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 and I'm here because Nathaniel, you contacted KPH uh, back in four years ago mm -hmm. and said, Could you help with the eclipse? I don't think we ever did really help with that <laughs> eclipse a bit. But but Nathaniel reaching out to us and, and that reach out the reaching out effort I think is a is a great uh, a, a great uh, contribution to our uh, to our hobby. It's more than much more than a hobby passion. Okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Rob. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Wesley Taylor. I am an undergraduate student at Millersville University, and today I will be presenting for you a little something that I've been working on for the past few months. Uh, I've titled it Project Halo. You'll see why shortly. It is, an, as was described earlier, it is an effort to provide continuous observation of the April 8th, 2024 total solar eclipse. So for background information, the boundary layer is the first kilometer of the atmosphere above the surface heavily influenced by surface air interactions. This is driven mostly by turbulent atmospheric motions. Now, what we've been seeing mostly today has been what you see here, the ionosphere. Um, 
But this little uh, red rectangle down here, that's where we are, and that's what we're investigating. <laughs> it puts it into perspective. So over the course of the diurnal cycle, the atmosphere becomes more turbulent or more stable based upon incoming solar radiation uh, here on insulation and the lack thereof, respectively. During the daytime, this generated instability helps to contribute to thunderstorm formation. At night, the stable layer that forms contributes to fog development. And this is, is uh, as you would expect, entirely driven by this insulation with the uh, convective mixed layer in green uh, where turbulence tends to form and the uh, dark gray area near the surface, the stable layer. And it is in this stable layer that uh, is of particular interest to us today. Uh, total, uh, total solar eclipses reduce insulation at the surface with the full extent of their effects under extensive research with each additional eclipse. Uh, the, uh, the formation of a temporary stable layer has been recorded during the August 21st, 2017 total solar eclipse by Turner et al., but the mechanisms by which it operates remains relatively poorly understood. So you can see here, uh, in this diagram, it, uh, this conceptual model is showing the formation of the mixed layer before it collapses under the effects of the eclipse to form a very small, brief, stable layer before returning to the mixed layer. So what exactly is HALO? It stands for Heliophysical and Atmospheric Analysis of Lunar Obstruction. The current primary research objective is to observe surface and boundary layer conditions under the effects of a total solar eclipse with relation to their interactions with the atmosphere and solar angle. Um, the current expected results would indicate that as latitude increases, the temperature inversion increases with strength, as solar angle decreases and atmospheric thickness increases. The secondary objective would be to create a continuous set of observations of the sun's corona, which will be visible during the eclipse. Um, so we have done current, uh, so we have done a lot of research, but uh, it is in nature extensive. It includes everything from animal behavior to meteorological observations of various types, whether that be the uh, just general or cloud cover versus non-cloud cover. Um, all of this information I have included at the end of the slideshow if there are any pieces of information you would like uh, greater clarity on later. But uh, for the sake of time at this moment, I am choosing to move ahead with the slideshow. Uh, again, at the end of the presentation, please ask questions. So our current proposed research plan is to utilize a uh, tethered weather balloon system. So to do this, we plan to stretch a nylon rope to 100 meters at the 50 meter and 100 meter marks, SONs, which are small meteorological instruments designed to measure atmospheric temperature, pressure, and uh, if it, they are designed as such, also water vapor and wind speed. And so our plan is to attach um, them at the 50 meter and 100 meter marks. A third sonde will be placed in a cover uh, at around two meters above the surface to uh, attempt to bl block out some of the uh, higher effects of the near surface interactions. The rope would then be lifted into the air by a 100 gram weather balloon for the duration of the eclipse and for some time afterwards. The rope can then be reeled in after data collection to retrieve the sons and balloon for further reuse. Uh, as far as logistics are concerned, um, we have done some uh, research into where we would want to place observation teams. Uh, the goal is to have one group site underneath the eclipse during the entirety of the eclipse throughout the United, Sta uh, the United States. 
An important note is that the more north the observatory, the more stretched out the eclipse uh, shadow, which means that the sites in the northern states will be spread out further than those in the southern states. And as you can see here in this graph, uh, uh, the umbral shadow is here along the uh, track of the eclipse path. So what we would do, what uh, our goal is, is that as one group is exiting the eclipse, another group is entering it for the entire duration of the eclipse. So for, so this map shows the approximate locations of sites we would want scattered across the United States. The minimum total number of teams we would need for this to work is around 32. Um, on the slide, there is a breakdown by state, but as you can see, we would need several, <laughs> uh, many uh, observation sites uh, in order to pull this off. Um, as far as potential biases are concerned that we have already identified, as the eclipse progresses, the length of the totality decreases with time. The further into the event observations are taken, the less radiational cooling a location will experience. Um, uh, you could see it somewhat on the previous graph, but I will uh, repeat it to you here for convenience. Uh, as the eclipse is entering Texas, the total length of the eclipse uh, totality is around four minutes and 30 seconds, but the time it en uh, exits Maine and enters Canada for the final time, the length of the totality will be about three minutes and 30 seconds. So that's a minute difference uh, between uh, the start and end times for the eclipse. In addition, topography may also influence the effectiveness of how the boundary layer responds. Uh, due to higher elevations having less atmospheric pressure. Inclement weather patterns are also of consideration. Uh, lake effect weather may also reduce the efficiency of observations taken downwind of the Great Lakes due to lake effect cloud formation. And uh, as, as a potential countermeasure, because uh, we know clouds affect temperature variation. I mean, it's cloudy outside today. Who likes this cloudy day? Raise your hand. Okay, we have one, two, two takers. <laughs> uh, but thankfully, a modulus could be applied as a result of uh, Dodson et al's work to reduce the effect of this variation. Uh, the So the effect uh, by their work, or, uh, this modulus basically in under areas affected by cloud, the radiational cooling experience is reduced by about a factor of root two. So if that holds, it, you should be able to apply it on a, a, a large scale observational basis in order to help reduce any effects and hopefully draw out the uh, conclusions that we are aiming to receive. Um, now to transition to the future of this project. So why is our primary research objective important? Uh, practically, solar eclipses have been shown to have a marked impact on solar panels. HALO will provide further research towards determining how latitude affects twilight solar panel efficiency. Um, applying the same concept to the ionosphere, it may be possible to analyze ionospheric reactions to the eclipse as a function of latitude as well. E.g., uh, example granted, the ionospheric bow wave or LSTID as detected in 2017 by Zhang et al., which others have already uh, gone over in the previous session. And you can see the effects clearly in the diagram on the right. If integrated into the project, ham radio signal detection could also be utilized to monitor the effects of any temporary atmospheric ducting that occurs as a result of the temporary stable boundary layer. Uh, and uh, to summarize what that would entail, it would basically mean that any signals sent out near the surface could then potentially also be received further away because of the more stable atmospheric layer. 
In addition, data, uh, data collected can provide critical initialization information for weather model development, which would be otherwise very, very, very difficult to obtain because eclipses don't happen often. Um, how can our project be expanded? Although our primary research objective is our highest priority, the hope is to create a multidisciplinary research endeavor branching out from just meteorology. High priority topics include continuous monitoring of the solar corona, atmospheric compositional dynamics, in addition to ionospheric anomalies, animal behavior anomalies, gravitational anomalies, and any other potentially relevant studies. Uh, for not, uh, the non-research benefits of this project, this provides an excellent platform for public communication about atmospheric weather and space weather sciences. This grants research experience and materials for those at every level of professional experience. And it also provides a medium for collaboration between various sectors under the meteorology umbrella, which I will happily say includes uh, this conference. Uh, so what then could the future of Project Halo look like? Ideally, we want our project to be a coalescing endeavor. Alone, we lack the resources and manpower to execute HALO. Um, our program at, the, at, our, at Millersville is uh, relatively large in comparison to other programs. Even if we, if we were to attempt to man every single station, it, it would just be unfeasible. We don't have the resources. We don't have the manpower. You would want minimum three people per team. We would barely be able to have two if we're lucky. So we can't do this alone. Um, as of now, HALO is planned to be a student organized event. We are not unopposed to giving another the mantle if said interest is expressed. The utilization of surface paced public, the surface based publicly gathered data may help validate measured changes. And uh, we plan on all team gathered data to be made public through some medium so that others may study what is recorded. So we hope to make this an open source endeavor. Um, I would like to make some acknowledgements uh, to Alex and Nicole who have traveled with me here today, Melody, Allison, and Joshua who could not, without their help, I would not, this would have never gotten off the ground. I would also like to thank some of my professors from uh, my university being uh, Dr. Richard Clark, Dr. Sapita Yelva, and Dr. Greg Bloomberg. Without their support, again, we would not have been able to make it here today. And then I would also like to thank the event organizers, including uh, Dr. Nathaniel Prissel, because uh, he really helped us out. Uh, so here is our list of sources. <laughs> and uh, thank you for your time. We would be glad to hear your feedback now or at the uh, email listed on screen. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, so I imagine like these, these songs you got about launching um, that this kind of data is collected fairly regularly in other in other ways for other purposes. Um have you compared this to previous efforts to gather data during eclipses? Like is this the first time anybody has attempted to put these along the eclipse plan? So it's not that it's the first time that they it's actually not the first time that there are attempts to do this. So what you so uh, from what I've gathered in previous eclipses uh, regarding um, these songs, which are uh, radio songs, which are more experimental, or the uh, no radio songs are the more uh, commercially utilized. Wind songs are more in their experimental phase. Uh, so what you use. So what you do is you take a uh, anywhere between a uh, 30 to, I think I've seen as low as 10 to 100 gram weather balloon, and then you fill it with helium, launch it into the air, and it collects data in what is known as a skew-t diagram. And these are done at hundreds of observation sites across the country every day. They're known as uh, METAR observation sites. 
uh, you can, I believe you can pretty much find them on any aviation map if you look for them. However, uh, the, th the thing is when you launch, um, when you launch one of these balloons, that uh, there's about a 20% recovery rate for these songs because they just go straight into the atmosphere and then they land wherever. There's no real control over it. And so for an experiment to look ex almost exclusively at the boundary layer, you would you really just want the first kilometer or less of observations when if you launch one of these uh, balloons, you're collecting about, you could be collecting 30 kilometers of data and effectively the 29 kilometers above the surface would as, at least for this experiment, uh, not really be useful. So it's for that reason why we are planning on using tethered weather balloons rather than just simply releasing the weather balloons because the data we want is at the surface, not higher in the atmosphere. Yes? Um, two questions. One, apologies if you got to this and talk and I missed it. What's your ballpark for uh, regular cost for each system? Okay, I should have included that slide. <laughs> <laughs> um, order of magnitude per team. Um, so each radio sound you would be looking at would be would cost around two hundred dollars. Uh, you would be using three of them. However, again, given the relatively low recovery rate, being used to, being able to use the same instrumentation twice helps a lot. <laughs> So um, there is, I believe, an upfront initial cost of around, I would say, I would hedge on the uh, close to $1,000 per team, not including travel costs. Um, unfortunately, uh, I, despite how my efforts to look for it, I have not been able to find the pricing of an antenna receiver. Those, I expect, are not cheap. However, I will keep digging for those, and hopefully I will be able to uh, provide you with an answer uh, at some point in the future. Sure, yeah, I think that uh, I speak for most of the case folks when I say I think we'd be interested in being one of your Ohio teams. Um, we have a farm. We do, yeah, that could work. Well, that kind of brings me to my next question, because we also have an airport. Uh, so I know when doing balloon sat launches, there's a weight limit below which you don't need to worry about, you know, um, apprising anyone essentially. Uh, how does that work for tethered balloons? That is a very, that is a very interesting question because uh, depending on who I ask, I receive different answers. <laughs> ah. uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so obviously we want to avoid airports if possible. Um, uh, there is a, a section in the CFRs, the Code of Federal Regulations, that specifically specifies that. And I can give you the citation to it uh, at, uh, afterwards uh, or by email. Uh, okay. I was one of the questioners. Uh, I, I, first, uh, I had a uh, uh, more of a comment. We travel to solar eclipses um, and have done it on a couple of continents. Um, you will find really interesting uh, observations of, of wind patterns and stuff while, while this occurs, both uh, and not just right at the uh, the darkness of the of the eclipse. Uh, and so I think you're on to something there. Uh, would that be in reference to the so-called, uh, I think it's called the eclipse wind yeah, or eclipse, eclipse low-level jet? There, there's eclipse winds, uh, there's, there's an, uh, animal activity as well, and uh, it, while it isn't visible to you at your eye because your eye adjusts, there actually is a, you should make measurements of the intensity of the solar radiation because uh, it, it comes down over a long about an hour before on them, and then it does get dark, and then an hour back up. Mm -hmm. Do you have time for more? Um, I think it's time to go to the next slide. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for your time again.
Next, we have Dr. Christina Collins, and she's going to be presenting on the potential anti Doppler observations for inferring solar flare effects on the atmosphere. May I have that for a second? <laughs> I like to emphasize that as Dr. Christina Collins would give her round of applause. Dr. Christina Collins, who uh, graduated this past fall, uh, defended her dissertation in November. Uh, she is the first uh, PhD student who has been funded by an anti activity. Wow. Another paper expected. So, on the great observation. So, take it away. Thank you. All right. So, um, get my clock there. I speak into the owl. Is this correct? <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. So, this is uh, sort of the first of a couple of talks here. Uh, Shabaji will also be following up on some uh, some similar things in this vein, and. Uh, what I want to talk about today is the context of the data that we've been collecting with the grape one systems and to show one of the science use cases that is emerging from this. Uh, if you are out there and you are maintaining a grape station, you should know that your data is turning out to be interesting, it is getting used, and it is being made available. Uh, and some of the key points that I want to make here, and I realize in a lot of respects, I am preaching to the choir directors, but it is extremely important that uh, the data that we have from these stations is available in this, uh, in the peer reviewed literature in a way that is open access that is, uh, is possible for people to get to, and that the data uh, fulfills the go fair standard of findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. The data set is uh, being collected through um, an FTP server run by the WWV Amateur Radio Club, and it is uploaded periodically to Zenodo, which is a fair data repository, which I recommend. I think the Project Halo folks were talking about uh, ensuring that the data is archived. Make sure that it fulfills the standard when you do uh, for any of these projects so that people can get to it in the future uh, and figure out what any of it means. There is also available software, many thanks to Nathaniel and to Aidan Monterre and others, uh, including Bob Benedict for their help in developing that. And all of that is reported in that paper that Nathaniel mentioned where I am now changing uh, commas to semicolons and back again. So again, if you are uh, collecting data with your a grape of your own, I wonder if there's a way that I can scoot this so you can see what point four is. Um, then we will need to know that we will want and need to continue collecting data for several years to support this analysis and other analyses, in particular to uh, ensure that there's enough data going through the entirety of solar cycle 25 that we can catch interesting things as they happen. And uh, I'd like this to be considered as something of an exemplar of HAMS collecting scientifically usable data. So. For the uh, the hams in the room particularly, and in keeping with our theme of forging amateur and professional connections, uh, this was a paper that I gave at the fall meeting, or the, a poster I gave at the fall meeting of the American Geophysical Union in December, and it has all of these digital object identifiers, DOI numbers, that show the different uh, papers that cover the arc of the Grape One project. So if you've been attending HAMSI historically, you've seen these come up in one place or another. Top left, we have an article that summarizes ham radio and the role of ham radio in space science. Then we have our pilot experiment, the original WWV Festival of Frequency Measurement, which we covered in a paper that you can get to here. This was the open hardware paper, Gibbons et al., which covers how the, uh, the grape version one was made. Uh, and how you can make your own, which a number of people here, I think, built their grape one stations using that as the documentation. And then this uh, is the preprint DOI for the paper that summarizes the data set. So all of this tells this story and it builds upon itself uh, in this iterative way. If you'd like to get a closer look at this poster, then there's a DOI for the poster itself right there. So that's the, the landscape of this data set that we have. And now I'm gonna talk about uh, one of the things that we can do with this. 
So first I'll talk about uh, the impact of solar flares in the ionosphere and on radio waves. I'm going to do this at a very basic level and uh, any questions I deem too hard will be kicked to Shibaji. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then I'm going to show you just a couple of preliminary plots. Hopefully we'll have some, uh, you know, some more in the future uh, and talk about our plan for how we're going to use the grape one data to characterize uh, Doppler flash. So here's our little cartoon of a uh, solar flare. Um, and the, uh, I just realized I don't have any of my notes. Oh, well. Uh, so there are the what we're interested in looking at uh, are these transient events so things where you have a plot of some uh some parameter you know be it tec or in our case doppler shift or something else and there is just this sudden you know step function that appears in that uh and sudden uh frequency deviation etc um that's primarily what we are looking for so these are effects that you will see sometimes show up in data <coughs> Uh, this is an example of one that turned up in John's data at node one. So on the left, we have his data on five megahertz from a, uh, a solar flare that was an X-class flare on October 28th of 2021. And that is what you see right here. So uh, one point to be made, the, the blue dots are the unfiltered data, the orange is the filtered data. Um, and this is kind of an open question for people looking at data from the grape ones. We've talked about, you know, maybe if your uh, received amplitude is too low, you can't get anything good out of it. But we have this very, very clear uh, signal once it's gone through the filtering, although you can see the, um, you can see it seeking. You can see also when the transient is, even though on the amplitude plot, that received signal is very low. So that's something to look at. Um, so that's when you look at one station, when you take several stations and put them together over on the right, this is actually 10 megahertz data from a bunch of different grape stations. Um, and what I wanna draw your attention to is this frequency plot. This is color mapped by station longitude. And uh, there's actually a pretty clear longitude dependence in how big this jump in frequency is. So that's the Doppler flash that's seen there. And we've been able to detect this for uh, a number of flares. It shows up fairly reliably in the plots that I've run. And actually later in the same day, there's a C-class flare that, uh, that turns up in this spot that you can measure with the, um, with the data from the grapes. So the advantages of this as an instrument are that you have high spatial resolution and that it's taking data at a one second cadence. So, uh, as Shibaji will talk about, this compares to uh, data from super darn radars, um, where we're looking particularly at the uh, ground scatter. And here is an example of uh, Doppler flash signature in a super darn observation. So in the, uh, we take sort of the comic panels from here to here to here going through, and we just grab these three you can see there's this sudden enhancement and it goes, the velocity uh, measurement goes positive very strongly here and then disappears and then goes negative. And so that's pretty much the whole picture that you can get from super darn. So it is uh, a four minute cadence as opposed to the one second cadence that we have for our instruments. And we're hoping that we can get some more information out of it. Um, by looking at the grape data as well. Um, let's see. So, yeah. Ah, right, okay. So for, uh, for what we were planning to do here, um, there's a paper that Shibaji put together prop uh, that proposes a mechanism of Doppler flash um, relating to the change in uh, two phenomena. There's the change in D region refractive index on the top there, and then there's the change in F region reflection height, which is usually what we have assigned uh, most of our things that we've observed with the grape one to the latter phenomenon. So we are hoping to, uh, so to do a statistical study on several different flares uh, over the years that we have data from and uh, do a do statistics on those. So we're going to try to get you know some number of uh, M class 
and X class and C class flares. Here is the uh, the closer comparison to super darn uh, the goes irradiance plot showing when this flare was. And then here's the uh, the Doppler plot. So you'll notice that this peak is associated with the point at which the irradiance is rising. Um, initial plan for this is that we will essentially take the uh, the Doppler plot and integrate using the start maximum and end times that NOAA provides just as a first pass. When exactly it goes from positive to negative in the Doppler shift is, seems to vary by station, um, but that will at least be a beginning just to integrate, you know, look at the area under the plot and see um, what that maps to in terms of energy deposition during those phases of the solar flare. So we have a complete list of X, M, and C class flares occurring during the time that we have data. And uh, we are hoping to continue collecting data from the grapes um, over the next uh, the next couple of years in order to gather more. So uh, some other notes about this in context of uh, grape versus super darn. Uh, one thing about the way that super darn works with the ground scatter, it that models, as does the grape, a radio propagation path where you have uh, the radio wave is going up and it's coming down. But with super darn, it goes up, comes down, reflects, and then does the path again. So it has to go through twice as many hops. And the uh, it is a monostatic system, whereas the grape, WWV being on one end, your receiver being on the other, is a bistatic system. Uh, and that's one of the things that gives it a little bit better dynamic range because it doesn't have to get attenuated twice. So our next steps will be to uh, use the data set to study the statistics and uh, hopefully also look at magnetometer uh, impacts. So furthermore, if anybody has solar flare measurements, especially from that date or other dates that they would like to compare, please, uh, you know, find us at the break. Um, so again, key points, the PSWS network is beginning to pay scientific dividends. Please keep collecting data. Uh, this is one of hopefully many opportunities in the near future for ham radio operators to do meaningful science uh, through this and other opportunities. And thanks very much. And this may be slightly off topic, but with the great uh, you collect both man and monitor data and uh, RF data, uh, uh, what's the purpose of power and how the power is the comparison between those, those pieces of data? Uh, that, mm hmm. Well, grape two will be doing that. So uh, that that's an interesting one, and um, I welcome input from folks on the. I welcome input from folks on the magnetometer side. This is one of the uh, I think the key insights of the PSWS as a modular instrument is that you can have different parts of it, and uh, you can connect. Um, you know, you can connect multiple observations to one station and add things in at different times. Um, a big advantage of the way that we've been handling the data so far is it's what's called a living data set. So you can have some data collection. And if somebody, for instance, starts collecting data after other people have been collecting data for years, or if your system goes down for a day, or if you make a change to your station, all of those things are accounted for when you do the data processing. Um, and this is generally standard among instrumentation networks. Uh, John Standard has done a really good job of making that possible for the data that we've collected from the grape one so far. Um, the, uh, for the magnetometers, I think probably we will be looking at stuff from existing magnetometer networks like Intermag and things like that in order to, um, to look for connections. Next question, John here at NAOBJ. Since we just released great version 1.12, which adds 15 megahertz WWE and it includes 2.5 to 92, 3.5, 5, 10, and 15, what is the preferred frequency that you would prefer to get for your data set? Is 2.5 or 15 or in terms of where you want to be in the band for people to look at? That's a really good question. I do not know yet. 
Um, I was interested to look at the data from like, you know, five megahertz versus 10 megahertz, because really one zigs and the other zags. Um, and the, the nice thing about this in particular is that we can make that plot where we're mapping it by longitude. And it really is kind of an aggregate measurement. So it's all of those grape stations together. Um, there's, you know, I think one or two that had spurious data that day that have been pulled out of the plot because there was, you know, obviously someone's neighbor's garage door opener. Uh, but, you know, that's the kind of thing that you can account for when it is, as we call it, a meta instrument. Um, many things working together. So I don't know exactly what's going to be the most interesting uh, frequency for any particular purpose, but I'll let you know if one comes up as, uh, you know, head and shoulders above the rest. Have you used 2.5? Uh, I don't know if I've made plots with the 2.5. You think that you think I should look at that one? Changing my one station from 2.5 to the new 15. Yeah. Is that preferable? Which node? Are, which node do you have on 2.5? You have one seven and. I have one three and seven. I think node three is on 2.5 meters. I gotta admit, I haven't used it that much. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm using one and seven a lot. Quick question. Yeah, great. On the roof at NCIC, it would be there. <laughs> do you have do you have the FTP auto upload working? No. Do you have a node number? Do yes. Okay, good. That's the first step. Um, so I, I'm curious about actually show the Docker flash if I can play actually. I'm, I'm curious about this the arbitrary power parameter. Yeah, no, that's in NGIT we have our dipole right here, like right along, it's right along an HVAC system. And I, I'm worried if it, you know if there's any use in asking an undergraduate student to be like see if that correlates well to any player acting or whatever. It's just the HVAC is there. Oh, it's an interesting point. So uh, okay, so let me say first a word about the um, the power parameter that that FL Digi is measuring. Um, we so we don't apply any scaling to it by default. If you look at the bottom plot here, everybody's like kind of got the same shape to their power plot sort of, but they're not really, you know, they're all at different amplitudes. And if you, it really that a lot of it comes down to the antenna because it's one thing if you have a, uh, a preamp on it and a nice antenna, and it's another thing if you have a wire strung up um, and also where your location is impacts it and all those sorts of things. So, uh, what we decided to do for the processing code is just leave it as is. And if you want to apply a scaling factor when you process the data, you can. Um, but generally, it kind of gives you maybe a little bit of insight about the instrumentation. And that way, you can look at it and say, OK, well, this station looks like it's getting a good signal. In the, um, the paper in Earth System Science data that's coming out, there's this great plot from John's node one where um, there's it, it goes, the years that data has been collected on one axis, Rachel showed a version of this, uh, the years the data has been collected on one axis and you have, she showed the frequency plot, there's also an amplitude plot. In the amplitude plot, there is a line where uh, John's antenna got replaced with a much better antenna and the gain just sort of gets turned up. When you look at the frequency plot, there's like a little bit of a change, but it's not nearly as noticeable. So uh, it speaks well, I think, of um, FL Digi and of the Grape One's ability to give good data, even at a relatively low um, amplitude level on the signal it's received. All right, thank you again, Dr. Cole. Thank you. Next, I'm going to show you about the channel for the we'll be presenting the viability of now passing solar and radio blackouts using super dark HF programs. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Shibaji. I'm from Virginia Tech, Superdome Group, as you can see. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to talk about the viability of now cast flare driven radio blackouts. Uh, Christina did a very really good job about introducing what is, what is the solar flare. I mean, I think I can take along under the impression like you guys understand uh, solar flare is. Uh, okay, so here is the brief outline of the talk. I'm going to talk about the anosphere. Uh, maybe you guys are not bored enough to talk hear about the anosphere <laughs> and put you in this, under the sleep again, maybe. And uh, the impact of flare in the traveling uh, radio waves or HF, uh, HF, uh, HF observations, then the instrument itself. 
a uh, couple of e one event study uh, the timing analysis from the superdan uh, observations and then use the all the analysis to how to use it as a solar flare monitor and uh, also the summary reports and finally summarize the talk mm, okay, yeah so here is the heart of our uh, heart, heart of our home sun it emits the electromagnetic radiation in the specifically in all the different wave bands, specifically in X-ray and UV spectrum. And during the solar flare, what happens is like sun suddenly emits a sudden enhance, uh, suddenly enhance the X-ray and uh, X-ray and UV uh, UV radiation, and that comes as a kind of a laser towards the rushing towards the Earth, and it 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 is called as a solar flare. And uh, so it affects the different layers of the ionosphere starting from DE and F region and also in the higher altitudes as well. Um, so here is the schematic that shows how the overall HF radio wave effects, uh, get, uh, effects affected by the uh, solar flare. So whenever the radiation comes on the day side, it, it actually um, creates a kind of different types of altitude profile in the ionosphere and that creates an attenuation at the different altitude and also the Doppler phenomena what uh, Christina talked about so and also it's 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 uh, it's a very critical uh, phenomena that actually plays a role actually it's hidden here uh, the uh, it's, it's directly evident like in the amateur radio spectrum as well so, so among the different types of flare effect the fundamental effect is called sudden anospheric disturbance I pointed out it's a day side phenomena it's not necessarily it can be observed in the night side as well, not by the flare, but other means. But what happens is the plasma density in the DE or F region suddenly gets enhanced. It's a kind of transient response to what Christina talked about. It's a step function, similar to that kind of scenario. And it creates a kind of uh, havoc in different types of instrumentation and observations. So it has got different types of manifestation. Uh, first called the radio A fade out, a short A fade out. You know, what it does is like the high, it increases the radio absorption specifically in the HF spectrum. Um, and also it comes along with the free sudden frequency deviation, which is like the sudden change in the frequency, what is manifested as a Doppler flash uh, in, in superdone data and as well as any other HF uh, amateur band or, or, or near to starting from um, three megahertz to approximately 30 or 50 megahertz around those frequencies. So, I think it's a recycle, recycled slide from Christina Stock. It's it's depicting what Superdan is. It's a monostatic amateur radio. You can think about it, uh, but it has got other type of data set as well. Um, another most primary data set, which is Superdan known for, is the ionospheric scatter. What is that? Is like on the on the schematic over shown over here on the on the on the bottom right panel over here. Uh, the rays get reflected from the ionospheric irregularity or ionospheric plasma structure, and that is called ionospheric scatter. And it is, it is primary data set from Superdan. What NSF funds Superdan is for uh, is like uh, doing research for E cross V convection mapping. But Superdan is a very useful tool, and it can be used for other kind of studies. For example, solar flare. And I just wanted to uh, point out the, this another type of data, which is like called ground scatter. During the daytime, ray gets uh, bent by the electron density of the ionosphere and reflected from the other side of the Earth ground and comes back through the same path that feeds out a one hop communication link. So it, it, it mimics kind of amateur radio link. Um, so here is the flare impact uh, on 5th May 2015. So it, it is like four minute cadence sweeps, uh, sweep of the Superdan Blackstone radar, uh, starting from 22 UT uh, till 2020 UT. And flare hit on the uh, flare peaks, uh, that particular flare peaks around uh, 2010 UT. And you can see like the ground scatter going on here uh, at that point of time. And suddenly it, it shoots up really high around 100 meter per seconds or so, which is not typical for a ground scatter because ground doesn't move around like 100 meter per second. It's like around zero uh, meter per second. So, and, and then you get this kind of scenario when you can see like the radar is not operational and it recovers back to the pre short wave fade out or pre uh, flare condition. So this part is called a uh, short wave fade out where you don't get any signal back from the other side of the ground, uh, other side of the earth. And this particular phenomena is the Doppler flash, what Christina talked about. 
And here is uh, a different way of viewing this particular phenomena uh, from the Superdon observation. It's called range time plot, uh, range time intensity plot. The x axis is time, the y axis is range, slant range. The top panel shows uh, power, backscatter power, and the bottom, uh, bottom panel shows the slant uh, the Doppler velocity. And you can clearly see it's like a radar was not operational for almost 10 to 15 minutes or so, and that's like the bite out effect of the uh, during the uh, solar flare. And here is the small blip in the velocity, it's a sudden jump around uh, 50 to 100 meter per second. Okay, so let's come to the timing analysis. So how we can time this thing? The top panel is, shows the solar flare signature in the GOES observation, uh, which is the X-ray sensor. The two different channels operating, one is called uh, uh, X-ray around 0 0.05 to 4 nan 0.4 nanometer, and another is 0.1 to 0.8 nanometer irradiance spectrum. And uh, the the and you can clearly see like the X-class flare, it's like the almost a thousand times bigger than the background radiation here. So that is significant because the Y scale axis is, the, is in the log scale. Then uh, the middle panel, panel shows here the observation from the average power from the Superdon Blackstone radar. Um, the, uh, the third panel shows the number of ground scatter echoes. Actually, you can count the number of ground scatter echoes and you can just, just plot, plot them. And that's a kind of, uh, uh, that's a kind of um, echoes in the time series format. And you can clearly see there is a number of echo drop, and then it comes back after a while in a semi-logarithmic or, or a non-linear fashion to, 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 to the background condition. And uh, here is the Doppler velocity spike, you can clearly see. And then we get a kind of blackout phase, and that's why Superdon is not very good uh, to, op it's not, it has a limitation. I should not say it's not very good, but it has a limitation while observing the Doppler flash kind of this type of phenomena because of the bite out effect. So if I just take the panel C, like which is the third panel and plot it here, there are four times associated with this particular, uh, this particular phenomena. The first is called the onset, uh, where it's like just pre-blackout phase. Then it's a start of blackout when it's significantly, you, you lost your significant amount of uh, ground scatter. It's, and then you go for a significant amount of time when you, you, you really hardly observe something in, in your data and you, you really don't know whether it's below the noise level or not. And then it, it started the recovery on the blue line and uh, the green line is pre short of fade out or it's completely ground scatter recovered. So these are the four timings and associated to those four timings, you can easily count there are three different phases. It's like the precursor of, of absorption, which is the onset, then the blackout or radio blackout when you lost your, lost your communication and then there is a gradual recovery. We have an algorithm to detect the phases of the superdone ground scatter uh, data sets uh, and time all these four timings and these three phases. So one interesting fact, which is really well, well known and it's well established since almost 100 years or so, uh, that it has a solar flare has a solar zenith angle dependence and it has been also proved in this particular data sets. Like uh, this particular event, um, the sun was on the Pacific and here is the distribution of the radar on the top, top corner here and sun was over the Pacific and the flare happened, the East Coast radars, which are Blackstone, they observe significantly less effect than the radar, which are located in the West Coast sector, which is the Christmas Valley West, which is near to the Oregon. And it, it is also evident that the signal frequency has a deep impact on the timing analysis as well. The frequency, the radars, which are operating at a higher frequency, around 15 megahertz or so, they get less impacted then the radars operating in a significantly lower frequency. It's like almost 50% higher frequency. And you can time it is like square root of that frequency is like almost uh, two times uh, uh, less impact on the Blackstone radar, which is Black BKS radar. So we can, we can actually jot down all these different information from the radar. And actually we can start looking and among all these distributed network of North American uh, landmass, all these radars, you can actually find out uh, um, or time it or near real time depiction of what's going on in these all these different radars. 
So uh, these are these are the radars were operational on a specific event, which is 2017 September flare event. Uh, I think someone picked it up this particular event uh, in, in, during the eclipse or maybe the prior talks. And it, 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 it is a remarkable week. During that, that particular week, if I'm not being wrong, there was 45 M-class flare, you don't see them, and almost uh, six or seven X-class flare. And one of the flare was like, uh, biggest during the last solar cycle, which is X9.3. And uh, I'm, I'm going to show like how the radars were responded, responding during one of the flare event. And um, these different colors are associated with the colors of my timing analysis. Green is like no, no fade out effect, red is on set, black and blue. So I'm going to play the movie and you can clearly see, you're going to observe like one of the flare that happened on the 10th of September, which is X8, X8.9 class flare. And you can clear, you, you, you're going to observe like the sun is going to move from this direction to that direction from east to west. And uh, the effect was started on the west east coast radar first, then it propagates from the east to west. So the blackout happened. Yeah, so they turned red and then black. And I think I have the video till now because this flare event was significant enough so that if I just do it real time, I do not have the enough time to show you like eight hour long solar flare effect. So yeah, so that's why I put it only that part. So the recovery also, so I, I showed you up to the blackout phase because that happened within a few minutes or so, but the recovery takes quite a long time for this particular flare because this is a huge flare. And uh, just to point out another, another I mention one more thing is like not all the radars were op either operational or the data was good enough to get identified all these different uh, phases. So you can clearly see some of them are tagged as yellow or some of them are still green. That doesn't really necessarily mean like there are no absorption or there are no uh, fade outs going on at these, these regions or so. Okay. So addition to that, we have started to log all these different uh, flare events going back to like 10 years or so. Um, and these are the summary reports we recently started generating. And these are the calendars. Th these things hasn't been put into the VT Superdan website as uh, recently, but we started developing them. So these, if you go there, you'll find uh, a calendar tagged with different colors. They list different things, different ki kinds of flares starting from X, which is dark red, then M class and, and C class and so on and so forth. I don't have a way to show you how interactive it is, but uh, if you click on either of these buttons, they, they will pop up and they will show you a summary report based on the Superdan op operational on that particular day and alongside with the goals data sets. Uh, okay, so just one more thing, it will put you a kind of brief update on the shorter fade out duration, as well as uh, the intensity, how, how intense the shorter fade out was based on the Superdan real time data. Okay, so here's the summary and uh, I'm not going to read it out. I think you can read it by yourself, but in, in a way it's like the main takeaway point from all this talk, this particular talk is like Superdan can be a fruitful tool, not for the scientific analysis, which is it's really known for, but it can also be used as an operational tool or operational field forecast kind or now cast kind of scenario where someone can get a hold of whether uh, whether an amateur person, he, he or she can get an information whether uh, a bite out in his or her data is really goes back to a solar flare or not. I think I'll stop here if you have any questions and yeah. Yes. Uh, I had a question about the Doppler flash. Okay, so it's the previous one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, we might have to show a couple slides. In. Yeah. Is that a positive, positive frequency deviation? Yes. Um. So, do you? What is the origin of that? Because if you look at 
what it should be like if, if you have a uh, <coughs> path lane, it should be negative. Like, what, what's the physics of it? What's positive? So, that? I would expect it to be a negative. Why, why do you think it should be? Because, because it's because the positive and negative. I don't know how to, but in in a, in a sense, it is moving towards you. It's a positive Doppler, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, like, it's sad. If it's if it's you're really watching it. Like, so it's it's not it's actually it. like literally rushing toward it. It's some way, but it's it's you need to get less amount of path. It's it's like rays are moving less amount of path yeah. to. Yeah, it's not physically, but in a way, it's like positive change in refractive index. Right, because there's a, you know, the top of yeah. there's, there's the movement of the the movement of the yeah. the index or refraction path. Yeah, it's refraction negative. path length is so like. I can't run my head around if it's something moving or if it's the index or refraction is dropping so fast that it gives that shift too. But I, I didn't get quite, quite get your last point. The, the index or refraction, if it yeah. drops, yeah. there's a negative in that equation. Um, and then that means to be yeah, but the part length is again like the if you if you're going into the equation is minus del p del t. So right. so the my negative in the refraction index is then get consumed by the minus. Okay. So in that sense, it's positive. Yeah, it's interesting. Okay, thank you. We have one more question. Yeah. You may send a video to share with the content. How long would the time span of video you showed us? Oh, this one is like 30 minutes or so. I have to check. Okay, so uh, let me. Oh, one hour. Sorry. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks. All right. The next huge uh, Dr. Yeah. Uh, now I'd like to welcome Shah Sawar. And he's going to be presenting a lot of study of remote doing gas and using cold hydrogen data. Thank you. Well, um, thank you, Devin, for the introduction. Um, so I hope everyone has enough caffeine in their systems to stay awake during my talk. Uh, it's 5 p.m. I can understand that. <laughs> you say hand mic. Yes. So I, the Zoom people. Okay. Perfect. Um, can you guys hear me now? Okay, perfect. So yeah, I'll be talking about the structure of the Milky Way galaxy using cold hydrogen radio data. And um, of course, my advisors are Dr. Nathaniel Frizzell. Most of you know him. And um, Dr. Mary Lou West right over there. Um, we just um, saw it earlier. All right. So I think um, a good starting point for this talk would be why is hydrogen important and how is it connected to radio signals? And the reason um, hydrogen is connected to radio signals is because I think this diagram summarizes this pretty, pretty well. And the reason they're both connected is because of a phenomenon known as the spin-flip transitions. And what happens in these spin-flip transitions is the electron changes its spin, and this, this changes the energy level of that hydrogen atom. And corresponding to that difference in energy levels, uh, we get photons of energy, uh, which correspond to 14, 20 megahertz. Now, hydrogen is really abundant in the universe, and um, it is mostly cold, around 10 kelvins. So this cold hydrogen goes through these spin flip transitions, and it allows us to observe uh, different structures, which are mostly made of hydrogen. And we can use this uh, 1420 megahertz signal to observe them. Now, the cool thing about uh, 1420 megahertz, it falls right between the radio uh, portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, and hence my astronomy talk at this conference in this radio conference. All right, so before I um, get a little deep into what I'm actually doing, I think I it's time to show you some pretty pictures. Um, so on the left is um, a picture of the Milky Way galaxy photographed from the Earth. And this is taken by Mary Duca in New Jersey. And um, you can see the, the structure of the Milky Way um, from picture from the Earth. And the picture on the right is taken by Omar Radwan in New Jersey. And the structures of those two galaxies are pretty similar. 
And um, for reference, this the picture on the left is roughly starting from this point. And you can get an idea. What I want the point of showing this picture is to give you an idea of uh, what the galaxy from the site looks like. It's very thin. By thin, I mean on a galactic structure, not necessarily thin. It's pretty big, but it's thin, relatively speaking. And if you look at, look face on, on the left is a model of the uh, Milky Way galaxy. And on the right is a picture uh, of another galaxy, which is kind of similar to, to, the, to the one we live in. Of course, we can't take a picture of our galaxy like that because we're in the galaxy. It's kind of hard to you know, point a camera on the... Anyways, so what we do is we take pictures of galaxies that are similar to ours, and you can see those spiral arms. And uh, based on models, uh, we can make a model for our own galaxy and look at these spiral arms. Now, what the important um, thing to look for, look for in this particular picture is the position of the sun and the position of the galactic center. And the line between those two points is an important line, and it allows us to um, do some calculations, which I'll go into later. So it's important, just keep it in mind. A little bit on uh, how this, these radio signals are captured. So we use um, radio telescopes. And for my particular case, I got my data from Dr. Rich Russell from, this, from the SARA uh, Society, which is a society of amateur radio astronomers and very active in this particular research. Now, usually these um, radio telescopes are connected to radio receivers. Uh, in this particular case, we use the Spectra Cyber. Now, I'm not going to go too much into the details of how this works. Uh, of course, people here are experts in this stuff. But from my understanding, this is very good for frequencies particular to 14, 20 megahertz. And it's very good at receiving those frequencies. And on the right side, you can see a picture of uh, one of the antenna dishes that was used to collect the data. So before I uh, uh, go into how I'm collecting the data and all of that stuff, I want to answer a couple of questions which might maybe come in. So what do I hope to learn from uh, observing, making these observations, these radio observations? Well, the, the, the quick answer to that question is learn the structure of the Milky Way galaxy, but not necessarily just the structure, the dynamic structure actually. So which implies um, that I hope to measure the velocities and the locations of different um, galactic arms uh, by looking at di different um, uh, drift scans. And how do we measure those set quantities? Well, we look at frequencies. And this pretty much takes me to my next question. And this word has been said a lot. It rhymes with cobbler. It's the Doppler shift, right? So we're looking at the Doppler shift to uh, make these uh, velocity calculations. And here's the answers to those questions. So looking at uh, this little setup, so we do these coordinate conversions from, um, from celestial coordinates to galactic coordinates because the plane of the solar system is slightly misaligned from the plane of the, uh, of the galaxy. And as you might remember from like introductory physics stuff, um, that we need to line these uh, vectors up in order to make these calculations. Velocity at the end of the day is just a vector that we need to make calculations for. So these coordinate conversions play an important role in, um, in making our calculations uh, feasible. So we convert from right ascension and declination to galactic long longitude and latitude. Um, I'll go into detail of what those look like. Um, right ascension and declination is essentially just as the Earth moves, moves across, the, uh, across or rotates or on its own axis, that's right ascension and declination is as we move up and down the sky. Um, and again, these coordinates are important because um, these allow us to make velocity calculations. And we can just do these um, calculations by looking at frequencies from uh, different peaks. Uh, I'll be showing those curves in a moment. And we look for offsets from the 1420.406 megahertz frequency. Uh, that's the H1 line that I was talking about earlier. And of course, we use Doppler shift to do these calculations. And here's the formula for that. So a little bit on the galactic coordinates. So the longitude is essentially just, so if you remember that red line that I showed earlier, Longitude is just the line that connects the sun to the center of the galaxy. And as you sweep on the, towards the left side, you go across the galaxy in galactic longitudes. And the latitude is essentially just your field of view above and below the galactic plane. And so I'm gonna use this word very um, freely, I guess. It essentially filters out your data as you uh, make the split of galactic latitude smaller. You're reducing your field of view and you can take out noise, uh, noisy data points that you don't want in your, in your uh, plots. So a little bit on the uh, observations, what do you see from those um, uh, radio receivers? 
So you get uh, drift scans like these. So now you might be uh, wondering why this there's a slant and um, obviously there's a peak in the middle too. So the slant is essentially just an artifact of the receiver itself. Uh, that's something that the, the Dr. Russell told me about. I'm not exactly going to go into the specifics of that. And um, how we correct for that is to just add a slope correction and we can make a plot like this. So the um, so as you can see now, the noise floor is just uh, a flat line and you can now clearly identify the peak in the middle now. And using those, um, uh, those data files, we also um, convert the units in the x-axis to frequencies in megahertz by using proportions because the data files tell us where the frequency is centered at and how wide this spread is in terms of the frequency. So the first thing that I did uh, from the data was to just plot every intensity from these drift scans across the right ascension and declination from the data that I had. And you can see a little swoop as it goes through um, the through the day. And this swoop is the uh, Milky Way galaxy that we see. Um, you might be wondering what's this little um, thing in the middle? Well, this is the M87 um, galaxy because it corresponds to roughly the location of where it's supposed to be. And if you don't know what that is, if you all remember the black hole picture that we saw a few years ago, well, that's the that that particular galaxy is is what is the biggest one that we know of. And to make sure that I'm doing this correctly, I compared this to the JWST um, curve that was produced, and so I know that uh, the data from a multi-billion-dollar project is kind of matching with my like small setup. So I know something's going right so far. So after that, I go into, again, back to velocities. So we the first thing that I plot is velocities versus galactic longitudes. Again, remember, galactic longitudes is the um, coordinate that goes across the galactic plane. And if we plot the, so what I did, I popped in everything into my code and uh, plotted all the velocities for 6,000 files, and this mess came out of it. It's a lot of noise, and it's a lot of stuff happening there. So what I did, um, I plot these. You can notice the amount of noise in there. Um, so what I do is I try to identify where this noise is coming from. And what I notice is uh, for a lot of these drift scans, I see a lot of these flat lines or flatness. There's no peaks in there. As you remember, we saw the peak just earlier. There's no peak here. So um, if you, the eagle-eyed amongst you might see this little tiny data point here. What my algorithm essentially does is just looks at the top point, tells the corresponding frequency and makes the velocity plot right here, which is, Again, I'm not a good programmer, so this is like the as a starting point. This this is what um, the noise is. So what I try to do essentially is to just get rid of every velocity that is below negative fifty uh, kilometers per second, and uh, just look at the first quadrant of the galactic longitude. As you can see, so we're going only from zero to ninety degrees. So we start at the zero line, we go to ninety degrees, and that's it. And um, we're just plotting the velocities for galactic latitude of negative 90 to 90. So we're looking from the top to the bottom across the whole latitude. Um, but I was wondering, what if we just uh, reduce the latitude? What if we look at a tiny slit and stuff like the whole, the whole uh, galactic latitude plane? So if I reduce it, you can see it takes out basically all of the noise. You can still see some pattern uh, rising trend in there, which also shows you that our galaxy is really narrow. The first picture, back to the first picture that I showed you, it's really narrow relative to the to the distance across uh, the plane, basically. After that, I plot the the same um, plot in instead of galactic longitude at the x-axis, I use radius. So the radius with a funny unit called kiloparsecs, but, uh, it's just a unit of distance. And um, so essentially, this is the distance between the center of the galaxy to the cloud that I'm looking at. And some trigonometry later, you can get a plot like this, which shows you again a rising trend. So as you're increasing the the ring size of the uh, across the galaxy, you're seeing that the velocities of the galactic arms are increasing. And this particular case is just between negative ten and ten galactic latitude. So before we uh, move on to the next thing, I think I should um, elaborate to what the next parameter would be uh, that we should look for. And that one is uh, the mass, because I talked about how I'm trying to understand the dynamic structure of the galaxy. So dynamics also, I think an important part of that is the mass of the object that we're looking at. Now, the, the, the term cloud is a little misleading here because it implies it's light, but it's really actually very heavy. Uh, those are massive clouds that we're looking at. 
And um, when we're doing these calculations using mass or sorry, velocities, we need to make sure that the measured velocity has been corrected for the local standard of rest, the velocity due to the sun and the velocity due to the earth because our dish is on the earth, which is, which is rotating on its axis, which is going around the sun and the sun itself is moving around the galaxy. So we need to make a couple of corrections and to give you an idea of what, the, what these velocities are, the earth's rotation gives you about 0.5 kilometers per second. The earth's orbit is about 30 and the sun's movement is about 220. So if you look at these numbers earlier, we have about roughly 20, 30-ish kilometers per second. So it tells us that we need, if we are making a correction, it's gonna make a significant um, impact on our calculations for mass meter. So we're gonna look at it in an example calculation. Of, I promise I'm gonna go through this quick. So mass is simply just V squared R over G, kinematics equation, not too, not too hard. So the right ascension in this particular case is 311.8. The declination is plus 40. And if we go ahead and we plug in all these numbers, um, the interesting thing is, so radius I already went over, G is just the gravitational constant. The velocity is the interesting one. So the measured velocity is corrected for the local standard of rest, the velocity of the sun at its apex, and the velocity of the earth. And we get a number like negative 236.08. From, so from measured velocity of, in this particular case, I think it was negative eight, we went to negative 236. So it's a significantly different number after these corrections. Now we plug this into the mass equation and we get a number which is 1.099 times 10 to the 11, a funny mass symbol, which is the solar mass. And good news is this falls right between the expected or the known mass of the, galac of the galaxy, which is between one and two times 10 to the 11 uh, solar masses. So good news, I guess I, I'm doing this somewhat correctly, I, I hope. And um, so yeah, these, these are the mass calculations that, that, that I did so far. And I hope to repeat these mass calculations for not all the 6,000, but some of the 6,000 data files that I have, and then see a trend uh, which, which will tell me as I go outside in the galaxy, as I increase the size of my ring, what, how is the mass going to be impacted there? And maybe try to uh, make conclusions about luminous mass or dynamical mass and stuff like that. In terms of future work, I'm going to do these corrections uh, for all the 6,000 files. This was just one particular file. And um, I'm hoping to do further literature review because I'm still very, uh, need to uh, need more knowledge in terms of knowing what's uh, going on behind all of these numbers. And I hope to do some heat maps in different coordinates like galactic latitude and longitude. The ones I showed you was in right ascension and declination. So this one will be in different um, coordinates as well. And um, so yeah, a little bit on the acknowledgements. I want to thank Dr. Mary Lou West for uh, guiding me through this process, answering all of my stupid questions. Dr. Fazell for also helping me through this process. Uh, Dr. Rich Russell for giving me the data from Sarah and my committee members, Dr. Serna, uh, Dr. Spalletta and Dr. Moha for um, guiding me as well. And the Office of Sponsored Research Programs for uh, funding me over the summer. So this is the end of my talk. Thank you for listening to me. Yeah, if you have any questions, just give me. Hello, thank you. Um, this may be obvious to some of those more experienced in astronomy than I do. Um, so you, you showed some earlier plots where you had to do a right ascension and declination. Mm -hmm. Are these, how do you get the declination? Like, like, is this kind of, do you have multiple antennas pointing at different angles in the sky? Do you so, so, yeah. So, yeah, as you move the antenna above from the plane, that's, you're changing the declination at that point. So, the data that I had was changing declination, and I believe, in five degree increments. So, I had a bunch of data files for 40 declination, 45, 50, 60, stuff like that. Yeah, and so the, they, Richie would physically mm -hmm. move. I, yes, I believe so. It's, it's again a very amateur setup, and yeah, so you could automate it. You could use motors and stuff, but he he just moves it by himself. I think. Yep. Well, well, we know from observations of other galaxies mm -hmm. in a way that the orbits of the stars and the other fringes of the galaxy will not follow capillary orbits anymore. Yep. Okay, and it's attributed to dark energy and uh, that's right. 
uh, cosmology plots with an finite one. Yep. Um, so anyway, you could take all that out of your data to see, I mean, uh, this also holds for our galaxy. Yep, that's why I said I need to do more literature review on this. So my plan is to look at those 6,000 mass values um, from those data files. And then when I would, the hope is to plot them against the radius and hopefully see something on the outer edges. So maybe an irregularity of some sorts. Dr. West over there knows way more about this stuff than I do. So if she could maybe clarify on some stuff that I say wrong, that'd be, yeah. So my hope is to, by the end of, so I'm doing my thesis on this stuff and hopefully make a conclusion of some source that says something about that, so yeah. That was my point. Thanks. All right. Um, thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Good, Ron, welcome. Spoken nice afternoon, and he's presenting on the history of the art of deactivating aspect. So I'm using the microphone, or is this good enough for the folks that are for the folks that are zooming? Yes. All right, thank you very much. Um, we're gonna go in a little bit of a different direction now, not quite so much science. However, as you've been hearing about ham radio operators and you've heard about the terms of DXing and contesting, and since many of them will be a uh, critical component of the eclipse, I thought it would be fun to take an excerpt from a presentation that I do and talk about three of the early pioneers of DXing and take a look at some of the uh, some of the uh, things that they have done and some of their experiences. So first we talk about Gus Browning. Gus Browning was a very interesting individual who um, was uh, one of the uh, first people to really start working a lot of uh, different uh, people. He was a TV technician and he got so hooked on ham radio that he decided he was just gonna go out and just travel the world and put out countries for people to work to get credit from. He was the first one that was elected to the DX Hall of Fame. He was well known no matter where he showed up, even if they couldn't get Coca-Cola, if you see pictures of him, you will always see a picture of a bottle of Coca-Cola in his hand at all times, anywhere. And they never figured out how he did it. He was right-handed, but he wanted to be able to do CW with either hand, so he learned how to write with his left hand. He was very even-tempered, just always had a smile, but he was always in control of the pileup. And a pileup is when you have a lot of ham radio operators that are trying to get a hold of you, and it's called a pileup, and it can get very intensive, as uh, Bob knows, being over there in Bonaire. He was known for if wherever he was at, he never had money. So whatever the natives or the people were eating, that's what he ate. <laughs> he would join fishermen, ships, caravans. It didn't matter, but he would join them whatever direction they were going just to be able to go to a new area. A lot of times the reason that they would take him places is because they would be fascinated. They had never seen a radio. So he would tell them that he would show them how it worked and let them play on it. And then they would take him places or let them let him accompany them. And this one I thought was kind of weird, but he started drinking yak milk when he was over in Asia and came back and wanted to try to find it and said he loved it. He sometimes was not quite sure where he was. So he would ask, what country am I in? They would tell him and he would make up a ham radio call sign and use that call sign. He has numerous call signs that people had no clue. And uh, he just uh, made it up and used it and then would uh, sign his QSL cards with the country. He operated from over 100 countries. Great sense of humor. Always in control, as I said before. If the pileup got really bad, he would say in the frequency, up 10, up 10, and then he'd go down five. And, uh, and so he knew that his friends that knew how to work him would know how to find him, and all of the others that were making a lot of noise would be up 10 above. Um, 
and uh, that worked for a while. Then pretty soon everybody started figuring it out. One time he said, oh, I've got to stop, which is QRT. My feet are wet. I've got to get back in the boat. Later he was asked, and he says, I, I don't know, I don't remember that, but wherever it was, I had to get in the boat quick. With a lot of the interest in the ham radio community on Beauvais Island, I thought it would be interesting to take a look at his experience because he operated from Beauvais Island. He said, it took two hours of hard work to go 1,000 feet from the ship to the land. He said, this is how much clothing he had on. I'll go through it quickly. Regular undershorts, shirt, two pairs of red, long insulated underwear, flannel shirt, long tails, two pairs of pants, one pair of socks, a pair of woolen socks over that, a heavy turtleneck sweater, a wool headpiece, a big heavy overcoat, and fur-lined gloves. And he said, I froze the whole time I was there. So that's pretty cold. That's pretty cold weather. Um, he said that the glacier was making so much noise 24 hours a day that it was constantly popping and you could hear these loud crashes going on and then a big chunk would fall off into the ocean. He said he wished he could have stayed longer. He made 5,000 and as you heard earlier, a QSO was a contact between two operators. And he said the pileup at the end was bigger than it was when he started. And then I loved his last comment. It was great, fellows. The thrill is still with me when I sit or lie back and think of it all. A true DX operator. Danny Will, second one. He is uh, famous for traveling the world in his boat and then getting off and putting out some of these entities. He covered 20,000 miles on his boat, the Yasumi. <laughs> He had three boats. Why? Because the first two sank, got demolished in a storm, crashed into some rocks. He is number five on the CQ all-time list. Gus Browning was number one. He would do anything possible. If he knew that you needed an island or something where he could get to it, he would do everything he could, that he could to put it out. CQ Magazine said this statement about him. He had more narrow escapes from death than 100 average men. And he was the pioneer of the worldwide the expeditioner. And there's one of his, uh, what we call a QSL card, where he, back then, that's how they would acknowledge or confirm the contact. <coughs> and the Yasmi Foundation is named after his boat which is a major contributor to the expeditions and to the ham radio community. And then he stopped sailing so much because, well, you know, he got married and that kind of uh, took care of those uh, long around the world voyages. He uh, was on the island of Nauru and he had a uh, beam antenna, got it off the boat, put it together. And he found on the island a 40 foot two inch pipe. He got it placed, got it up, and then he looked at that big beam, 33 feet by 12 feet, and he looked at that little pole and he said there was no way in the world he was even gonna try to get up. So he said, there's these natives around and they're like, what's going on here? And this little boy, he offered to go up. He goes, okay. So the little boy shinnied right up the pole, got up, had a rope, started pulling up the antenna. And about that point, Danny Wheel looks around, sees this high power line, this tension line. He goes, oh no. And he pulled it up and just barely missed the uh, power line. And uh, Danny Wheel said, I just, I just cringed. I thought, what have I gotten into here? And then the rope got tangled and the little boy couldn't get the antenna up. So at that point, another little boy, before Danny Wheel could see anything, he scurries up. Now this whole little pole is bent. <laughs> And the two little boys are trying to get the antenna up. And Danny Wheel said, okay, that's it. We don't need to do any more. And all of a sudden, a third boy goes up this little pole <laughs> and the whole thing really starts leaning. He said, I closed my eyes until they told me it was done at that point. But they got the antenna on and he made a lot of contacts out of that. Another time there was a big typhoon came up. He wrecked, the ship hit the rocks, crashed. He managed to get to shore. 
He's laying there on the beach. The rain is pounding, the wind is pounding. The waves are tearing his boat apart and he fell asleep, woke up a few hours later, the storm had diminished. And he said, and of course, you have to take care of the priorities in life. So he went out to the boat and got his radio and brought it back. And then he said, once I had the radio to shore, my next step was to see if I had food and water in the boat and some clothing. A true DXer. I'm afraid I'd have gone for the food and the water first before I went for the radio. And that's a picture of him. They said that he was just, just a real gentleman, just as nice as could be. And the last one is Iris and Lloyd Colvin. His philosophy was this. If you don't have it and you want it, it's rare. And I will try to get it for you. He could do Morse code at 40 words a minute easily in his head without a problem, but he never operated above 25 because he was worried that those that couldn't copy fast enough would be discouraged and would not even try. His collection, remember that QSL card I showed you earlier from Danny Wheel? His collection was the largest that we're aware of and it weighed more than a ton when they waited at his death. He had over 1 million CUSOs in his travels, and or the two of them in their travels and their adventures. They traveled to 201 DXCC entities and operated from two thirds of those. He was known for being generous, kind, passionate, and absolute integrity. If he was one foot off of the country line, he would make sure that when he operated and said that he operated from a place, he was really there. When he died, his life, insur his life insurance policy was donated to the ARRL, which I hope you've seen their table out there, and I hope that you're members of it. Excellent organization representing us. And so back then, that was in the 60s, the policy was for $150,000. So I'll wrap up with just a couple of his experiences. I tell you, he's got more passion. I'm, I love the hobby of ham radio, but I wouldn't even go through this. He's home, there's a contest. It's pouring rain, it's dark at night, and all of a sudden the antenna won't turn and he can't get it in the direction that he wants to work. He calls up the power company and he has this favorite lineman that comes out and does stuff for him all the time. He calls him up and says, oh, he's sick, he can't come. So he says, well, get somebody else. They said, we can't, it's night, it's raining. He says, I'll pay double. And they said, well, maybe we can find somebody. He says, I'll put a bonus on the double pay if you'll get him out. So the lineman came out, goes up and looks and says, your motor's burned up and uh, sorry. So then, uh, he says, well, do this, tie a rope on it. So he tied a rope and then wherever he wanted the direction changed, Lloyd would run out, grab the rope, turn it, then run back into his house and operate some more. He's out there doing that when all of a sudden his wife says, you have a fire up on top. And he goes, what? He forgot to turn the rotor off, the motor. And it finally got hot. So it's on fire and he's got this on a pole the fire is spreading down. So he says, I ran and grabbed my garden hose, turned it on and realized there was a big leak and I didn't know I'd been gone so, for so long. So at this point, he now calls the fire station, fire truck shows up, they put the fire out. It's his uh, insurance agent is a friend of the neighbor and comes over and says, Lloyd, that's not covered by your insurance policy. And he says, okay, I'm done. And he went in, he says, no way, I'm not quitting. So we went back on the air, back out running around with the rope to turn the antenna. And he says, i am uh, got a couple hours of sleep. And the next morning, the FCC office showed up, two gentlemen, and they said, you are operating uh, over your power limit. You're out of frequency. And he goes, there's no way. So he showed them and they said, oh, okay, you're right. Uh, our mistake, sorry. They said, we have to check your... Uh, 
ham radio license. And back then, this was a pretty serious thing, a lot different than today. So he pulls out his license and he realized he forgot to sign it. So he says, gentlemen, I need to sign this. And they said, you can't sign that in front of us. You can't do that. It's already got to be signed. Government, right? So, so they said, but we'll tell you what, we're going to turn around. We're going to look at some stuff on your wall for a minute. So they did that. So he signs it really quick. And then they turned around. They went, oh, look, it's all signed. It's good. And they uh, let him continue to operate. Last one. There's a country that he's going to go to in South America, and he's going to put it on. And uh, his wife, Iris, she goes, you know, I'm hearing that this is not a good idea. There's some government insurrection, and there's some issues. And Lloyd goes, oh, we'll be fine. We've gone all over these countries. This is not a problem. So they pull up with all this radio gear in the trunk, and they go through the first stop point to go into this country. And the uh, guards come out, and they check everything, and Lloyd's talking to them, and they open up the trunk, and they pull out their guns, and they arrest him. And Iris is sitting in the car, and all she knows is that all of a sudden, Lloyd's being marched off with some machine guns pointed at him, and the trunk's open. She doesn't know what's going on. So then they take him in the room, and they call in somebody else more important, and Lloyd is trying to explain to him, it's, it's just a radio, it's got nothing, you know, I'm not trying to cause any problems here. And so then another person got called in and they finally got it so that he would be free and able to, um, to continue. And Iris is like, turn the car around, we're done, we're done. And Lloyd's like, oh no, I got this paper from the guy, I'm sure we'll be fine, we're gonna do it. And a couple of guard stops later, same thing again, but Lloyd did operate eventually and he did put it out. So I think I'll just end it with that. I mean, there's, there's a lot of other things that I do in my other uh, presentations, but I just wanted to give you a sampling of what some of the, the pioneers in uh, ham radio DXing and ham radio putting this out for people and some of the things that they experienced and uh, what they were like. And, and the one thing that struck me is that for all three of them, you constantly saw the words, true gentleman, courteous, kind. Um, they never put somebody down because of what they did or didn't know about ham radio. When they would give talks and appear at clubs and stuff like that, they never worried about what your CW speed was. They didn't worry about whether you'd worked 10 countries or 200 countries to them. You were a ham radio operator and you were important. So with that, I thank you for your time, and I'll call it good with that. Very much. I just take this opportunity to remind people that we have a whole display of historical radios on the hallway in the second floor with the many beautiful USL cards. So Ron did a great job talking about some of ham radio history and culture and about those QSL cards so you can see some of those up there. People still send them out today. And next and next up we have uh, Dr. Jim Lavelle from Dartmouth College and he'll be talking about observing a rural radio emissions in conjugate hemispheres. It's a microphone. I read that very much longer. Okay, it's not so simple. Okay, so we can we can get this. Don't worry. Then explain that the the most difficult. Could argue that maybe the most difficult talk is the talk right before dinner. Oh. Yeah, We're gonna trust you, Jim. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to be talking about uh, 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 observing natural emissions of, of natural aurora origin. Okay, measured with ham, ham radio type equipment, uh, but measuring those at two different uh, points on the Earth connected by this magnetic field. And I'm going to spend part of my talk here talking about you know motivating or addressing the question of why you would want to do this, and then at the end of my talk, I'll tell you some some data. 
So here are the types of auroral radium, natural auroral radio emissions that you have. These are waterfall or spectrogram type charts that I think you're familiar with, frequency versus time. And they showed some of the types of radio emissions that we are doing coming naturally from the aurora. I mean, these are not man made signals, these are signals spontaneously generated by the aurora. And some of them, like the auroral hits here, or the median frequency burst, are broadband in nature. And others, like the cytotron harmonic emission or the auroral convection radiation, are more band limited. Okay, by the way, I should mention that there have been, as was talked about this morning in one of the morning talks, there have been a lot of measurements. Pardon me. Hey, you want to move around? Oh, okay. I didn't move around. Okay. Okay. There have been, uh, I thought maybe the mic was taking care of them. Okay. The, there have been me many measurements at conjugate hemispheres at BLF frequencies. Okay. Looking at whistlers and things like that. But there have not been measurements at these LF, MF, and lower HF frequencies. So what these different emissions have in common is they're all associated with a pattern of auroral activity that's called the auroral substorm. So let me tell you a few things about auroral substorms, okay? Uh, many people have seen pictures of the aurora, maybe seen the aurora, and think of it as kind of a, a shimmering curtain of light in the sky. But actually the aurora is much more active than that, and it has kind of repeatable patterns of activity. And one of those is called the substorm. And I'm sure that indigenous peoples in the north have, have recognize these auroral activities for ages, but the substorm was not described scientifically until the early 1960s by Professor Shin Akasofu. And uh, he, uh, Akasofu literally spent hundreds of hours watching the aurora outside in Alaska and you know, with careful notes. And these drawings here, these sketches come from his uh, paper and so what happens with the substorm is that it, the aurora starts out, okay, as kind of a curtain across the sky. And then almost imperceptibly, that curtain of aurora kind of shifts to the southward if you're in the northern hemisphere. And then at some point, it brightens and then expands poleward, okay, very rapidly within a few minutes time, expands forward and basically fills the whole sky with aurora, with dancing aurora forms. That's called the explosive or expansive part of the substorm. And then those various aurora forms, they start to fade. And after half an hour or so, the aurora collapses back into sort of a curtain again. And then the process happens again. This is a process called an aurora substorm. And it's actually difficult to recognize. It. It's, it's a very large scale phenomenon. So I think one reason that it wasn't you know, described earlier scientifically is that from the ground, you know, to really observe it, you need to be in space. These, these pictures here are from the Dynamics Explorer spacecraft, and they show you know, the process of the aurora. You can see here, this is sequential images taken by the spacecraft, and you can see the aurora looks like a curtain and then gradually moves southward and then boom, expands you know, into a huge region of the sky and then collapses back you know, in, into a curtain. And so Akasoku was able to draw, it's very interesting, he was able to draw drawings, you know, even though he could only observe at one point on the ground, he was able to draw drawings that look a lot like these taken in space. Um, let's see, this is a movie I wanted to show you. I hope it works. This is a, what this is, is a, a, a fisheye camera view uh, taken in Alaska. And so this is the whole sky. Uh, uh, the south is at the top of the plot, okay? In fact, I think that's the moon, that spot up there. And so what you're going to see here is you're going to see the process of this explosive phase of the substorm. We're going to walk in a roll arc. It's going to move to the south. And by the way, this is greatly speeded up. So, you know, about, I'm going to show you about 15 seconds that correspond to about half an hour of actual time. So let me start it here. So here you've got the arc, the arc curtain. Notice it's moving to the south. You see it's shifting to the south there. And at some point, it's going to brighten and explode more. Check it out there. So there it is, it keeps going south, keeps going south. And then boom, check that out. Uh, that's, that's the substorm there. Fills the whole sky with aurora. And you know, it took just a few seconds in the speed it up plot, but typically might take five or 10 minutes to, to happen in real life. Let me show you what that looks like in the radio. So, okay, here we have, so what's on the left-hand panel here is, you know, your standard waterfall or spectrogram plot of an auroral radio emission. And it's a fairly, you know, uh, not modest one, uh, lasts only a few minutes in time and has a bandwidth of perhaps 500 kilohertz or something. This is called a medium frequency burst emission. And on the right-hand side, uh, uh, corresponding to the time that's marked it with the green box there, the top panel shows the optical fisheye camera view, same as I just showed in the movie. 
Okay, and you can see that there's an auroral arc, you know, near the southern horizon, and that arc has just brightened and is starting to sweep north. Right, we're right at the start of the of the explosive phase of the substorm, and that's not accidental. That's when these radio emissions occur. They occur at that explosive phase. So that's what's happening. And then the bottom panel there on the right shows you the uh, the radio. Okay, this is we had a radio interferometer, so we were able to image kind of what the radio emission looked like. Um, and it comes from kind of a patch in the sky, also to the southward. And, you know, it, it looks like the radio is coming from a higher elevation, that, but it's actually coming from this auroral arc. The reason the radio appears to come from a more high elevation is because of refraction, okay? So the radio emissions coming off of that arc are refracted downward. So if you're looking in the radio, they appear to be coming from a higher elevation than they actually are because of refraction. Uh, by the way, this kind of uh, cross pattern in here is instrumental due to the antennas, so uh, or the pattern, the antenna pattern. But anyway, let me just show you how this progresses. Let's look 30 seconds later, and you see the aurora has shifted north northward, right? We're, we're in that expansion phase, and notice the, the emissions, the, aurora, the radio emissions have also shifted to the north. Okay, and then we go another 30 seconds again. So you can see that these radio emissions are tracking that substorm arc of the aurora. And then what happens next? The aurora comes overhead. Wow, the radio emissions disappear, okay? And this is because the aurora creates ionization underneath it, which blocks the radio emissions from reaching the ground. So most likely those radio emissions are still going on up there in the ionosphere, but we can't see them on the ground because they're screened from us. So to see these emissions, you actually have to be kind of looking at the aurora from the side. A little bit. If you're right under the aurora, you can't see them. But anyway, that shows you the connection between the radio emissions and this substorm. But to really show you why it would be interesting to make measurements in the two hemispheres, I have to tell you a little bit more about the cause of the substorm. And this is all tied up with the magnetic field. It's all about magnetic fields. So many of you probably know the Earth's magnetic field is similar to that of a bar magnet. The Earth is like a giant bar magnet, okay? Except for the charged particles, you know, streaming from the sun, essentially compress the Earth's field on the one side, the magnetic field, and stretch it out on the other side into what we call a tail on the night side of the Earth, right? And if you look far out in the regions of this night side, what happens is that you have a region here where the magnetic field is, is opposite in direction and gets very close to each other. You have a situation here where you have two opposing magnetic fields that are almost on top of each other. This is a very unstable situation, right? Because those two magnetic fields, equal in magnitude and opposite, they want to cancel each other out. They want to annihilate each other. And in fact, they do that, okay? In a process, an explosive process that's called magnetic reconnection, those fields will wipe each other out. And the energy that was in those magnetic fields gets put in, among other things, gets put in particles that go down the magnetic field lines accelerated and caused this enhanced aurora associated with that that substorm onset that sweeping of the aurora over the whole sky and, and the dancing aurora forms and notice that because it happens here you know jointly at this this point here both hemispheres the substorm happens in both hemispheres and so you sort of expect that the waves associated the radio waves associated with substorms might also happen in both hemispheres hence a reason to to look there and see conjugate radio emissions. This picture here makes it look rather mundane. This is a two-dimensional picture. And so it looks like, oh, you know, the, the substorm is always going to be exactly, you know, opposite each other on the two hemispheres. But if you go to, you know, real life is three-dimensional, okay? And so there are various reasons why the substorms in the, in the two hemispheres are not necessarily aligned with each other. They can be offset in both longitude and latitude. And one reason is shown here, if the sun's magnetic field has an east-west component to it, that will put a kind of twist into this reconnected magnetic field and cause there to be an offset, a longitudinal offset between the substorms in the two hemispheres, okay, which has actually been observed in the right-hand plot here, you have, you, you, they happen to have had two satellites, one looking at the north, one looking at the south at the time when one of these substorms happened. And you can see, this is similar to the Dynamics Explorer data I showed earlier. You can see the substorm setting off in the two hemispheres and there's an offset of maybe 15 or 20 degrees in longitude between where the, those onsets are happening in the two hemispheres. Very interesting. And this kind of motivates why we would like to look 
at this in the radio, because you can imagine if you had radio interferometry at the two ends, you could actually, you wouldn't need your two satellites up there, you know, imaging. You could look with the radio and at each end by looking, doing direction finding, you could actually detect, you know, this offset between the substorms in the two hemispheres from radio measurements. So that's one of our motivations. Okay, let me say a couple of words about, you know, it's actually non-trivial to find an auroral, you know, high latitude site where you can do such an observation, okay? Because let's face it, in the Southern hemisphere, if you wanna look high latitude, you're talking Antarctica. Not many locations there to work, okay? And most of those locations in Antarctica, if you follow the field line, they land in the Arctic Ocean somewhere, okay? But there is one combination that works, and that's shown here. The South Pole of the Earth actually has a station operated by the United States at which we have some radio experiment equipment. And if you follow the magnetic field line from the South Pole to the north, it lands in this region of Baffin Island of northern Canada, which is fairly close to several small settlements. And we were able to persuade our colleagues at the University of New Brunswick to take some of our one of our radio receiving systems and put it into this site of Kikikarjuak here, which is very, very close to being conjugate to the South Pole Station. You know, that giving us two, two locations that are conjugate to each other. Let me just show you a few things about the equipment. So at the South Pole end, this is our uh, observing equipment. We had uh, cross magnetic loop antennas on about a 30 foot mast there at the South Pole. And you can't see it, but at the base there, there's a preamplifier, which is of the same type that David McGuaw described this morning. Um, and then that's tied into a, a shack, you know, okay, some hundreds of meters away. And you can see the picture in the lower right. The problem with the, the shack at South Pole is that it is at a continuous temperature of minus 26 degrees in that shack, okay? So we have to have our equipment inside an insulated box and some temperature control in there. But we have a software-defined radio, a USRP software-defined radio in there and a computer. And that's what we use for receiving the signal at the South Pole. At the North End, this is a picture of the antenna at the North End that was set up by our colleagues from New Brunswick. And that is an antenna on a 15-foot mast. So it's a somewhat smaller antenna, similar preamp, similar design preamp. And then the shack, which in this case is a true shack, there you can see our equipment. And you can see that one of the components is this USRP software defined radio here. Um, one thing you can also see from this picture at Kick It Car to Act is that we have severe radio frequency interference issues at this site. I mean, you can already see in the same picture. In fact, we can't take a picture of our antenna without having another antenna in there that is a source of interference for us. They have a non directional beacon there that's only hundreds of meters from our, our antenna. And there's also an ionosonde. So be prepared for some ugly data coming from this site. Um, but anyway, let me show you what we actually observed. Okay, first of all, starting in around early October, we got both of these sites working. And then October 10th, we detected our first conjugate event. And so the top panel shows uh, the Northern Hemisphere data from Kikik Tarjuak, and the bottom panel shows South Pole data. And the South Pole data also has a lot of interference, these horizontal lines that are, that are interference from station activities. But you can clearly see this event. It's called a rural hiss. It's one of the broadband type of emissions that's associated with the substorm onset. By the way, it appears to have a lower cutoff, um, but that, that's instrumental. It actually goes down to a few kilohertz typically. Um, but anyway, you can clearly see the emission in the South Pole. If you look in the North, of course, you have major picket fence issues. Uh, you have these horizontal lines that are due to the uh, non-directional beacon and its harmonics, and these vertical things are due to the ionosan. But if you can look through all that, you can undeniably see that there's also a hiss event happening uh, at a you know, at the same time, really, at the coincident in time with the southern hemisphere. And so, to my knowledge, this is the first at these frequencies this is the first conjugate, you know, emission that's been observed. Then we saw another one two days later. So this is October twelfth a few months ago. And here you have the two hemispheres again and another, you know, another uh, conjugate event. Then we didn't see any for a while. And we've observed one, both of those were kind of equinoctial or close to equinoct. We observed one event near solstice here. This is December 14th. So about, what, two or three months ago. And on the south, in, in this case, the south, and one reason, by the way, that we have measured so few events is because 
you know, sunlight, sunlight, sunlit conditions is, is unfavorable for these auroral radio emissions to be observed <coughs> for propagation, <coughs> pardon me, propagation reasons, <coughs> pardon me. And so you can see the sunlit hemisphere, which is in the south, the emission is quite faint. In fact, it takes some experience to even spot that it's there, but it does happen at exactly the time of the most intense of this emission in the northern hemisphere. So this is another example, but it kind of shows the challenges when you have one hemisphere sunlit and the other in darkness, you have a big asymmetry in what you observe. And so what we're really hoping for, what we're looking for here is looking ahead. Um, so this is a plot that look at the bottom panel here. So the uh, shaded, you know, the South Pole is very unusual in that it's basically dark for, you know, for six months and light for six months. You know, the day is, is a year long at South Pole. And of course, at uh, Kikiktarjuak, the darkness and light pattern is a bit more complex. But what you can see is that there's about a month in April, you know, starting next week, actually, and another time in, in September, there's about a month on either equinox where you have darkness at both ends. Um, and that's probably the most promising time to make these type of measurements. So we're, we're very eagerly awaiting, you know, starting next week, there's a very promising month ahead when we're hoping to see a lot of these kind of conjugate radio emissions. So anyway, I was gonna finish maybe with this very gray, you know, summary, but I think instead I'll go back and finish with this plot because I just find it, I, I must say, even though it may be in theory expected, you should see this, you know, I still find it, you know, the, the idea that you can take basically two software defined radios, kind of ham radio type equipment, put them at two locations on the surface of the earth, 10,000 miles apart, and yet observe something that nature is doing similar at those two very distant locations that are just connected by this field line going out in space. I find that quite marvelous somehow, even though it's maybe expected theoretically. So anyway, thank you very much. It's time for dinner, right? Yet. Are there any questions? Uh, yeah, so I was wondering when you determine the time to go to the I still didn't know if you swept off that, like you were talking about the dynamic events. Yes. Yeah. Those offsets, you would need offset stations as well. You know? Yes, I mean, I guess we've determined that from the, uh, there's a, a tool, the international, well, there's a there's a tool you can use that, that determines these conjugate points based on a model of the magnetic field. And you know there are various models you can use for the magnetic field, which might give you slightly different conjugate points. Um, but this is the nominal kind of conjugate point, uh, you know, based on on a, a model of the Earth's magnetic field, an offset dipole type model of the Earth's magnetic field. And you can find it on the web if you look at International Geophysical Reference Field. Um, there's a tool out there, and you can put in any location on the Earth, and it'll tell you where the conjugate is, you know, based on this model. That's where that comes from. Okay, that makes sense. But I guess the question is more about how you would use this energy to detect the east west off that. Ah, yes. Okay. Well, that's a good question. And my idea is, and maybe, you know, it hasn't been done yet, but the idea would be you have these. First of all, I should point out that even though you're measuring at South Pole and at KK Tarjuak, the volume that you're measuring is actually to the southward, to the equator word of each of them, right? So at South Pole, you're measuring emissions that are coming from several hundred kilometers north of, well, equator word of you, and similarly at the other one. So the region, you're, you have these two conjugate regions. And the idea I have is that you'd have some direction finding capability. So you would, you would from the north, you would direction find, and from the south, you would direction find. And if there was an offset, you would see that like that. So if the, if the interplanetary field was one direction, you might see an offset one way and the other way. And that, that's kind of the idea I have in mind. Yep. I'm just curious if there's any magnetometer information that would show up this as well. Uh, yes, that's a good question. There have been, of course, this is kind of a holy grail seeing this offset. And so there have been a number of people that have chased this down. And so I showed you the, the probably the best evidence, which is the two satellite images in the two hemispheres. But magnetometer people have gotten into the act. And magnetometers can kind of locate these substorm onsets. 
you know, not, not with super high resolution, but if you have a number of magnetometers, you can figure out where the onset is. And so magnetometer people have done that also. Magnetometers are a little sparse in the South. So that a, hampers it a bit, but there, are, there, are, there is a paper or two out there of people having done that. Yes. Uh, I was just going to ask, is there, um, and I have to help out to say on health horizon. Oh. Uh, and we have, uh, you know, receivers covering, well, they could cover the whole range, really. Uh -huh. uh, so I'm curious if there's anything you go ahead, but we focus on the, you know, the high frequency shortwave ranges, but uh, there's nothing capable of going down to your frequency. Uh -huh. I'm always interested to hear about other sites in the north that could do these kind of measurements and interest people in doing that. Yeah. Um, so, yep. Yeah, let's definitely meet. Okay. Last one. I wonder if the substorm is somewhat related to the geomagnetic storm. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yep. Um, so during a geomagnetic storm, you will often have several substorms happening within a geomagnetic storm. Um, and so, you know, that's a particularly good time to, to make such observations. Um, but you also, you know, get, get these kind of waves from substorms that are not associated with geomagnetic storms and also from certain types of auroral activity that fall short of being substorms will also give you some of these types of radio emissions. All right. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. All right, I'll keep the closing remarks brief. Uh, number one, um, Jim was our invited speaker three years ago when we had to go virtual all of a sudden. But if you go on the HAMSA website, hamsa.org slash 2020, you can find a very nice tutorial of him explaining all the different radio signals that the Aurora gives out. So if you need a little bit more of a fundamental tutorial, go back to our website. You can go uh, find him. Um, also, I uh, talked a lot about Antarctic magnetometer data, so I'll give a, a plug for Professor Rachel Frizzell's poster tomorrow, uh, where she's actually looking at data from uh, a number of uh, magnetometers down in Antarctica, and it's connected with uh, where those magnetic field bonds are open and closed, so stop by her poster tomorrow. Um, so everyone, uh, enjoy uh, dinner. I'll see you over at the Radisson in a few minutes. Thank you to everyone on Zoom. It's been a pleasure having you.